Preface of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by Theodore and Mrs. Bent. If my fellow traveler had lived, he intended to have put together in book form such information as we had gathered about Southern Arabia. Now, as he died four days after our return from our last journey there, I have had to undertake the task myself. It has been very sad to me, but I have been helped by knowing that, however imperfect this book may be, what is written here will surely be a help to those who, by following in our footsteps, will be able to get beyond them, and to whom I so heartily wish success and a happy homecoming, the best wish a traveler may have. It is for their information that I have included so many things about the price of camels, the payment of soldiers, and so forth, and yet even casual readers may care to know these details of explorers' daily lives. Much that is set down here has been published before, but a good deal is new. My husband had written several articles in the 19th century, and by the kindness of the editor I have been able to make use of these. Also, I have incorporated the lectures he had given before the Royal Geographical Society and the British Association. The rest is from his notebooks and from the chronicles that I always wrote during our journeys. I thought at first of trying to keep our several writings apart, but to avoid confusion of inverted commas, I decided, acting on advice, just to put the whole thing into as consecutive a form as possible, only saying that the least part of the writing is mine. The bibliography is far from complete, as I can only name a few of the many books that my husband consulted on all the districts round those which we were going to penetrate. As to the spelling of the Arabic, it must be remembered that it is a very widely spread language, and there are naturally many different forms of the same word. For example, Ibn, Ben, Bin, and such various ways of pronouncing the name of the Muslim prophet that I have heard it pronounced Mehmet, Mamad, and Mad. I must give hearty thanks in both our names to all who helped us on in these journeys, and especially to Mr. Headlam, who has given me much assistance by going through the proofs of this book. Mr. W. C. Irvine has kindly provided the column of literary Arabic for the vocabulary. Mabel, Virginia, Anna Bent, 13 Great Cumberland Place, West, October 13, 1899 End of Preface Chapter 1 of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter 1 Manama and Maharik. The first Arabian journey that we undertook was in 1889, when we visited the islands of Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. We were attracted by stories of mysterious mounds, and we proposed to see what we could find inside them, hoping, as turned out to be the fact, that we should discover traces of Phoenician remains. The search for traces of an old world takes an excavator now and again into strange corners of the new. Out of the ground he may extract treasures, or he may not. That is not our point here. Out of the inhabitants and their strange ways he is sure, whether he likes it or not, to extract a great deal, and it is with this branch of an excavator's life we are now going to deal. We thought we were on the track of Phoenician remains, and our interest in our work was like the fingers of an aneroid, subject to sudden changes, but at the same time we had perpetually around us a quaint, unknown world of the present, more pleasing to most people than anything pertaining to the past. The group of islands known as Bahrain, dual form of Bahar, i.e. two seas, lies in a bay of the same name in the Persian Gulf, about twenty miles off the coast of El Hasa in Arabia. Bahrain is really the name of the largest of the islands, which is twenty-seven miles long by ten wide. The second in point of size is Maharik, which lies north of Bahrain, and is separated from it by a strait of horseshoe form, five miles in length, and in a few places as much as a mile wide but for the greater part half a mile. The rest of the group are mere rocks. Citra, four miles long, 
with a village on it of the same name, Nebi Saleh, Saya, Khaseifa, and to the east of Maharik, Arad, with a palm grove and a large double Portuguese fort, an island or peninsula according to the state of the tide. It was no use embarking on a steamer which would take us direct from England to our destination, owing to the complete uncertainty of the time when we should arrive, so we planned out our way via Karachi and Mascot. Then we had to go right up to Boucher, and again change steamers there, for the boats going up the gulf would not touch at Bahrain. At Boucher we engaged five Persians to act as servants, interpreter, and overseers over the workmen whom we should employ in excavating. We had as our personal servant and interpreter combined a very dirty Haji Abdullah, half Persian, half Arab. He was the best to be obtained, and his English was decidedly faulty. He always said mules for meals, fools for fowls, and any one who heard him say, What time you eat your mules today, Sahib? Or, I have boiled two fools for dinner. Or, Mim Sahib, now I go in bazaar to buy our provisions of grub. Or, What place I give you your grub, Mim Sahib? Would have been surprised. He had been a great deal on our men of war. He also took a present of horses from the Sultan of Muscat, to the queen, so that he could boast, I've been to home, and alluded to his stay in England as, when I was in home. Abdullah always says chuck and never throw, and people unused to him would not take in that those peacock no good, carboys much better, referred to pickaxes and crowbars. He used to come to the diggings and say, a couple of sheikhs come here in camp, sahib, I am standing them some coffee. Shall I stand them some mixed biscuits, too? I must say, I pity foreigners who have to trust to interpreters whose only European language is such English as this. With the whole of our party, we embarked on the steamer which took us to Bahrain, or rather as close as it could approach. For owing to the shallowness of the sea, while still far from shore, we were placed in a bagala in which we sailed for about twenty minutes. Then, when a smaller boat had conveyed us as near to the dry land as possible, we were in mid-ocean transferred, bag and baggage, to asses, those lovely white asses of Bahrain, with tails and manes dyed yellow with henna, and grotesque patterns illuminating their flanks. We had no reins or stirrups, and as the asses, though more intelligent than our own, will not infrequently show obstinacy in the water, the rider, firmly grasping his pommel, reaches with thankfulness the slimy, oozy beach of Bahrain. Manama is the name of the town at which you land. It is the commercial capital of the islands, just a streak of white houses and bamboo huts, extending about a mile and a half along the shore. A few mosques with low minarets may be seen, having stone steps up one side, by which the priest ascends for the call to prayer. These mosques and the towers of the richer pearl merchants show some decided architectural features, having arches of the Saracenic order, with fretwork of plaster and quaint stucco patterns. On landing we were at once surrounded by a jabbering crowd of negro slaves, and stately Arabs with long flowing robes, and twisted camel hair cords, a call, around their heads. Our home, while in the town, was one of the best of the battlemented towers, and consisted of a room sixteen feet square on a stone platform. It had twenty-six windows with no glass in them, but pretty lattice of plaster. Our wooden lock was highly decorated, and we had a wooden key to close our door, which pleased us much. Even though we were close upon the tropics, we found our abode chilly enough after sunset, and our nights were rendered hideous. Firstly, by the barking of dogs, secondly, by cocks which crowed at an inordinately early hour, and thirdly, by pious Mussulmans hard at work praying before the sun rose. From our elevated position we could look down into a sea of bamboo huts, the habitations of the pearl fishers, neat enough abodes, with courtyards paved with helix shells. In these courtyards stood quaint large water jars which women filled from goat-skins carried on their shoulders from the wells, 
wobbling when full like live headless animals, and cradles like hen coops for their babies. They were a merry, idle lot of folk just then, for it was not their season of work, perpetually playing games, of which tip-jack and top-spinning appeared the favorite for both young and old, seemed to be their chief occupation. Staid Arabs, with turbans and long flowing robes, spinning tops, formed a side of which we never tired. The spinning tops are made out of whelk shells, which I really believe must have been the original pattern from which our domestic toy was made. The doorposts of their huts are often made of whale's jaws. A great traffic is done in sharks. The cases for their swords and daggers are all of chagrin. The gulf well deserves the name given to it by Ptolemy of the Ichthyophagorum sinus. Walking through the bazaars, one is much struck by the quaint, huge iron locks, some of them with keys nearly two feet long, and ingeniously opened by pressure of a spring. In the commoner houses, the locks and keys are all of wood. In the bazaars, too, you may find that queer al Hassa money called tawila, or long bits, short bars of copper doubled back and compressed together, with a few characters indicating the prince who struck them. The coffee pots of Bahrain are quite a specialty, also coming from El Hassa, which appears to be the center of art in this part of Arabia. With their long beak-like spouts and concentric circles with patterns on them, these coffee pots are a distinct feature. In the bazaars of Manama and Maharik, coffee vendors sit at every corner with some huge pots of a similar shape simmering on the embers. In the lid are introduced stones to make a noise and attract the attention of the passers-by. Coffee shops take the place of spirit and wine shops, which in the strict Wahhabi country would not be, for a moment, tolerated. In private houses it is thought well to have four or five coffee pots standing round the fire to give an appearance of riches. Besides the coffee pots, other objects of El Hasa workmanship may be seen in Bahrain. Every household of respectability has its wooden bowl with which to offer visitors a drink of water or sour milk. These are beautifully inlaid with silver in very elaborate patterns. The guns used by Bahraini sportsmen are similarly inlaid, and the camel saddles of the sheikhs are most beautifully decorated on the pommels in the same style. The anvils at which the blacksmiths in the bazaars were squatting were like large nails with heads about six inches square driven into the ground and about a foot high. The old weapons of the Bedouin Arabs are still in use in Bahrain. The long lance, which is put up before the tent of the chief when he goes about, the shield of camel skin decorated with gold paint and brass knobs, the coat of mail, and other objects of warfare used in an age long gone by. Every other stall has dates to sell in thick masses, the chief food of the islanders. Then you may see locusts pressed and pickled in barrels. The poor inhabitants are very fond of this diet, and have converted the curse of the cultivator into a favorite delicacy. As for weights, the stall holders would appear to have none but stones, whelk shells, and potsherds, which must be hard to regulate. An ancient Arab author states that in Oman, men obtain fire from a spark, by rolling the tinder in dry Arab grass and swinging it round till it bursts into flame. We often saw this process, and bought one of the little cages, hanging to a long chain, which they use in Bahrain. Of course, pearl fishing is the great occupation of the islands, and Manama is inhabited chiefly by pearl merchants and divers. Bahrain has in fact been celebrated for its pearl fishing ever since the days of the Periplus of Nearchus, in the time of Alexander the Great. Albuquerque, in his commentaries, beginning of footnote 1, page 164, end of footnote 1, thus speaks of Bahrain pearl fishing in 1510. Bahrain is noted for its large breeding of horses, its barley crops, and the variety of its fruits, and all around it are the fishing grounds of seed pearls, and of pearls which are sent to these realms of Portugal, for they are better and more lasting than any that are found in any other of these parts. This is also the verdict of the modern pearl merchants, who value Bahrain pearls as more lasting and harder than those even of Ceylon. Evidently, Albuquerque got an order from his sovereign for pearls, for he writes, beginning of footnote 2, page 
328, end of footnote 2, in 1515, that he is getting the pearls which the king had ordered for the pontifical of Our Lady. To this day in their dealings, the pearl merchants of Bahrain still make use of the old Portuguese weights and names. The pearl oyster is found in all the waters, from Ras Musendum to the head of the gulf, but on the Persian side there are no known banks of value. They vary in distance from one to ninety miles from the low-lying shore of Araby the Blessed. But the deep sea banks are not so much fished till the Shamal, or near westers, of June have spent their force. The three seasons for fishing are known as the spring fishing in the shallow water, the summer fishing in the deep waters, and the winter fishing, conducted principally by wading in the shoals. The pearls of these seas are still celebrated for their firmness, and do not peel. They are commonly reported to lose one per cent annually for fifty years in color and water, but after that they remain the same. They have seven skins, whereas the Singalese pearls have only six. The merchants generally buy them wholesale by the old Portuguese weight of the chow. They divide them into different sizes with sieves and sell them in India, so that, as is usually the case with specialties, it is impossible to buy a good pearl on Bahrain. Diving here is exceedingly primitive. All the necessary paraphernalia consists of a loop of rope and a stone to go down with, a curious horn thing to hold the nose, and oil for the orifice of the ears. Once a merchant brought with him a diving apparatus. But the divers were highly indignant, and leaguing against him, refused to show the best banks. In this way the fisheries suffer, for the best pearls are in the deeper waters, which can only be visited late in the season. The divers are mostly negro slaves from Africa. They do not live long, poor creatures, developing awful sores and weak eyes, and they live and die entirely without medical aid. At present, the pearl fisheries employ about 400 boats of from 8 to 20 men each. Each boat pays a tax to the sheikh. The fishing season lasts from April to October. Very curious boats ply in the waters between Manama and Maharik. The huge, ungainly bagalas can only sail in the deeper channels. The Bahrain boats have very long-pointed prows, elegantly carved and decorated with shells. When the wind is contrary, they are propelled by poles or paddles, consisting of boards of any shape tied to the end of the poles with twine, and the oarsman always seats himself on the gunwale. Perhaps the way these boats are tied and sewn together may have given rise to the legend alluded to by Sir John Mondeville when he saw them at the Isle of Hormuz. Near that isle there are ships without nails of iron or bonds, on account of the rocks of adamants, lodestones, for they are all abundant there in that sea that is marvellous to speak of, and if a ship passed there that had iron bonds or iron nails it would perish, for the adamant, by its nature, draws iron to it, and so it would draw the ship that it should never depart from it. Many of the boats have curious shaped stone anchors and water casks of uniform and doubtless old world shape. The sheikh has some fine war vessels, called batils, which did good execution about fifty years ago, when the Sultan of Oman and the rulers of El Hassa tried to seize Bahrain, and a naval battle took place in the shallow sea off the coast in which the Bahraini were victorious. Now that the gulf is practically English and piracy at an end, these vessels are more ornamental than useful. His large bagala, which mounted ten tiny guns and was named the Dunisia, is now employed in trade. Then there are the bamboo skiffs, with decks almost flush with the side, requiring great skill in working. Boats are really but of little use immediately around the islands. You see men walking in the sea quite a mile out, collecting shellfish and seaweeds, which form a staple diet for both man and beast on Bahrain. The shallowness of the sea between Bahrain and the mainland has contributed considerably to the geographical and mercantile importance of the Bahrain. No big vessels can approach the opposite coast of Arabia. Hence, in olden days, when the caravan trade passed this way, all goods must have been transshipped to smaller boats at Bahrain. Sir M. Durant, 
in a consular report, states it as his opinion that, under a settled government, Bahrain could be the trading place of the Persian Gulf for Persia and Arabia, and an excellent harbor near the warehouses could be formed. If the Euphrates Valley Railway had ever been opened, if the terminus of this railway had been at Kuwait, as it was proposed by the party of survey under the command of Admiral Charles Wood and General Chesney, the Bahrain group would at once have sprung into importance as offering a safe emporium in the immediate vicinity of this terminus. Bahrain is the Cyprus of the Persian Gulf, in fact. This day is, however, postponed indefinitely until such times as England, Turkey, and Russia shall see fit to settle their differences. And with a better understanding between these powers and the development of railways in the east, the Persian Gulf may yet once more become a high road of commerce, and the Bahrain Islands may again come into notice. The Portuguese, who were the first Europeans after the time of Alexander to visit the Gulf, recognized the importance of Bahrain. Up to their time the Gulf had been a closed Mohammedan lake. The history of their rule in that part has yet to be written, but it will disclose a tale of great interest, and be a record of marvelous commercial enterprise. It was Albuquerque who first reopened the Gulf to Europeans. Early in the 16th century, 1504, he urged the occupation of the Gulf. In 1506, three fleets went to the east under the command of Tristan de Cunha, with Albuquerque a second in command. Tristan soon took his departure further afield, and left Albuquerque in command. This admiral first attacked and took Hormuz, then governed by a king of Persian origin. Here, and at Muscat, he thoroughly established the Portuguese power, thereby commanding the entrance into the Gulf. From de Barros' account, it would appear that the king of Bahrain was a tributary of the king of Hormuz, paying annually 40,000 perdaus, and from Albuquerque's letters we read that the occupation of Bahrain formed part of his scheme. With Hormuz and Bahrain in their hand, the whole gulf would be under their control, he wrote. In fact, Albuquerque's scheme at that time would appear to have been exceedingly vast and rather chimerical, namely to divert the Nile from its course and let it flow into the Red Sea, ruin Egypt, and bring the Indian trade via the Persian Gulf to Europe. Of this scheme we have only the outline, but beyond establishing fortresses in the Gulf it fell through, for Albuquerque died, and with him his gigantic projects. The exact date of the occupation of Bahrain by the Portuguese I have as yet been unable to discover, but in 1521 we read of an Arab insurrection in Bahrain against the Persians and Portuguese, in which the Portuguese factor, Roy Bali, was tortured and crucified. Sheikh Hussein bin Said, of the Arabian tribe of bin Zabia, was the instigator of this revolt. In the following year, the Portuguese governor, Dom Luis de Menezes, came to terms with him and appointed him Portuguese representative in the island. A few years later, when Ras Berdadim, Wazil or governor of Bahrain, made himself objectionable, and against him Simon de Cunha was sent. He and many of his men died of fever in the expedition, but the Portuguese power was again restored. Towards the close of the sixteenth century the Portuguese came under the rule of Spain, and from that date their power in the Persian Gulf began to wane. Their soldiers were drafted off to the wars in Flanders instead of going to the east to protect the colonies, and the final blow came in 1622, when Shah Abbas of Persia, assisted by an English fleet, took Hormuz and then Bahrain. Twenty years later a company of Portuguese merchants, eager for the pearls of these islands, organized an expedition from Goa to recover the Bahrain, but the ships were taken and plundered by the Arabs before ever they entered the Gulf. Thus fell the great Portuguese power in the Gulf, the sole traces of which now are the numerous fortresses, such as the one on Bahrain. From 1622 to the present time, the control over Bahrain has been contested between the Persians and the Arabs, and as the Persian power has been on the wane, the Arabian star has been in the ascendant. In 1711, the Sultan bin Saif wrested Bahrain from Persia. In 1784, the Utubi of El Hassa conquered it. They have held it ever since, despite the attempts of Sayyid Said of Oman, of the Turks and Persians, to take it from them. 
The Turks have, however, succeeded in driving them out of their original kingdom of El Hasa, on the mainland of Arabia opposite, and now the Bahrain is all that it remains to them of their former extensive territories. The royal family is a numerous one, being a branch of the El Khalifa tribe. They are the chiefs of the Utubi tribe of Arabs. Most of them, if not actually belonging to that strict sect of Arabians known as Wahhabi, have strong puritanical proclivities. Our teetotalers are nothing to them in bigotry. If a vendor of intoxicating liquor started a shop on Bahrain, they would burn his house down, so that the wicked who want to drink any intoxicating liquor have to buy the material secretly from ships in the harbor. Many think it wrong to smoke and spend their lives in prayer and fasting. Church decoration is an abomination to the Wahhabi. Therefore, in Bahrain, the mosques are little better than barns with low minarets, for the very tall ones of other Mohammedan sects are forbidden. The Wahhabi are fanatics of the deepest dye. There is one God, and Muhammad is his prophet, they say with the rest of the Mohammedan world. But the followers of Abdul Wahhab add, and in no case must Muhammad and the Imams be worshipped, lest glory be detracted from God. All titles to them are odious. No grand tombs are to be erected over their dead. No mourning is allowed. Hence the cemetery at Manama is but a pitiful place. A vast collection of circles set with rough stones, each with a small uninscribed headpiece and the surface sprinkled with helix shells. The Wahhabi would wage, if they dared, perpetual war not only against the infidel, but against such perverted individuals as those who go to worship at Mecca and other sacred shrines. The founder of this revival is reported to have beaten his sons to death for drinking wine, and to have made his daughters support themselves by spinning, but at the same time he felt himself entitled to give to a fanatical follower who courted death for his sake an order for an emerald palace and a large number of female slaves in the world to come. In 1867, the Shah of Persia aimed at acquiring Bahrain, though his only claim to it was based on the fact that Bahrain had been an appanage of the Persian crown under the Safafian kings. He instituted a revolt on the island, adopted a claimant to the sheikhdom, and got him to hoist the Persian flag. Our ships blockaded Bahrain, intercepted letters, and obliged the rebel sheikh to quit. Then it was that we took the islands under our protection. In 1875 the Turks caused trouble, and the occupation of Bahrain formed part of their great scheme of conquest in Arabia. Our ship, the Osprey, appeared on the scene, drove back the Turks, transported to India several sheikhs who were hostile to the English rule, and placed Sheikh Isa, or Isa, on the throne under British protection, under which he rules happily to this day. We went to see him at Moharek, where he holds his court in the winter time. We crossed over in a small bagala, and had to be poled for a great distance with our keel perpetually grating on the bottom. It was like driving in a carriage on a jolting road. The donkeys trotted independently across, their legs quite covered with water. We were glad when they came alongside, and we completed our journey on their backs. The courtyard of the palace, which somewhat recalls the Alhambra in its architecture, was, when we arrived, crowded with Arab chiefs in all manner of quaint costumes. His Majesty's dress was exceedingly fine. He and his family are entitled to wear their camel hair bands bound round with gold thread. These looked very regal over the red turban, and his long black coat, with his silver-studded sword by his side, made him look every inch a king. He is most submissive to British interests, inasmuch as his immediate predecessors who did not love England were shipped off to India, and still languished there in exile. As he owes his throne entirely to British protection, he and his family will probably continue to reign as long as the English are virtual owners of the Gulf if they are willing to submit to the English protectorate. We got a photograph of a group of them resting on their guns, and with their kanjars, or sickle-shaped daggers, at their waists. We took Prince Mohammed, the heir apparent, and the stout Saeed bin Omar, the Prime Minister of Bahrain, but Sheikh Esau refused to place his august person within reach of our camera. During our visit, we were seated on high armchairs of the kind so much used in India, and the only kind used here. 
They were white and hoary with old age and long estrangement from furniture polish. For our sins we had to drink the bitterest black coffee imaginable, which tasted like varnish from the bitter seeds infused in it. This was followed by cups of sweet syrup, flavored with cinnamon, a disagreeable custom to those accustomed to take their coffee and sugar together. Maharak is aristocratic, being the seat of government. Manama is essentially commercial, and between them in the sea is a huge dismantled Portuguese fort, now used as Sheikh Esau's stables. The town of Maharak gets its water supply from a curious source, springing up from under the sea. At high tide there is about a fathom of salt water over the spring, and water is brought up either by divers who go down with skins, or by pushing a hollow bamboo down into it. At low tide there is very little water over it, and women with large infora and goat skins wade out and fetch what water they require. They tell me that the spring comes up with such force that it drives back the salt water and never gets impregnated. All I can answer for is that the water is excellent to drink. This source is called Bir Mahab, and there are several of a similar nature on the coast around, the Kasefa Spring and others. There is such a spring in the harbor of Syracuse, about twenty feet under the sea. The legend is that in the time of Merwan, a chief, Ibn Hakim, from Katif, wished to marry the lovely daughter of a Bahrain chief. His suit was not acceptable, so he made war on the islands and captured all the wells which supplied the towns on the bigger island. But the guardian deity of the Bahraini caused this spring to break out in the sea just before Maharak, and the invader was thus in time repulsed. It is a curious fact that Arados, or Arvad, the Phoenician town on the Mediterranean, was supplied by a similar submarine source. Sheikh Esau's representative at Manama, his prime minister or viceroy, we should call him, though he is usually known there by the humble-sounding title of the Bazaar Master, by name Said bin Omar, is a very stout and nearly black individual with a European cast of countenance. He looked exceedingly grand when he came to see us, in his under-robe of scarlet cloth, with a cloak of rustling and stiff white wool with a little red woven into it. Over his head floated a white cashmere shawl, with the usual camel-hair rings to keep it on, and sandals on his bare feet. He was deputed by his sovereign to look after us, and during the fortnight we were on the island he never left us for a single day. Though outwardly very strict in his asceticism, and constantly apt to say his prayers with his nose in the dust at inconvenient moments, we found him by no means averse to a cigarette in the strictest privacy, and we learnt that his private life would not bear European investigation. He is constantly getting married. Though sixty years of age, he had a young bride of a few weeks standing. I was assured that he would soon tire of her and put her away. Even in polygamous Arabia, he is looked upon as a much married man. End of chapter 1 Southern Arabia Chapter 2 of Southern Arabia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter 2. The Mounds of Ali. And now behold us excavators on the way to the scene of our labors. Six camels conveyed our tents, a seventh carried goatskins full of water. Four asses groaned under our personal effects. Hens for consumption rode in a sort of lobster pot by the side of clattering pickaxes and chairs. Six policemen, or peons, were in our train, each on a donkey. One carried a paraffin lamp, another a basket of eggs on the palm of his hand, and as there were no reins or stirrups, the wonder is that these articles ever survived. As for ourselves, we, like everybody else, rode sideways, holding on like grim death before and behind, especially when the frisky Bahrain donkeys galloped at steeplechase pace across the desert. For some distance around Manama all is arid desert, on which grow a few scrubby plants. 
which women cut for fodder with sickle-like saws and carry home in large bundles on their backs sheik esau's summer palace is in the center of this desert a fortress hardly distinguishable from the sand around and consisting like eastern structures of this nature of nothing but one room over the gateway for his majesty and a vast courtyard two hundred feet long where his attendants erect their bamboo huts and tents around the whole runs a wall with bastions at each corner very formidable to look upon passing this the palm groves which are exceedingly fine are soon reached and offer delicious shade from the burning sun here amongst the trees were women working in picturesque attire red petticoats orange-colored drawers down to their heels and a dark blue covering over all this which would suddenly be pulled over the face at our approach if they had not on their masks or butras which admit of a good stare the butra is kind of a mask more resembling a bridle than anything else in shape it is like two diamond frames made of gold and colored braids fastened together by two of their lower edges this middle strip comes down the nose and covers the mouth and the sides come between the ears and eyes it affords very little concealment but is very becoming to most of its wearers particularly if they happen to be negresses on their heads would be baskets with dates or citrons and now and again a particularly modest one would dart behind a palm tree until that dangerous animal man had gone by about halfway to the scene of our labors we halted by the ruins of an old arab town baled al kadim this ancient capital dating from a period prior to the portuguese occupation still presents some interesting ruins the old mosque madrasa i abu sedan with its two slender and elegant minarets so different from the horrible wahhabi constructions of today forms a conspicuous landmark for ships approaching the low-lying coasts of these islands around the body of the mosque runs a fine inscription in kufic letters and from the fact that the name of ali is joined with that of the prophet in profession of faith we may argue that this mosque was built during some persian occupation and was a shiite mosque the architecture too is distinctly persian recalling to us in its details the ruins of Rey, the rajas of tobit and the sultanate which we saw on the north of persia and has nothing arabian about it ruins of houses and buildings surround this mosque and here in the open space in the center of the palm groves the bahraini assemble every thursday for a market in fact the place is generally known now as souk el kamis or thursday's market on our journey out not a soul was near but on our return we had an opportunity of attending one of these gatherings sheikh esau has here a tiny mosque just an open loggia where he goes every morning in summer time to pray and take his coffee beneath it he has a bath of fresh but not overly clean water where he and his family bathe often during the summer heats he spends the whole day here or else goes to his glorious garden about a mile distant near the coast where acacias hibiscus and almonds fight with one another for the mastery and form a delicious tangle another mile on closer to the sea is the fine ruined fortress of the portuguese giblia as the natives now call it just as they do one of the fortresses at mascat it covers nearly two acres of ground and is built out of the remains of the old persian town for many kufic inscriptions are let into the wall and the deep well in the center is lined with them it is a regular bastion fortification of the sixteenth century with moat embrasures in the parapets and casemented embrasures in the re-entering angles of the bastions and is one of the finest specimens of portuguese architecture in the gulf an evidence of the importance which they attach to this island among the rubbish in the fort we picked up numerous fragments of fine nankin and celadon china attesting to the ubiquity and commerce of the former owners and attesting also to the luxury of the men who ruled here a luxury as fatal almost as the flanders wars to the well-being of the portuguese in the east our road led us through miles of palm groves watered by their little artificial conduits and producing the staple food of the island Sayyid bin omar talked to us much about the date mohammed said he began honor the date tree for she is your mother a true enough maxim in parched arabia where nothing else will grow when ripe the dates are put into a round tank called a madabash 
where they are exposed to the sun and air and throw off excessive juice which collects below after three days of this treatment they are removed and packed for exportation in baskets of palm leaves the bahraini for their own consumption love to add sesame seeds to their dates or ginger powder and walnuts pressed with them into jars these are called sirah and are originally prepared by being dried in the sun and protected at night then diluted date juice is poured over them the fruit which does not reach maturity is called salang and is given as food to cattle boiled with ground date stones and fish bones this makes an excellent sort of cake for milk cows this and the green dates also are given to the donkeys and to this food the bahraini attribute their great superiority the very poor also make an exceedingly unpalatable dish out of green dates mixed with fish for their own table or should i say floor nature here is not strong enough for the fruitification of the palm so at given seasons the palm is removed by cutting off the male spathes these they dry for twenty hours and then they take the flower twigs and deposit one or two in each bunch of the female blossom just as we were there they were very busy with the spathes and in thursday's market huge baskets of the male spathes were exposed for sale the palm groves are surrounded by dikes to keep the water in the date tree is everything to a bahraini he beats the green spadix with wooden implements to make fiber for his ropes in the dry state he uses it as fuel he makes his mats the only known form of carpet and bedding here out of it his baskets are made of the leaves from the fresh spathe by distillation a certain stuff called tara water is obtained of strong but agreeable smell which is much used for the making of sherbet much legendary lore is connected with the date the small round hole at the back is said to have been made by mohammed's teeth when one day he foolishly tried to bite one and in some places the expression at the same time a date and a duty is explained by the fact that in ramazan the day's fast is usually broken by first eating a date among all these date groves are the curious arab wells with sloping runs and worked by donkeys tall poles to which the skins are attached are date tree trunks down goes the skin bucket as the donkey comes up a steep slope in the ground and then as he goes down up it comes again full of water to be guided into the channel which fertilizes the trees by a slave who supports himself going up and adds his weight to that of the descending donkey by putting his arm through a large wooden ring hung at the donkey's shoulder day after day in our camp we heard the weird creaking from these wells very early in the morning and in the evening when the sun had gone down and we felt as we heard it what an infinite blessing is a well of water in a thirsty land leaving the palm groves and the portuguese fortress behind us we re-entered the desert to the southwest and just beyond the village of ali we came upon that which is the great curiosity of bahrain to investigate which was our real object in visiting the island for there begins that vast sea of sepulchral mounds the great necropolis of an unknown race which extends far and wide across the plain the village of ali forms as it were the culminating point it lies just on the borders of the date groves and there the mounds reach an elevation of over forty feet but as they extend further southward they diminish in size until miles away in the direction of rufa a, we found mounds elevated only a few feet above the level of the desert and some mere circular heaps of stones there are many thousands of these tumuli extending over an area of desert for many miles there are isolated groups of mounds in other parts of the islands and a few solitary ones are to be found on the adjacent islets on mohorek arad and sitra complete uncertainty existed as to the origin of these mounds and the people who constructed them but from classical references and the result of our work there can now be no doubt that they are of phoenician origin herodotus gives us as a traditional current in his time that the forefathers of the phoenician race came from these parts the phoenicians themselves believe in it it is their own account of themselves says herodotus and strabo brings further testimony to bear on the subject stating that two of the islands now called bahrain were called tyros and arados pliny follows in stabo's steps but calls the island telos instead of tyros which may only be an error in spelling or may be owing to the universal confusion of r with l 
Ptolemy in his map places Gera, the mart of ancient Indian trade and the starting point for caravans on the great road across Arabia, on the coast just opposite these islands, near where the town of El Katif is now, and accepts Strabo's and Pliny's names for the Bahrain Islands, calling them Tharos, Tilos or Tyros, and Arados. The fact is that all our information on the islands prior to the Portuguese occupation comes from the Periplus of Nearchus. Erosthenes, a naval officer of Alexander, states that the gulf was 10,000 stadia long, from Cape Armozum, i.e. Hermuz, to Pteridon, Kuwait, and the mouth of the Euphrates. Erosthenes of Thassos, who was of the company of Nearchus, made an independent geographical survey of the gulf on the Arabian side, and his statements are that on an island called Ikaros, now Palugid, just off of Kuwait, he saw the temple of Apollo. Southwards at a distance of 2,400 stadia, or 43 nautical leagues, he came on Gera, and close to it the islands of Tyros and Arados, which have temples like those of the Phoenicians, who were, the inhabitants told him, colonists from these parts. From Nearchus, too, we learn that the Phoenicians had a town called Sidon, or Sidodona in the Gulf, which he visited, and on an island called Tyrene, was shown the tomb of Erythrus, which he describes as an elevated hillock covered with palms, just like our mounds. And Erythrus was the king who gave his name to the Gulf. Justin accepts the migration of the Phoenicians from the Persian Gulf as certain. And M. Renan says the primitive abode of the Phoenicians must be placed on the lower Euphrates, in the center of the great commercial and maritime establishments of the Persian Gulf. As for the temples, there are no traces of them left, and this is also the case in Syrian Phoenicia. Doubtless they were all built of wood, which will account for their disappearance. As we ourselves, during the course of our excavations, brought to light objects of distinctly Phoenician origin, there would appear to be no longer any room for doubt that the mounds which lay before us were a vast necropolis of this mercantile race. If so, one of two suppositions must be correct either firstly that the phoenicians originally lived here before they migrated to the mediterranean and that this was the land of punt from which the punai got their name a land of palms like the syrian coast from which the race got their distorted greek appellation of phoenicians or secondly that these islands were looked upon by them as a sacred spot for the burial of their dead as the hindu looks upon the ganges and the persian regards the shrines of kerbela and Meshed. I am much more inclined to the former supposition, judging from the mercantile importance of the Bahrain Islands, and the excellent school they must have been for a race that was to penetrate all the then known corners of the globe, to brave the dangers of the open Atlantic, and to reach the shores of Britain in their trading ventures. And, if nomenclature goes for anything, the name Tyros, and the still existing name of Arad, ought to confirm us in our belief, and make certainty more certain. Our camp was pitched on this desert among the tumuli. The ground was hard and rough, covered with very sharp stones. Though dry, it sounded hollow, and it seemed as though there were water under it. Our own tent occupied a conspicuous and central place. Our servant's tent was hard by, liable to be blown down by heavy gusts of wind, which event happened the first night after our arrival, to the infinite discomfiture of the bazaar master who, by the way, had left his grand clothes at home, and appeared in the desert clad in a loose coffee-colored dressing-gown, with a red band about his waist. Around the tents swarmed turban diggers, who looked as if they had come out in their nightgowns, dressing-gowns, and bath-sheets. These lodged at night in the bamboo village of Ali hard by, a place for which we developed the profoundest contempt, for the women thereof refused to pollute themselves by washing the clothes of infidels, and our garments had to be sent all the way to Manama to be cleansed. A bamboo structure formed a shelter for the kitchen, around which on the sand lay curious coffee-pots, bowls, and cooking utensils, which would have been eagerly sought after for museums in Europe. The camel which fetched the daily supply of water from afar grazed around on the coarse desert herbage. The large white donkey which went into town for marketing by day and entangled himself in the tent ropes by night was also left to wander at his own sweet will. This desert camp was evidently considered a very peculiar sight indeed, 
and no wonder that for the first week of our residence there we were visited by all the inhabitants of bahrain who could find time to come so far it was very weird to sit in our tent door the first evening and look at the great mound we were going to dig into the next morning and think how long it had stood there in the peace its builders hoped for it there seemed to be quite a mournful feeling about disturbing it but archaeologists are a ruthless body and this was to be the last night it would ever stand in its perfect shape after all we were full of hope of finding out the mystery of its origin the first attack the next morning was most amusing to behold my husband headed the party looking very tall and slim with his legs outlined against the sky as he with all the rest in single file and in fluttering array wound first round the mound to look for a good place to ascend and then went straight up they were all amazed when i appeared and gave orders to the division under my command they looked very questioningly indeed but as the persians had learnt to respect me the bahraini became quite amenable the dimensions of the mound on which we began our labors were as follows thirty-five feet in height seventy-six feet in diameter and one hundred and fifty-two paces in circumference we chose this in preference to the higher mounds the tops of which were flattened somewhat and suggested the idea that they had fallen in ours on the contrary was quite rounded on the summit and gave every hope that in digging through it we should find whatever was inside in statu quo at a distance of several feet from most of the mounds are traces of an outer encircling wall or bank of earth similar to walls found around certain tombs in lydia and also around a tumulus in tara in ireland and this encircling wall was more marked around some of the smaller and presumably more recent tombs at the outer edge of the necropolis in some cases several mounds would appear to have been clustered together and to have had an encircling wall common to them all we dug from the top of our mound for fifteen feet with great difficulty through sort of a conglomerate earth nearly as hard as cement before we reached anything definite then suddenly this close earth stopped and we came upon a layer of large loose stones entirely free from soil which layer covered the immediate top of the tombs for two feet beneath these stones and immediately on the flat slabs forming the roof of the tomb had been placed palm branches which in the lapse of ages had become white and crumbly and had assumed the flaky appearance of asbestos this proved that the palm flourished on bahrain at the date of these tombs and that the inhabitants were accustomed to make use of it for constructive purposes six very large slabs of rough unhewn limestone which had obviously come from jebel dukan lay on the top of the tomb forming a roof one of these was six feet in length and two feet two inches in depth the tomb itself was composed of two chambers one immediately over the other and approached by a long passage like the drumos of rock-cut greek tombs which was full of earth and small stones the entrance as was that of all the tombs was towards the sunset this passage was fifty-three feet in length extending from the outer rim of the circle to the mouth of the tomb around the outer circle of the mound itself ran a wall of huge stones evidently to support the weight of earth necessary to conceal the tomb and large unhewn stones closed the entrance to the two chambers of the tomb at the head of the passage we first entered the upper chamber the floor of which was covered with gritty earth it was thirty feet long and at the four corners were recesses two feet ten inches in depth and the uniform height of this chamber was four feet six inches the whole surface of the interior to the depth of two or three inches above the other debris was covered with yellow earth composed of tiny bones of the jerboa that rat-like animal which is found in abundance on the shores of the persian gulf there was no sign of any recent ones and only a few fragments of skulls to show what this yellow earth had been we then proceeded to remove the rubbish and sift it for what we could find the chief objects of interest consisted in innumerable fragments of ivory fragments of circular bones pendants with holes for suspension obviously used as ornaments by this primitive race the torso of a small statue in ivory the hoof of a bull fixed on to an ivory pedestal evidently belonging to a small statue of a bull the foot of another little statue and various fragments of ivory utensils many of these fragments had patterns inscribed on them rough patterns of scales rosettes and circling chains 
and the two parallel lines common to so many ivory fragments found at Camerios and now in the British Museum. In fact, the decorations on most of them bear a close and unmistakable resemblance to ivories found in Phoenician tombs on the shores of the Mediterranean, and to the ivories in the British Museum from Nimrud in Assyria, universally accepted as having been executed by Phoenician artists, those cunning workers in ivory and wood whom Solomon employed in the building of his temple, and before the spread of Egyptian and Greek art, the traveling artists of the world. The ivory fragments we found were given into the hands of Mr. A. S. Murray of the British Museum, who wrote to my husband as follows. I have not the least doubt, judging from the incised patterns, from bull's foot, part of a figure, etc., that the ivories are of Phoenician workmanship. The pottery found in this tomb offered no very distinctive features, being coarse and unglazed, but the numerous fragments of ostrich eggshells, colored and scratched with rough patterns and bands, also pointed to a Phoenician origin, or at least to a race of wide mercantile connection, and in those days the Phoenicians were the only people likely to combine in their commerce ostrich eggshells and ivory. We also found small shapeless pieces of oxidized metal, brass or copper. There were no human bones in the upper chamber, but those of a large animal, presumably a horse. The chamber immediately beneath was much more carefully constructed. It was the exact same length, but was higher, being six feet seven inches, and the passage was wider. It was entirely coated with cement of two qualities, the upper coat being the finest, in which all round the walls, at intervals of two feet, were holes sloping inward and downward. In similar holes, in one of the other tombs we opened, we found traces of wood, showing that poles on which to hang drapery had been inserted. The ground of this lower chamber was entirely covered with a thin brown earth of a fibrous nature, in appearance somewhat resembling snuff. It was a foot in depth, and evidently the remains of the drapery which had been hung around the walls. Prior to the use of coffins, the Phoenicians draped their dead, and amongst this substance we found traces of human bones. Thus we were able to arrive at the system of sepulture employed by this unknown race. Evidently, their custom was to place in the upper chamber broken utensils and the body of an animal belonging to the deceased, and to reserve the lower chamber for the corpse enshrouded in drapery. For the use of this upper chamber, our parallels are curiously enough all Phoenician. Perrault gives us an example of two-storied tombs in the cemetery of Amrit in Phoenicia where also bodies were embedded in plaster to prevent decay prior to the introduction of the sarcophagus, reminding us of the closely cemented lower chambers in our mounds. A mound containing a tomb with one chamber over the other was, in 1888, observed in Sardinia, and is given by Della Mamora as of Phoenician origin. Here, however, the top of the tomb is conical, not flat as in our mounds, which would point to a latter development of the double chamber, which eventually blossomed forth into the lofty mausolea of the later Phoenician epoch and the grandiose tombs of Hellenic structure. Also at Carthage, that very same year that we were in Bahrain, i.e. 1889, excavations brought to light certain tombs of early Phoenician settlers, which also have the double chamber. In answer to Perrault's assertion that all early Phoenician tombs were a hypogea, we may say that as the Bahrain Islands offer no facility for this method of sepulture, the closely covered-in mound would be the most natural substitute. Before leaving the tombs, we opened a second and a smaller one of coarser construction, which confirmed in every way the conclusions we had arrived at in opening the larger tomb. Near the village of Ali, one of the largest mounds has been pulled to pieces for stones, by creeping into the cavities opened, we were able to ascertain that the chambers in this mound were similar to those in the mound we had opened, only they were double on both stories, and the upper story was also coated with cement. Two chambers ran parallel to each other, and were joined at the two extremities. Sir M. Durand also opened one of the mounds, but unfortunately the roof of the tomb had fallen in, which prevented him from obtaining any satisfactory results but from the general appearance it would seem to have been constructed on exactly the same lines as our larger one. Hence we had the evidence of four tombs to go upon, and felt that these must be pretty fair specimens of what the many thousands were which extended around us. 
End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter Three Our Visit to Rufa. During the time that we spent at Ali, we had numerous visitors. The first day came five camels with two riders apiece and a train of donkeys, bringing rich pearl merchants from the capital. These sat in a circle and complacently drank our coffee and ate our mixed biscuits, without in any way troubling us, having apparently come for no other object than to get this slender refreshment. Next day came Sheikh Mohammed, a young man of seventeen, a nephew of Sheikh Isa, who was about to wed his uncle's daughter, and was talked of as the heir apparent to the throne. He was all gorgeous in a white embroidered robe, red turban and head rings bound in royal gold he played with our pistols with covetous eyes ate some english cake having first questioned the bazaar master as to the orthodoxy of its ingredients and then he promised us a visit next day he came on the morrow on a beautifully caparisoned horse with red trappings and gold tassels he brought with him many followers and announced his intention of passing the day with us rather to our distress but we were appeased by the present of a fat lamb with one of those large bushy tails which remind one forcibly of a lady's bustle and suggests that the ingenious milliner who invented these atrocities must have taken for her pattern an eastern sheep this day prince mohammed handled the revolver more covetously than ever and got so far as exchanging his scarlet embroidered case with red silk belt and silver buckle for my leathern one Sheikh Mohammed was very anxious to see how I could shoot with my revolver, so a brown pot containing about half a pint of water was put on a lump of rock as a mark. I was terrified, for I knew if I missed, as I surely expected, I should bring great discredit on myself and my nation, and there was such a crowd! My husband said I must try, and I am sure no one was more astonished than I was that I shattered the pot. If I had not, it would have been said that I only carried the revolver for show. That afternoon a great cavalcade of gazelle huntsmen called upon us. The four chief men of these had each a hooded falcon on his arm and a tawny Persian greyhound, with long silky tail, at his side. They wore their sickle-like daggers in their waistbands, their bodies were enveloped in long cloaks, and their heads in white cloths bound round with the camel-hair straps. They were accompanied by another young scion of the El Khalifa family, who bestrode a white Arab steed with the gayest possible trappings. Thus was this young prince attired, on his head a cashmere kerchief with gold akal. He was almost smothered in an orange cloth gown trimmed with gold and lined with green, the sleeves of which were very long, cut open at the ends and trimmed. Over this robe was cast a black cloth cloak trimmed with gold on the shoulders, and a richly inlaid sword dangled at his side, almost as big as himself, for he was but an undersized boy of fifteen. The sportsmen made a very nice group for our photography, as did almost everything around us on Bahrain. Any excavator would have lost patience with the men of Bahrain with whom we had to deal. Tickets had to be issued to prevent more men working than were wanted, and claiming pay at the end of the day. Ubiquity was essential, for they loved to get out of sight and do nothing. With unceasing regularity, the pipe went round, and they paused for a drink at the bubble-bubble, as the Arabs express it. Morning, noontide, and evening prayers were, I am sure, unnecessarily long. Accidents would happen, which alarmed us at first, until we learnt how ready they were to cry wolf. One man was knocked over by a stone. We thought by his contortion some limb must be broken, and we applied Vaseline, our only available remedy, to the bruise. His fellow workmen then seized him by the shoulders, he keeping his arms crossed the while, shook him well to put the bones right again, as they expressed it, and he continued his work as before. The bazaar master and the policeman would come and frantically seize a tool, and work for a few seconds with Herculean vigor by way of example, which was never followed. Yalla! hurry on in other words o oh god marhaba 
very good the men would cry and they would sing and scream with a vigor that nearly drove us wild but for the occasional application of a stick by the bazaar master and great firmness we should have got nothing out of them but noise one day we had a mutiny because my husband dismissed two men who came very late the rest refused to work and came dancing round us shouting and brandishing spades one had actually got hold of a naked sword which weapon i did not at all like and i was thankful prince mohammed had not yet got the revolver for some time they continued this wild weird dance consigning us freely to the lower regions as they danced and then they all went away so that the bazaar master had to be sent in search of other and more amenable men evidently sheikh isa when he entrusted us to the charge of the bazaar master and sent policemen with us was afraid of something untoward happening next day we heard that his majesty was coming in person with his tents to encamp in our vicinity and i fancy we were in more danger from those men than we realized at the moment fanned as they are into hatred of the infidel by the fanatical wahhabi thirty years ago i was told no infidel could have ventured into the centre of bahrain with safety another important visitor came on saturday in the shape of sheikh khalid a cousin of the ruling chief with a retinue of ten men from rufa an inland village we sat for a while on our heels in rows conversing and smiling and finally accepted an invitation from sheikh khalid to visit him at his village and make a little tour over the island accordingly on sunday morning we started accompanied by the bazaar master for rufa and we were not a little relieved to get away before sheikh isa was upon us and escape the formalities which his royal presence in our midst would have necessitated we had an exceedingly hot ride of it and the wind was so high that our position on our donkeys was rendered even more precarious than usual the desert sand whirled around us we shut our eyes tied down our hats and tried to be patient for miles our road led through the tumuli of those mysterious dead who once in their thousands must have peopled bahrain their old wells are still to be seen in the desert and evidences of a cultivation which has long ago disappeared as we approached the edge of this vast necropolis the mounds grew less and less until mere heaps of stones marked the spot where a dead man lay and then we saw before us the two villages of rufa of these one is known as rufa sherga or southwestern rufa the other which belongs to the young prince mohammed is called rufa jebeli the rufa are much older than maharik or manama they are fortified with castellated walls of mud brick many of the el khalifa family reside here in comfortable houses southwestern rufa is quite a big place and as our arrival became known all the village turned out to see us the advent of an english lady among them was something too excessively novel even close-veiled women forgot their prudery and peered out from their blue coverings screaming with laughter and pointing as they screamed to the somewhat appalled object of their mirth hey de bibi there goes the lady shouted they again and again no victorious potentate ever had a more triumphant entry into his capital than the english bibi had on entering southwestern rufa sheikh khalid was ready to receive us in his kahwa or reception room furnished solely by strips of matting and a camel hair rug with coarse embroidery on it two pillows were produced for us and arabs squatting on the matting all round the wall for it was sheikh khalid's morning reception or majlis just then and we were the lions of the occasion our host we soon learnt rather to our dismay was a most rigid ascetic a wahhabi to the backbone he allows of no internal decorations in his house no smoking is allowed no wine only perpetual coffee and perpetual prayers our prospects were not of the most brilliant some of the wahhabi think even coffee is wrong after a while all the company left and sheikh khalid intimated to us that the room was now our own two more large pillows were brought and rugs were laid down as for the rest we were dependent on our own very limited resources we had brought our own sheets with us sheikh saba who had married sheikh khalid's sister was a great contrast to our host he had been in bombay and had imbibed in his travels a degree of worldliness which ill became a wahhabi he had filled his house to which he took us with all sorts of baubles 
gilt-looking glasses hanging on the walls, colored glass balls in rows and rows up to the ceiling, each on a little looking-glass, lovely pillows and carpets, Zanzibar date baskets, Bombay inlaid chests, El Hassa coffee pots, and a Russian tea urn, a truly marvelous conglomeration of things, which produced on us a wonderful sense of pleasure and repose after the bareness of our host's abode. Sheikh Saba wore only his long white shirt and turban, and so unconventional was he that he allowed his consort to remain at one end of the room whilst my husband was there. The courtyards of these houses are architecturally interesting. The Saracenic arch, the rosettes of open-work stucco, the squares of the same material with intricate patterns, great boons in a hot land to let in the air without the sun. There is also another contrivance for obtaining air. In building the house, a niche three feet wide is left in the outer wall, closed in on the inner side except for about a foot. It is funny to see the heads of muffled women peering out of these air shafts, into which they have climbed to get an undisturbed view. Here some of the women wear the Arabian butra, or mask, which, while it hides their features, give their eyes full play. They are very inquisitive. Some of the women one meets on Bahrain are highly picturesque when you see them without the dark blue covering. I was fetched to one harem after the other, always followed by a dense crowd, to the apparent annoyance of my hostesses, who, however, seemed powerless to prevent the intrusion. I saw one woman holding on to the top of the door and standing on the shoulders of one who was squatting on the floor. One good lady grew enraged at the invasion, and threw a cup of hot coffee in an intruder's face. In the afternoon we rode over to mountainous, and, it might be added, ruinous, Rufa. It is built on a cliff, fifty feet above the lowest level of the desert. From here there is a view over a wide, bleak expanse of sand, occasionally relieved by an oasis, the result of a well and irrigation. And beyond this the eye rests on Jabal Duchen, the mountain of mist, which high-sounding name has been given to a mass of rocks in the center of Bahrain, rising four hundred feet above the plain, and often surrounded by a sea fog for Bahrain, with its low-lying land, is often in a mist. Some mornings, on rising early, we looked out of our tent to find ourselves enveloped in a perfect London fog. Our clothes were soaking, the sand on the floor of our tent was soft and adhesive. Then, in an hour, the bright orb of heaven would disperse all this, for we were very far south indeed, on the coast of Arabia. Alas! On arrival, we found that our young friend, Sheikh Mohammed, was out, for he had to be in attendance on his uncle, Sheikh Isa, who had just arrived at his tent near our encampment, and he had to provide all his uncle's meals. We saw a donkey with a cauldron on its back large enough to boil a sheep in, large copper trays, and many other articles dispatched for the delectation of the sovereign and his retinue. Sheikh Mohammed's mother, quite a queenly-looking woman, was busying herself about the preparation of these things, and when she had finished she invited us to go into the harem. My husband felt the honor and confidence reposed in him exceedingly, but, alas, all the women were veiled. All he could contemplate was their lovely hands and feet dyed yellow with henna, their rich red shirts, their aprons adorned with coins, their gold bracelets, and turquoise rings. However, I assured him that with one solitary exception, he had lost nothing by not seeing their faces. In one corner of the women's room was the biggest bed I ever saw. It had eight posts, a roof, a fence, a gate, and steps up to it. It is a sort of dais, in fact, where they spread their rugs and sleep, and high enough to lay beds under it, too. Occasionally we got a good peep at the women as they were working in the fields, or cutting with semicircular saws the scrub that grows in the desert for their cattle. Halfway between the two rufas we halted at a well, the great point of concourse for the inhabitants of both villages. It was evening, and around it were gathered crowds of the most enchanting people in every possible costume. Women and donkeys were groaning under the weight of skins filled with water. Men were engaged in filling them. But it seems to be against the dignity of a male Arab to carry anything. With the regularity of a steam crane, the woodwork of the well creaked and groaned with a sound like a bagpipe, as the donkeys toiled up and down their slope bringing to the surface the skins of water. It was a truly Arabian sight, 
with the desert all around us, and the little garden hard by which Sheikh Saba cultivates with infinite toil, having a weary contest with the surrounding sand which invades his enclosure. The sun was getting low when we returned to our bare room at Sheikh Khalid's, and to our great contentment we were left alone, for our day had been a busy one and a strain on our conversational powers. Our host handed us over to the tender mercies of a black slave, Zamzam by name, wonderfully skilled at cooking with a handful of charcoal on a circular stoves colored red, and bearing a marked resemblance to the altars of the Persian fire-worshippers. He brought us in our dinner. First he spread a large round mat of fine grass on the floor. In the center of this he deposited a washing basin filled with boiled rice and a bowl of ghee or rancid grease to make it palatable. Before us were placed two tough chickens, a bowl of dates, and for drink we had a bowl of milk with delicious fresh butter floating in it. Several sheets of bread about the size and consistency of bath towels were also provided, but no implements of any kind to assist us in conveying these delicacies to our mouths. With pieces of bread we scooped up the rice, with our fingers we managed the rest and we were glad no one was looking on to witness our struggles save Zamzam with a ewer of water, with which he washed us after the repast was over, and then we put ourselves away for the night. Very early next morning we were on the move for our trip across the island. The journey would be too long for donkeys, they said, so Sheikh Khalid mounted us on three of his best camels, with lovely saddles of inlaid El Hassa work, with two pommels, one in front and one behind, like little pillars capped and inlaid with silver. We, that is to say, my husband and I and the bazaar master, ambled along at a pretty smart pace across the desert in the direction of a fishing village called Asker, on the east coast of the island, near which were said to exist ancient remains. These of course turned out to be myths, but the village was all that could be desired in quaintness. The houses were all of bamboo, and the floor strewn over with little white helix shells. In one of them we were regaled with coffee, and found it delicious after our hot ride. Then we strolled along the shore and marveled at the bamboo skiffs, the curiously fashioned oars and water casks, the stone anchors, and other primitive implements used by the seafaring race. The bazaar master would not let us tarry as long as we could have wished, for he was anxious for us to arrive before the midday heat at a rocky cave in the mountain of mist, in the center of the island. We dismounted from our camels and proceeded to examine Jebel Duchen, an escarped mass of limestone rocks with rugged outlined and deep caves. From the gentle elevation of the misty mountain, one gets a very fair idea of the extent and character of Bahrain. The island has been likened to a sheet of silver in a sea of pearl, but it looked to us anything but silvery, and for all the world like one of the native sheets of bread, oval and tawny. It is said to be twenty-seven miles long and twelve wide at its broadest point. From the clearness of the atmosphere and the distinctness with which we saw the sea all around us, it could not have been much more. There are many tiny villages dotted about here and there, recognizable only by their nest of palm trees and their strips of verdure. In the dim distance, to our left, arose the mountains of Arabia, beyond the flat coastline of El Hassa encircling that wild, mysterious land of Nejd, where the Wahhabi dwell, a land forbidden to the infidel globetrotter. Yet another sheikh of the El Khalifa family was introduced to us, by name Abdullah. He owns the land about here, and having been advised of our coming, had prepared a repast for us, much on the lines of the one we had had the evening before. We much enjoyed our cool rest and repast in Abdullah's cave, and for two hours or more, our whole party lay stretched on the ground courting slumber, whilst our camels grazed around. Another sheikh was anxious to take us to his house for the night, but we could not remain, as our work demanded our return to camp that night, so we compromised matters by taking coffee with him on a green oasis near his house, under a blazing sun, without an atom of shade, and without a thing against which to lean our tired backs. Then we hurried back to Rufa to take leave of our friend, Sheikh Khalid, and started off late in the evening for our home. Soon we came in sight of Sheikh Isa's tent. His Majesty was evidently expecting us, 
for by his side in the royal tent were placed two high thrones, formed of camel saddles covered with sheepskins for us to sit upon, whilst his Arabian majesty and his courtiers sat on the ground. As many as could be accommodated sat round within the walls of the tent. Those for whom there was no room inside continued the line, forming a long loop which extended for some yards outside the tent. Here all his nephews and cousins were assembled. That gay youth, Sheikh Mohammed, on ordinary occasions as full of fun as an English schoolboy, sat there in great solemnity, incapable of a smile, though I maliciously tried to raise one. When he came next morning to visit us, he was equally solemn, until his uncle had left our tent. Then his gaiety returned as if by magic, and with it his covetousness for my pistol. Eventually an exchange was effected, he producing a coffee-pot and an inlaid bowl, which had taken our fancy as the price. On the surrounding desert a small gazelle is abundant. One day we came across a cavalcade of Bahraini sportsmen, who looked exceedingly picturesque in their flowing robes and floating red kafeas, and riding gaily caparisoned horses, with crimson trappings and gold tassels. Each had on his arm a hooded falcon, and by his side a Persian greyhound. When the gazelle is sighted, the falcon is let loose. It skims rapidly along the ground, attacks the head of the animal, and so confuses it that it falls an easy prey to the hounds in pursuit. Albuquerque, in his commentaries, says, There are many who hunt with falcons about the size of our goshawks, and take by their aid certain creatures smaller than gazelles training very swift hounds to assist the falcon in catching the prey. In their ordinary life, the Bahrain people still retain the primitiveness of the Bedouin. There are about fifty villages scattered over the islands, recognizable from a distance by their patch of cultivation and groups of date palms. Except at Manama and Maharik, they have little or nothing to do with the pearl fisheries but are an exceedingly industrious race of peasants who cultivate the soil by means of irrigation from the numerous wells with which the island is blessed. There are generally three to six small wheels attached to the beam, which is across the well, over which the ropes of as many large leathern buckets pass. When these buckets rise full, they tilt themselves over. The contents are then taken by little channels to a reservoir which feeds the dikes transferred thence to the palms in buckets raised by the leverage of a date trunk lightly swung by ropes to a frame, and balanced at one end by a basket of earth into which it is inserted. It is so light to lift that women are generally employed in watering the trees. To manure their date groves they use the fins of a species of ray fish called owl, steeped in water till they are putrid. Owl, by the way, was an ancient name of the island of Bahrain, perhaps because it was the first island of the group in size, awul in Arabic, meaning first. The area of fertility is very rich and beautiful. It extends all along the north coast of the island and the fishing village of Nayim, with its bamboo huts nestling beneath the palm trees, is highly picturesque. And all this fertility is due to the number of fresh water springs which burst up here from underground similar, no doubt, to those before alluded to which spring up in the sea. The Arabs will tell you that these springs come straight from the Euphrates, by an underground channel through which the great river flows beneath the Persian Gulf, doubtless being the same legend alluded to by Pliny when he says, Flumen per quad Euphratum emerge putant. There are many of them, the Gersari well, Umishan, Abu Zaydan, and the Adari, which last supplies many miles of date groves through a canal of ancient workmanship. The Adari well is one of the great sites of Bahrain, being a deep basin of water 22 yards wide by 40 long, beautifully clear and full of prismatic colors. It is said to come up with such force from underground that a diver is driven back, and all around it are ruins of ancient date, proving that it was prized by former inhabitants as a bath. The water is slightly brackish, as is that of all these sources, so that those who can afford it send for water to a well between Rufa Jebeli and Rufa Sherga, called Haneini, which is exceedingly good, and camels laden with skins may be seen coming into Manama every morning with this treasure. We obtained our water supply thence. The other well, Abu Zaidan, 
is situated in the midst of the ruins known as Balet al-Qadim, or Old Town. Two days later, our camp was struck, and our long cavalcade with Said bin Omar, the bazaar master, at its head returned to Manama. He had ordered for us quite a sumptuous repast at his mansion by the sea, and having learnt our taste for curiosities, he brought us as presents a buckler of camel skin, his eight-foot-long lance, and a lovely bowl of alhasa work, that is to say, minute particles of silver inlaid in wonderful patterns in wood. This inlaying is quite a distinctive art of the district of Arabia along the northeastern coast known as alhasa. Curious old guns, saddles, bowls, and coffee pots, in fact everything with an artistic tendency comes from that country. The day following was the great Thursday's market at Beled al-Qadim, near the old minarets and the wells. Mounted once more on donkeys, we joined the train of peasants thither bound, I being, as usual, the object of much criticism, and greatly interfering with the business of the day. One male starer paid for his inquisitiveness by tumbling over a stall of knick-knacks and precipitating himself and all the contents to the ground. The minarets and pillars of the old mosques looked down on a strange scene that day. In the half-ruined domed houses of the departed race, stall-holders had pitched their stalls, lanes and cross-lanes of closely packed vendors of quaint crockery, newly cut lucerne, onions, fish, and objects of European fabric such as only Orientals admire. And amongst all was a compact mass of struggling humanity. But it was easy to see that the date palm and its produce formed the staple trade of the place. There were all shapes and sizes of baskets made of palm leaves, dates in profusion, fuel of the dried spades, the male spades for fructifying the palm, and palm-leaf matting, the only furniture and sometimes the only roofing of their comfortless huts. The costumes were dazzling in their brilliancy and quaintness. It was a scene never to be forgotten, and one of which a photograph, which I took from a gentle eminence, gives but a faint idea. It was our last scene on Bahrain, a fitting conclusion to our sojourn thereon. End of chapter 3 Southern Arabia Chapter 4 of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter 4 Some Historical Facts About Oman. On two separate occasions, we visited Muscat. The first time was in 1889 on our way to Persia and the second in 1895, when we were starting for Dofar, on the journey which I shall describe later. On each occasion we had to reach it by way of India, for like all the rest of the Persian Gulf, Muscat is really an outlying portion of our Indian Empire. By just crossing a range of mountains in Persia, you cross the metaphorical watershed between our India and foreign offices. At Shiraz you hesitate between India and England, you ask the question, shall I send my letters via Bombay or via Russia? You hasten to get rid of your rupees, for this is the last place where their merit is recognized. North of Shiraz, you are in a distinctly foreign country. Our officials hail from the foreign office and belong to the legation of Tehran. You are no longer under British protection. You are in the dominions of the Shah. But so long as you are on the shores of the Gulf, you are, so to speak, in India. The officials receive their pay in degenerate rupees instead of pounds sterling, they live in bungalows, they talk of tiffin, and eat curry at every meal. We keep a British ship of war in the Gulf. We feel that it is a matter of the first importance that those countries should remain under our protection, and that the Turks should not build forts at Fao and otherwise interfere with our trade in the Karun, and that no other power should have a foothold thereon. The last generation talked much about a Euphrates Valley Railway, with its terminus at Kuwait. We now hear a great deal about the opening up of the Karun. But it is the lordship of the Gulf which is the chief matter of importance just at present both for India and for ourselves. In this district, Muscat is the most important point. The Kingdom of Oman, of which it is nominally the capital, commands the entrance to the Gulf. 
In the ninth century of the Christian era, ships trading from Sharif to China took in water at Muscat from the wells, which still supply the town. Between Aden and the Persian Gulf, it is the only harbor where ships of any size can find anchorage, and it may, in fact, be said to play much the same part with respect to the Persian Gulf that Aden does to the Red Sea. In many other ways, the places are strikingly similar. They are both constructed on arid volcanic rocks, which produce the smallest amount of verdure and reflect the greatest amount of heat. Water in both of them is the scarcest of commodities. Of all places in the world, Muscat has the reputation of being the hottest, facing, as it does, the Indian Ocean, and protected from every cooling breeze by rugged volcanic hills, without a blade of cultivation upon them, and which reflect and intensify the scorching rays of the burning sun. Aden is said to have but a piece of brown paper between it and the infernal fires. Muscat would seem to want even this meager protection, and gives, as a Persian poet has expressed it, to the panting sinner a lively anticipation of his future destiny. The approach to the cove of Muscat is highly striking. Many colored volcanic rocks of fantastic form protect the horseshoe-shaped harbor, whilst behind the white town, as far as the eye can reach, stretch deeply serrated arid mountains, which culminate in the heights of Jebel Akhdar, or the Green Mountains, some fifty miles as the crow flies inland, reaching an elevation of nine thousand feet. We were told that snow sometimes falls in the winter time on Jebel Akhdar, and it rejoices in a certain amount of verdure, from which it derives its name. This range forms the backbone of Oman, and at its foot lie Nezwa and Rostak, the old capitals of the long line of imams of Oman, before Muscat was a place of so much importance as it is at present. The streams which come down from these mountains nowhere reach the sea, but are lost in the deserts, and nevertheless in some places they fertilize oases in the Omani desert, where the vegetation is most luxuriant and fever very rife. Grapes grow on the slopes of Jebel Akhbar, and the inhabitants, despite the strictures of Mohammed, both make and drink wine of them, and report says, how far it is true I know not, that the Portuguese exported thence the vines to which they gave the name of Muscatel. The inhabitants of this wild range are chiefly Bedou and pastoral, and it is from this quarter that the troubles which beset the poor sultan, Faisal, generally emanate. The harbor of Muscat is full of life, the deep blue sea is studded with tiny craft, canoes painted red, green, and white, steered by paddles, swarm around the steamer, fishermen paddling themselves about on a plank or two tied together, or swimming astride of a single one, hawk their wares from boat to boat. The oars of the larger boats are generally made with a flat, circular piece of wood fastened on to a long pole, and are really more like paddles than oars. In the northern corner lie huddled together large dows, which, during the northeast monsoons, make the journey to Zanzibar, returning at the change of the season. Most of these belong to banyan merchants in Muscat, and are manned by Indian sailors. Close to them is the small steamer Sultania, which was presented by the Sultan of Zanzibar to his cousin, Sultan Turki of Muscat now a perfectly useless craft, which cannot even venture outside the harbor by reason of the holes in its side. From its mast floats the red banner of Oman, the same flag that Arab boats at Aden fly. It was originally the banner of Yemen, to which place the Arabs who rule in Oman trace their origin. For early in our era, according to Arab tradition, Oman was colonized and taken possession of by descendants of the old Himyarites of Yemen. The shore of the town is very unpleasant, reeking with smells, and at low tide lined with all the refuse and offal of the place. At high tide shoals of fish come in to feed on this refuse, and in their train follow immense flocks of seagulls, which make the edge of the water quite white as they fly along and dive after their prey. Here and there, out of the sand, peep the barrels of some rusty old cannon, ghostly relics of the Portuguese occupation. In the middle of the beach is the Sultan's palace, but it is immeasurably inferior to the new residency of the British political agent, which stands at the southern extremity of the town, just where it can get all the breeze that is to be had through a gap in the rocks opening to the south. 
Here we were most hospitably entertained by Colonel Hayes Sadler on our second sojourn. Even in this favored position, the heat in summer is almost unendurable, making Muscat one of the least coveted posts that the Indian government has at its disposal. The cliffs immediately round the town are of a shiny schist, almost impossible to walk upon, and reflect the rays of the sun with great intensity. On either side of the town stand two old Portuguese forts, kept up and manned by the Sultan's soldiers. In them are still to be seen old rusty pieces of ordnance, one of which bears a Portuguese inscription with the date 1606, and the name and arms of Philip III of Spain. Also, the small Portuguese chapel in the fort is preserved and bears the date of 1588. These are the principal legacies left to posterity by those intrepid pioneers of civilization in a spot which they occupied for nearly a century and a half. These forts testify to having been of great size and strength in former times, and show considerable architectural features and the traces of a luxuriant and opulent population. With regard to the ancient history of Oman, there is little known. The empire of the Himyarites, which filled Yemen and the Hadramaut Valley with interesting remains, does not appear to have extended its sway so far eastward. No Sabaean remains have as yet been found in Oman, nor are there any that I have heard of further east than the Frankincense country of Dhofar, over six hundred miles west of Muscat. Neither Ptolemy nor the author of the Periplus gives us any definite information about the existence of a town in the harbor of Muscat, and consequently the first reliable information we have to go upon is from the early Arabian geographers. From Torisi we learn that Sobar was the most ancient town of Oman, but that in his day Muscat was flourishing, and that in old times the China ships used to sail from there. Oman was included in Yemen by these earlier geographers, doubtless from the fact that Arabs from Yemen were its first colonizers. But all that is known with any certainty is that, from the ninth century A.D., a long line of imams ruled over Oman, with their capitals at Nezwa or Rostak, at the foot of Jabal Akhdar. This title, by which the Arab rulers were known, had been conferred on the Arab rulers of Oman for centuries, and signifies a sort of priest-king like Melchizedek, to whom, curiously enough, is given the same title in the Quran. The election was always by popular acclamation, and inasmuch as the Omani do not recognize the two imams who immediately succeeded Muhammad, but chose their own, they form a separate sect. In olden days, the men of Oman were called outsiders by their Mohammedan brethren, because they recognized their own chief solely as the head of their own religion, and are known otherwise as the Ibadiyat or Ibaduya, followers of Abdullah bin Ibad as distinct from the Shi'i, Shiites, and Sunni, between which sects the rest of Islam is pretty equally divided. Internecine wars were always rife amongst them, but at the same time these early Omani had little or no intercourse with the outer world. Of the internal quarrels of the country, the Omani historian Salid bin Rajik has given a detailed account, but for the rest of the world they are of little interest. In those days, Oman seems to have had two ports, Sur and Kalhat, on the Indian Ocean, which were more frequent than Muscat. Marco Polo, 1280 A.D., calls the second Kalati in his journal, and describes it as a large city in a gulf called also Kalatu, and the Omani paid tribute to the Melek, or king of Hormuz, for many generations. But with the rise of Muscat, Sur and Kalhat declined. Oman first came into immediate contact with Europeans in the year 1506, when Albuquerque appeared in Muscat Harbor bent on his conquest of the Persian Gulf, and with the object, not even yet accomplished, of making a route to India by way of the Euphrates Valley. From Albuquerque's commentaries we get a graphic description of the condition of the country when he reached it. At first the Arabs were inclined to receive the Portuguese without a struggle. But, taking courage from the presence of a large army of Bedouin in the vicinity, they soon showed treacherous intentions toward the invaders, so that the Portuguese admiral determined to attack the town and destroy it. And the commentator states that, within were burned many provisions, thirty-four ships in all, large and small, many fishing barks, and an arsenal full of every requisite for shipbuilding. 
After effecting a landing, the Portuguese ordered three gunners with axes to cut the supports of the mosque, which was a large and very beautiful edifice, the greater part being built of timber finely carved, and the upper part of stucco, and it was accounted a propitious miracle by the Portuguese that the men who performed this deed were not killed by the falling timber. Muscat was then burnt and utterly destroyed, and having cut off the ears and noses of the prisoners, he liberated them. The commentator concludes his remarks on Muscat as follows. Muscat is of old a market for carriage of horses and dates. It is a very elegant town with very fine houses. It is the principal entrepot of the kingdom of Ormuz, into which all the ships that navigate these parts must of necessity enter. The hundred and forty years during which the Portuguese occupied Muscat and the adjacent coast town was a period of perpetual trouble and insurrection. The factory and forts of Jalali and Marani were commenced in 1527, but the forts in their present condition were not erected till after the union of Portugal and Spain in 1580. The order for their erection came from Madrid, and the inscription bears the date 1588. Not only were the Arabs constantly on the lookout to dislodge their unwelcome visitors, but the Turks attacked them likewise, with a navy from the side of the Persian Gulf, and the naval victory gained by the Portuguese off Muscat in 1554 is considered by Turkish historians to have been a greater blow to their power than the better-known battle off Prevesa in 1538, where Doria defeated Barbarossa and obliged Suleiman to relinquish his attempt on Vienna. When, after the union of Portugal with Spain, the colonial activity of the former country declined, the colonies in the Persian Gulf fell one by one into the hand of the Persians and the Arabs. Out of the kingdom of Oman they were driven in 1620 and confined to the town of Muscat by the victorious Imam, Nasser bin Murshid, during whose reign of twenty-six years the legend is told that no man in Oman died a natural death. Two years later they were also driven from Muscat itself, and those two forts, Jalali and Marani, which they had built, the last foothold of the Portuguese on the Omani territory, were taken from them. The historian Salil tells the amusing story of the final fall of Muscat into the hands of the Arabs. The Portuguese governor, Pereira, was deeply enamored of the daughter of a banyan merchant of Muscat. The man at first refused to let him have his daughter, but at length consented, on condition that the wedding did not take place for some months. Pereira was now entirely in the hands of the banyan, and did everything he told him. So the crafty Indian communicated with the Arabs outside Portuguese territory, telling them to be ready when due notice was given to attack the town. He then proceeded to persuade Pereira to clean out the water tanks of the fort, and to clear out the old supplies of food preparatory to revictualling them. Then, when the forts were without food and water, and finally having damped all the powder, he gave notice to the Arabs, who attacked and took the town on a Sunday evening when the Portuguese were carousing. Captain Hamilton gives another account in his travels. Beginning of footnote 7, Pinkerton, volume 8, end of footnote 7, and tells us that the Arabs were exasperated by a piece of pork wrapped up in paper being sent as a present to the imam by the governor, Pereira. And he also adds that the Portuguese were all put to the sword save eighteen, who embraced Mohammedanism, and that the Portuguese cathedral was made the imam's palace, where he took up his residence for a month or two every year. Since those days, these two forts have been regularly used by rival claimants to the sovereignty of Oman as convenient points of vantage from which to pepper one another, to the infinite discomfiture of the inhabitants beneath. The departure of the Portuguese did not greatly benefit the Omani. Writing in 1624 to the East India Company, Thomas Carriage speaks of Muscat as a beggarly poor town, and Ormuz, he says, is become a heap of ruins. At last, in 1737, owing to the jealousies of the rival imams, Said and Ibn Murshad, Muscat was taken by the Persians. They were, however, soon driven out again by Ahmed bin Sayyid, or Saud, a man of humble origin but a successful general. As a reward for his services, he was elected imam in 1741, and was the founder of the dynasty which still rules there. 
the successors of Ahmed bin Sayyid found the obligations of being imam, and the oath which it entailed to fight against the infidel, both awkward and irksome, so his grandson, Saud, who succeeded in 1779, never assumed the title of imam, but was content with that of sultan, and consequently the imamate of Oman has, with one short exception, been in abeyance ever since. Under the first rulers of this dynasty, Oman became a state of considerable importance. During the reigns of Sultan Saud and his son, Sultan Saud Sayyid, a large part of the Arabian mainland was under the rule of Oman, as also Bahrain, Hormuz, Larij, Qisham, Bandar Abbas, many islands in their pearl fisheries, and Linga, also a good part of the coast of Africa, and it was they who established the alliances with England and the United States. The first political relations between the East India Company and the ruler of Oman took place in 1798, the object being to secure the alliance of Oman against the Dutch and French. A second treaty was made two years later, and it was provided in it that an English gentleman of respectability, on the part of the Honorable East India Company, should always reside at the port of Muscat. An English gentleman of respectability has, consequently, resided there ever since, and from the days of Sultan Sayyid has become the chief factor in the government of the place. Sultan Sayyid bin Sayyid stands out prominently as the great ruler of Oman, and under his rule Oman and its capital, Muscat, reached the greatest pitch of eminence to be found in all its annals. He ascended the throne in 1804 and reigned for fifty-two years. He found his country in dire distress at the time of his accession, owing to the attacks of the fanatical Wahhabi from Central Arabia, who had carried their victorious arms right down to Muscat, and had imposed their bigoted rules and religious regulations on the otherwise liberal-minded Mohammedans of Eastern Arabia. With Turkish aid on the one hand, and British support on the other, Sultan Sayyid succeeded in relieving his country from these terrible scourges, and drove them back into the central province of Nejd, from which they had carried their bloodthirsty and fanatical wars over nearly the whole of the peninsula. And when all fear from the Wahhabi was over, Sultan Sayyid extended his conquests in all directions. He occupied several points on the Persian Gulf and the opposite coast of Baluchistan, and materially assisted the Indian government in putting down the piracy which had for long closed the Gulf to all trade, and finally, in 1856, he added the important Arab settlement of Mombasa in Zanzibar, on the African coast, to his dominion. During this long reign, Muscat prospered exceedingly. It was the great trade center for the Persian Gulf, inasmuch as it was a safe depot, where merchants could deposit their goods without fear of piracy. Vessels going to and from India, before the introduction of steam, used frequently to stop at Muscat for water. As a trade center in those days, it was almost as important as Aden, and with the Indian government, Sultan Sayyid was always on most friendly terms. When Sultan Sayyid died, the usual dispute took place between his successors. England promptly stepped in to settle this dispute, and with the foresight she so admirably displays on such occasions, she advocated a division of Sayyid's empire. Zanzibar was given to one claimant, Oman to the other and for the future Oman and Sultan Turkey remained under British protection. Since the death of Sultan Sayyid, the power of Oman has most lamentably gone down, partly owing to the very success of his attempts to put down piracy. This, followed by the introduction of steam, has diminished the importance of Muscat as a safe port for the merchants to deposit their wares. It is also partly due to the jealousies which prevail between the descendants of Sayyid, who rule in Zanzibar and in Muscat. Palgrave, in 1863, describes Muscat as having 40,000 inhabitants. There are probably half that number now. The Sultan of Zanzibar has to pay an annual tribute of 40,000 crowns to his relative of Muscat in order to equalize the inheritance, and this tribute being a constant source of trouble, of late years he has taken to urging the wild Bedouin tribes in Oman to revolt against the present, rather weak-minded sultan who reigns there. He supplies them with the sinews of war, namely money and ammunition, and the insurrection which occurred in February 1895 was chiefly due to this mode of power. 
one of his sisters married a german the english conniving at her escape from zanzibar in a gunboat on her husband's death her elder brother having in the meantime also died she returned to zanzibar thinking her next brother the present sultan to be of a milder disposition but he refused to take any notice of her and her children the present ruler of Muscat, Sultan Faisal, is a grandson of Sultan Sayyid and son of Sultan Turki by an Abyssinian mother. Since his accession in 1889, he has been vacillating in his policy. He has practically had but little authority outside the walls of Muscat, and were it not for the support of the British government and the proximity of a gunboat, he would long ago have ceased to rule. When we first saw him in 1889, he was but a beardless boy, timid and shy and now he has reached man's estate he still retains the nervous manner of his youth he lives in perpetual dread of his elder brother mahmoud who being the son of a negress was not considered a suitable person to inherit the throne the two brothers though living in adjacent houses never meet without their own escorts to protect them from each other the way in which faisal obtained possession of the sultan's palace on his father's death to the exclusion of his brother is curious Faisal said his grief for his father was so great that his feelings would not admit of his attending the funeral, so he stayed at home while Mahmoud went, who, on his return, found the door locked in his face. The palace is entered by a formidable-looking door, decorated with large spiked bosses of brass. This opens into a small court which contained at the time of our first visit the most imposing sight of the place, namely, the lion in his cage to the left into which Faisal was in the habit of introducing criminals of the deepest dye, to be devoured by this lordly executioner. Opposite to this cage of death is another, a low probationary cage, which, when we were there, contained a prisoner stretched out at full length, for the cage is too low to admit of a sitting posture. From this point he could view the horrors of the lion's cage, so that during his incarceration he might contemplate what might happen to him if he continued, on liberation, to pursue his evil ways. Another door leads into a vaulted passage full of guards, through which we passed and entered into an inner court, with a pool in the center and a wide cloister around it supporting a gallery. Sultan Faisal was then a very young man, not much over twenty. He was greatly interested in seeing us, for we were the first English travellers who had visited him since his accession. We caught sight of him peeping at us over the balcony as we passed through the courtyard below, and we had to clamber up a ladder to the gallery, where we found him ready to welcome us. He seized our hands and shook them warmly, and then led us with much effusiveness to his chawa, a long room just overhanging the sea, which is his reception and throne room. Here were high, cane-bottomed chairs round the walls, and at one end a red chair, which is the throne. Just over it were hung two grotesque pictures of our queen and the prince consort, such as one could buy for a penny at a fair. They are looked upon as objects of great value here, and act as befitting symbols of our protectorate. The imam fed us with sweets and coffee, asked us innumerable questions, and seemed full of boyish fun. Certainly, with his turban of blue and red checked cotton, which would have been a housemaid's duster at home, his faded greenish-yellow cloak fastened round his slender frame by a red girdle, he looked anything but a king. As we were preparing to depart, the young monarch grew apparently very uneasy, and impatiently shouted something to his attendants. And when the servant came in, Faisal hurried to him, seized four little gilt bottles of attar of roses, thrust two of them into each of our pockets, and with some compliments as to our queen having eyes everywhere, and Faisal's certainty that she would look after him, the audience was at an end. Sultan Faisal was a complete autocrat as far as his jurisdiction extended. At his command, a criminal could be executed either in the lion's cage or in a little square by the sea, and his body cut up and thrown into the waves. The only check upon him was the British resident. His father, Turkey, not long before, sewed up a woman in a sack and drowned her, whereupon a polite message came from the residency requesting him not to do such things again. Hence, young Faisal dared not to be very cruel. To offend the English would have been to lose his position. His half-brother, Mahmoud, 
whose mother was a Swahili, lives next door to his brother, Sultan Faisal, in the enjoyment of a pension of six hundred dollars a month. The uncles, however, are not so amenable. The eldest of them, according to Arabian custom, claimed the throne and had collected an army amongst the Bedouin to assert his claims, and was then in possession of all the country, with the exception of Muscat and El Matra, for Faisal had no money, and hence he could not get his soldiers to fight. But then it had been intimated to Faisal that in all probability the English would support his claims if he conducted himself prudently and wisely. So there was every likelihood that in due course he would be thoroughly established in the dominions of his father. When we visited the town for the second time, an even more serious rebellion was impending. The Bedouin of the interior, under Sheikh Saleh, having attacked Muscat itself, the sultan and his brother, who hastily became friends, retired together to the castle, and the town was given up to plunder. There were dead bodies lying on the beach, and but for the kindness of Colonel Hay Sadler, the British resident. There would have been difficulties in the fort as regards water. They relied principally on HMS Sphinx, which lay in the harbor to protect British interests and to maintain Sultan Faisal in his position. This state of terror lasted three weeks, when the rebels, having looted the bazaars and wrecked the town, were eventually persuaded to retire, free and unpunished, with a considerable cash payment, probably intending to return for more when the cooler weather should come and the date harvest be over. With the consent of, and at the request of, the Indian government, Sultan Faisal has imposed additional heavy duty on all the produce coming in from the rebel tribes that he may have a fund from which to pay indemnities to foreigners who suffered loss during the invasion. A good many Banyan merchants, British subjects, suffered losses, and their claim alone amounted to 120,000 rupees. As a natural result of this disaster and its ignominious termination, Sultan Faisal's authority at the present moment is absolutely nil outside the walls of Muscat and El Matra and he is still in a state of declared war with all the Bedouin chiefs in the mountains behind Muscat. A few British subjects were scared, but not killed, and as all was over in a few weeks, no one thought much more about it except those more immediately interested, and few paused to think what an important part Muscat has played in the opening up of the Persian Gulf and the suppression of piracy, and what an important part it may yet play should the lordship of the Persian Gulf ever become a casus belli. Although Muscat has been under Indian influence for most of this century, it has latterly gone down much in the world. The trade of the place has well nigh departed, and with a weak sultan at the head of affairs, confidence will be long in returning. Unquestionably, our own political agent may be said to be the ruler in Muscat, and his authority is generally backed up by the presence of a gunboat. There is also an American consul there who chiefly occupies himself in trade and steamer agencies, and in 1895 the French also sent a consul to inquire into the question of the slave trade, which is undoubtedly the burning question in Arabia. Whilst England has been doing all she can to put slavery down, it is complained that much is carried on under cover of the French flag, obtained by Arab Dows under false pretexts from the French consul resident in Zanzibar. Sultan Faisal remonstrated with France on this point, and the appointment of a consul is the result. The great reason for our unpopularity in Arabia is due without doubt to our suppression of this trade. Slavery is inherent in the Arab. He does as little work as he can himself, and if he is to have no slaves nothing will be done and he must die. In other parts of South Arabia, Yemen, the Hadramaut, the Mahara country, and Zofar, Slavery is universal, and there is no doubt about it, the slaves are treated very well and live happy lives. But here in Oman, under the very eye of India, slavery must be checked. Our gunboat, the Sphinx, goes the round of the coast to prevent this traffic in human flesh, and frequently slaves swim out to the British steamer and obtain their liberty. This naturally makes us very unpopular in Sur where the Jenefa tribe have their headquarters, the most inveterate slave traders of southern Arabia. The natural result is that whenever they get a chance, the Jenefa tribe loot any foreign vessel wrecked on their shores and murder the crew. In the summer of 1894, however, a boat was wrecked near Hubat al-Hashish, 
containing some Creoles from the Seychelles Islands. After being driven for 45 days out of their course by southeast monsoons, during which time three or four of them had died, the survivors were much exhausted, but the Bedouin treated them kindly, for a wonder, and brought them safely to Muscat. For doing this, they were handsomely rewarded by the Indian government. Though they had kept possession of the boat and its contents, nevertheless they had saved the lives of the crew, and this, being a step in the right direction, was thought worthy of reward. The jealousies, however, of other tribes were so great that the rescuers could not return to their own country by the land route, but had to be sent to Sur by sea. Faisal has had copper coins of his own struck, of the value of a quarter anna. On the obverse is a picture of Muscat and its forts, around which in English runs the legend, Sultan Faisal bin Turki Sultan and Imam of Muscat and Oman, and on the reverse is the Arab equivalent. He has also introduced an ice factory, which however is now closed, and he wished to have his own stamps, principally with a view to making money out of them. But our agent represented to him that it was beneath the dignity of so great a sultan to make money in so mean a way, and the stamps have never appeared. Sultan Faisal had done much in the last few years since our first visit to modernize his palace. British influence has abolished many horrors and cruelties and the lion, having died, has not been replaced. For the Indian government, the question of Muscat is by no means pleasant, for, should any other power choose to interfere and establish an influence there, it would materially affect the influence which we have established in the Persian Gulf. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 of Southern Arabia》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Southern Arabia》by James and Mabel Bent — Chapter 5 — Muscat and the Outskirts I never saw a place so void of architectural features as the town of Muscat itself. The mosques have neither domes nor minarets a sign of the rigid Wahhabi influence which swept over Arabia. This sect refused to have any feature about their buildings or ritual which was not actually enjoined by Muhammad in his Quran. There are a few carved lintels and doorways, and the bazaars are quaintly pretty, but beyond this the only architectural features are Portuguese. All traces of the Portuguese rule are fast disappearing and each new revolution adds a little more to their destruction. Three walls of the huge old cathedral still stand, a window or two with latticework carving, after the fashion of the country are still left. But the interior is now a stable for the sultan's horses, and the walls are rapidly crumbling away. The interior of Muscat is particularly gloomy. The bazaars are narrow and dirty, and roofed over with palm matting. They offer but little of interest. And if you are fond of the Arabian sweetmeat called halwa, it is just as well not to watch it being made there, for niggers' feet are usually employed to stir it, and the knowledge of this is apt to spoil the flavor. Most of the town is now in ruins. Fifty years ago the population must have been nearly three times greater than it is now. There is also wanting in the town the feature which makes most Muslim towns picturesque, namely the minaret the mosques of the Ibadiyya sect being squalid and uninteresting. At first it is difficult to distinguish them from the courtyard of an ordinary house, but by degrees the eye gets trained to identify a mosque by the tiny substitute for a minaret attached to each, a sort of bell-shaped cone about four feet high, which is placed above the corner of the enclosing wall. I have already mentioned the Ibadiyya's views with regard to the imams, I believe they hold also certain heterodox opinions with regard to predestination and free will, which detach them from other Muslim communities. At any rate, they are far more tolerant than other Arabian followers of the Prophet, and permit strangers to enter their mosques at will. Tobacco is freely used by them, and amongst the upper classes, skepticism is rife. The devout followers of Muhammad look upon them much as Roman Catholics look on Protestants 
and their position is similar in many respects. As elsewhere in Arabia, coffee is largely consumed in Oman, and no business is ever transacted without it. It is always served in large copper coffee pots of the quaint shape which they use in Bahrain. Some of these coffee pots are very large. An important sheikh, or the mullah of a mosque, whose guests are many, will have coffee pots two or three feet in height, whereas those for private use are quite tiny, but the bird-like form of the pot is always scrupulously preserved. The bazaars of Oman do not offer much to the curio hunter. He may perchance find a few of the curved Omani daggers with handsome sheaths adorned with filigree silver, to which is usually attached, by a leather thong, a thorn extractor, an ear pick, and a spike. The belting, too, with which these daggers are attached to the body, is very pretty and quite a specialty of the place. Formerly, many gold daggers were manufactured at Muscat and sent to Zanzibar but of late years the demand for these has considerably diminished. The iron locks in the bazaars are very curious and old-fashioned, with huge iron keys which push out the wards, and are made like the teeth of a comb. These locks are exceedingly cumbersome, and seem to me to be a development of the wooden locks with wooden wards found in the interior of Arabia. Some of them are over a foot long. I have seen a householder after trying to hammer the key in with a stone, at last in despair climb over his own garden wall. Perchance a shark-skin or wooden buckler may be picked up from a bedou from the mountains, and there are chances of obtaining the products of many nationalities, for Muscat, like Aden, is one of the most cosmopolitan cities of the East. Here, as in El Matra, you find Banyans from India, Baluchi from the Mekran coast, Negroes from Zanzibar, Bedouin, Persians from the Gulf, and the town itself is even less Arab than Aden. The ex-prime minister's house, which occupies a prominent position in the principal street, is somewhat more oriental in character than most, and possesses a charmingly carved projecting window which gladdens the eye, and here and there in the intricacies of the town one comes across a carved door or a carved window, but they are now few and far between. The suburbs of Muscat are especially interesting. As soon as you issue out of either of the two gates which are constructed in the wall, shutting the town off from the outer world, you plunge at once into a new and varied life. Here is the fish and provision market, built of bamboos, picturesque, but reeking with horrible smells and alive with flies. Hard by is a stagnant pool into which is cast all the offal and filth of this disgusting market. The water in the pool looks quite putrid, and when the wind comes from this quarter, no wonder it is laden with fever germs and mephitic vapors. Consequently, Muscat is a most unhealthy place, especially when the atmosphere is damp and rain has fallen to stir up the refuse. The women with their mask veils called butra, not unlike the masks worn with the domino, pleased us immensely, so that we sought to possess a specimen. They brought us several, which, however, did not quite satisfy us, and afterwards we learnt that an enterprising German firm had made a lot of these butra for sale amongst the Muscat women, but the shape being not exactly orthodox, the women will not buy them. So the owners of these unsaleable articles are anxious to sell them cheap to any unsuspecting traveller who may be passing through. Outside the walls, the Sultan is in the habit of distributing two meals a day to the indigent poor and inasmuch as the Omani are by nature prone to laziness, there is but little doubt that His Highness's liberality is greatly imposed upon. In the market outside the walls, we lingered until nearly driven wild by the flies and the stench, so we were glad enough to escape and pursue our walk to the Paradise Valley and see the favorable side of Muscat. There, the sleepy noise of the wells, the shade of the acacias and palms, and the bright green of the lucerne fields refreshed us, and we felt it hard to realize that we were in arid Arabia. As you emerge, you come across a series of villages built of reeds and palm branches, and inhabited by members of the numerous nationalities who come to Muscat in search of a livelihood. Most of these are Baluchi from the Mekran coast, and Africans from the neighborhood of Zanzibar. 
The general appearance of these villages is highly picturesque, but squalid. Here and there palm trees, almond trees, and the ubiquitous camel thorn are seen interspersed amongst the houses. Women in red and yellow garments, with turquoise rings in their ears and noses, peep at you furtively from behind their flimsy doors. And as you proceed up the valley, you find several towers constructed to protect the gardens from Bedouin incursions, and a few comfortable little villas built by banyan merchants, where they can retire from the heat and dust of Muscat. The gardens are all cultivated with irrigation and look surprisingly green and delicious in contrast with the barren, arid rocks which surround them. The wells are dug deep in the center of the valley, in the bed of what elsewhere would be a river, and are worked by a running slope and bullocks who draw up and down skin buckets, which, like those in Bahrain, empty themselves automatically into tanks connected with the channels which convey the water to the gardens. After walking for a mile or two up this valley, all traces of life and cultivation cease, and amidst the volcanic rocks and boulders, hardly a trace of vegetable life is to be seen. It is a veritable valley of desolation, and there are many such in waterless Arabia. By ascending paths to the right or to the left of the valley, the pedestrian may reach some exquisite points of view. All the little calls or passes through which these paths lead are protected at the summit by walls and forts, not strong enough, however, as recent events have shown, to keep off the incursions of the Bedouin. The views over Muscat and the sea are charming, but one view to the south will be forever impressed on my mind as one of the most striking panoramas I have ever seen. When the summit of a little pass on the south side of the valley is reached, after a walk of about two miles, you look down through a gateway over the small valley and fishing village of Sadad, amongst the reed houses of which are many palm trees, and a thick palm garden belonging to Sayyid Yusuf, which gives the one thing wanting to views about Muscat, namely, a mass of green to relieve the eye. A deep inlet of the sea runs up here with its blue waters, and beyond stretch into illimitable space the fantastic peaks of the Oman Mountains taking every form and shape imaginable. These are all rich purples and blues, and the coloring of this view is superb. From Sadad, one can take a boat and row round the headlands back to Muscat. The promontories to the open sea are very fine, beetling cliffs of black, red, and green volcanic rocks, and here and there stand up rocky islets, the home of the cormorant and the bittern. In a small cove called Sheikh Jabar, Halfway between Sadad and Muscat, and accessible only by boat, for none but the most active of the natives can scale the overhanging rocks, is a tiny strand which has been chosen as the Christian burial place. There are not very many graves in this weird spot, and most of them are occupied by men from the gunboats which have been stationed at Muscat. Among them is the grave of Bishop French, who came to Muscat some years ago with the object of doing missionary work amongst the Omani but he fell a sacrifice to the pernicious climate before he had been long at his post, and before he had succeeded in making any converts. About three miles from Muscat lies the town of El Matra, the commercial center of the kingdom of Oman. It would be the seat of government also, were it not exposed to the southern winds. The journey is nearly always made by sea. It takes much longer to go by land, for a ridge of hills has to be crossed. In a canoe it is only half an hour's paddle, and when the weather is favorable, the canoe owners drive a rattling trade. The canoes, which they call huris, are hollowed out of a tree trunk, double proud, and with matting at the bottom. They are not very stable, and make one think unpleasantly of sharks. You pass the fahal, or stallion rock, in the harbor, a name constantly given by Arabs to anything large and uncanny-looking, and turning sharp round a rocky corner, you see before you El Matra. The town is governed by a wali chosen by the imam, and in the bazaars may be seen, in hopeless confusion, banyans from India, Omani, Bedouin, Persians, and Jews. These nationalities have each their separate wards for living in, walled off to keep them from perpetual brawls, and they only meet one another in the bazaars, where the eye of the bazaar master is upon them, 
ready to inflict condign punishment on disturbers of the peace, in which cases the innocent more frequently suffer than the guilty. The Monday's market is filled with quaint country folk, bringing in baskets of fruit and wearing the upper garment of red cotton and the large white girdle and turban. At El Matra live most of the richest merchants, and it is the point from which all the caravan roads into the interior start. It, too, has a Portuguese castle, and presents a much more alluring frontage than Muscat. In a nice-looking house by the shore dwelt Dr. Jayakar, an Indian doctor who had lived for twenty-five years at Muscat, combining the post of British vice-consul with that of medical adviser to the few Europeans who dwell there. He said he preferred Muscat to any other place in the world, and hoped to end his days there. He was a great naturalist, and his house was filled with curious animals from the interior, and marvels from the deep. He showed us specimens of a rabbit-like animal which the Arabs called Wahabba, and which he affirmed is the coney of the Bible, and of the oryx, which lives up on the Jabal Akhdar. It has two straight horns, which for one instant, and from one point of view when it is running sideways, look like one. And some say the fact gave rise to the mythical unicorn. It is, to say the least of it, a great disadvantage to have your medical man at El Matra when you are ill at Muscat. If the weather is stormy, boats cannot go between the two places. There is a troublesome road across the headland by which the doctor can come, partly by water and partly on foot in case of dire necessity. But the caravan road, entirely by land, goes a long way inland, and would take the medical man all day to traverse. Behind El Matra are pleasant gardens, watered by irrigation, which produce most of the fruit and vegetables consumed in these parts. During our fortnight's stay at Muscat in 1895, we frequently in the evening coolness rowed about the harbor, and examined its bays and promontories. The energetic crews of numerous gunboats of various nationalities stationed here at different times have beguiled their time by illuminating the bare cliffs with the names of their ships in large letters done in white paint. French, Russian, Italian, and German names are here to be read, but by far the largest number are in English. The rocks at the mouth of the harbor are literally covered with delicious oysters, and one of our entertainments was at low tide to land on these rocks and get our boatmen to detach as many of the shellfish as we could conveniently consume. Such is Muscat as it exists today, a spot which has had a varied history in the past, and the future of which will be equally interesting to those who have any connection with the Persian Gulf. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Southern Arabia – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter 6. Mukella. After our journeys in South Africa and Abyssinia, it was suggested to my husband that a survey of the Hadramaut by an independent traveler would be useful to the government. So in the winter of 1893-1894, we determined to do our best to penetrate into this unknown district, which anciently was the center of the frankincense and myrrh trade, one of the most famed commercial centers of Arabi the Blessed, before Mohammedan fanaticism blighted all industries and closed the peninsula to the outer world. In the proper acceptation of the term, the Hadramaut at the present time is not a district running along the southeast coast of Arabia, between the sea and the central desert, as is generally supposed, but it is simply a broad valley running for one hundred miles or more parallel to the coast, by which the valleys of the high Arabian tableland discharge their not abundant supply of water into the sea at Sehut, towards which place this valley gradually slopes. There is every reason to believe that anciently, too, the Hadramaut meant only this valley. We learnt from Himyaritic inscriptions that five centuries B.C. the name was spelt by the Himyars as it is now, namely T-M-R-D-H. Beginning of reader's note, symbol, see page image, end of reader's note, and meant in that tongue the enclosure or valley of death a name which in Hebrew form corresponds exactly to that of Hazer Maveth, 
of the tenth chapter of Genesis, and which the Greeks, in their usual slipshod manner, occasioned by their inability, as is the case still, to pronounce a pure H, converted into chatormite, a form which still survives in the Italian word ketrame, or pitch. Owing to the intense fanaticism of the inhabitants, this main valley has been reached only by one European before ourselves, namely Er Leo Hirsch in 1893. In 1846, von Rede made a bold attempt to reach it, but only got as far as the collateral valley of Doan. My husband and I were the first to attempt, in the latter part of 1893 and the early part of 1894, this journey without any disguise, and with a considerable train of followers. And I think, for this very reason, that we went openly, we made more impression on the natives, and were able to remain there longer and see more than might otherwise have been the case, and to establish relations with the inhabitants which, I hope, will hereafter lead to very satisfactory results. Having arrived at Aden with letters of recommendation to the resident from the Indian government and the India office, besides private introductions, we were amazed at all the difficulties thrown in our way. It quite appeared as if we had left our native land to do some evil deed to its detriment, and we were made to feel how thoroughly degrading it is to take up the vocation of an archaeologist and explorer. Many strange and unexpected things befell us, but the most remarkable of all was that when a certain surgeon captain asked for leave to accompany us, it was refused to him, on the ground that Mr. Theodore Bent's expedition was not sanctioned by government, in spite of the fact that the Indian government had actually placed at my husband's disposal a surveyor, Imam Sharif, Khan Bahadur. We had no assistance beyond two very inferior letters to the sultans of Makella and Sheher, which made them think we were people of the rank of merchants, they afterwards said. Imam Sharif has traveled much with Englishmen, so he speaks our language perfectly, and having a keen sense of humor, plenty of courage and tact, and no Mohammedan prejudices, we got on splendidly together. He was a very agreeable member of the party. My husband paid all his expenses from Quetta via Bombay, with three servants, including their tents in Camp Equipage, and back to Quetta. Our party was rather a large one, for besides ourselves and our faithful Greek servant Matthäus, who has accompanied us in so many of our journeys, we had with us not only the Indians, but a young gardener from Kew, William Lunt by name, as botanist, and an Egyptian named Mahmoud Bayoumi, as naturalist, sent by Dr. Anderson, whose collections are now in the British Museum of Natural History at South Kensington. The former was provided with all the requisites for digging up forest trees, and Mahmoud had with him all that was necessary for pickling and preserving large mammals, for no one knew what might be found in the unknown land, and many were the volunteers to join the party as hunters who promised to keep us in game, whereas if they had come they would only have found reptiles. An interpreter was recommended to us by the native political agent at Aden, Salah Mohammed Jafar, Khan Bahadur, a certain Salah Hassan. He proved to be a fanatical Muslim, whose only object seemed to be to terrify us and to raise enemies against us, in order to prevent our trampling the Holy Land where Muhammad was born. Throughout our journey he was a constant source of difficulty and danger. Our starting point for the interior was Makella, which is 230 miles from Aden, and is the only spot between Aden and Muscat which has any pretensions to the name of port. The name itself means harbor. It is first mentioned by Ibn Mujawir. Hamdani calls it El Asa Lhasa, and Masudi gives the name as Lhasa. The harbor is not available during the southwest monsoon, and then all the boats go off to Ra'es Burum, or the basalt head. Here we were deposited in December 1893 by a chance steamer one which had been chartered and on which for a consideration we were allowed to take passage. I took turns with the captain to sleep in his cabin, but there was nothing but the duck for the others. Immediately behind the town rise grim arid mountains of a reddish hue, and the town is plastered against this rich tinged background. By the shore, like a lighthouse, 
stands the white minaret of the mosque, the walls and pinnacles of which are covered with dense masses of seabirds and pigeons. The gate of this mosque, which is really nearly in the sea, is blocked up by tanks so that no one can enter with unwashed feet. Not far from this rises the huge palace where the sultan dwells, reminding one of a whitewashed mill. White, red, and brown are the dominant colors of the town, and in the harbor the Arab dows, with fantastic sterns, rock to and fro in the unsteady sea, forming altogether a picturesque and unusual scene. Beyond the Beb Asab are huts where dwell the Bedouin who come in from the mountains. They are not allowed to sleep within the town. There is a praying place just outside the gate. In the middle of the town is a great cemetery full of tamarisks and containing the sacred tomb of the sainted Wali Yaqub in the center. We were amused by a dance at a straight corner to the beating of drums. It consisted of a hot, seething mass of brown bodies writhing about and apparently enjoying themselves. Stone tobacco pipes are made here of a kind of limestone, very curly silver powder flasks rather like nautilus shells, and curious guns without stocks. The Bedou women wear tremendously heavy belts and very wide brass armlets. Their faces are veiled with something like the yashmak of Egypt, but it is of plain blue calico, a little embroidered. Makella is ruled over by a sultan of the Al-Qaiti family, whose connection with India has made them very English in their sympathies, and his majesty's general appearance, with his velvet coat and jeweled daggers, is far more Indian than Arabian. Really, the most influential people in the town are the money-grubbing Parsis from Bombay, and it is essentially one of those commercial centers where Hindustani is spoken nearly as much as Arabian. The government of the country is now almost entirely in the hands of the al Qaeda family, which at present is the most powerful family in the district, and is reputed to be the richest in Arabia. About five generations ago, the Sayyids of the Abu Bakr family, at that time the chief Arab family at the Hadramaut, who claimed descent from the first of the Khalifs, were at variance with the Bedou tribes, and in their extremity they invited assistance from the chiefs of the Yafia tribe, who inhabit the Yafia district, to the northeast of Aden. To this request, the al Qaeda family responded by sending assistance to the Sayyids of the Hadramaut, putting down the troublesome Bedou tribes and establishing a fair amount of peace and prosperity in the country, though even to this day the Bedouin of the mountains are ever ready to swoop down and harass the more peaceful inhabitants of the towns. At the same time the al Qaeda family established themselves in the Hadramaut, and for the last four generations have been steadily adding to the power thus acquired. Makella, Shehar, Shabam, Haura, Hagarain, all belong to them, and they are continually increasing, by purchase, the area of their influence in the collateral valleys, building substantial castles, and establishing one of the most powerful dynasties in this much divided country. They get all their money from the strait settlements, for it has been the custom of the Hadrami to leave their own sterile country to seek their fortunes abroad. The Nizam of Hyderabad has an Arab regiment composed entirely of Hadrami, and the Sultan Nawazjang, the present head of the al Qaeda family, is its general. He lives in India and governs his Arabian possessions by deputy. His son Ghalib ruled in Shahar. His nephew Manasser, who receives a dollar a day from England, ruled in Makalla. And his nephew Saleh ruled in Shabam. And the governors of the other towns are mostly connections of this family. The power and wealth of this family are almost the only guarantee for peace and prosperity in an otherwise lawless country. The white palace of the Sultan Manasser is six stories high, with little carved windows and a pretty sort of cornice of openwork bricks, unbaked, of course, save by the sun. It stands on a little peninsula, and like Riviera towns, has pretty coast views on either side. The Sultan received us with his two young sons, dressed up in as many fine clothes as it was possible to put on, and attended by his vizier, Abdul Khalik. No business was done as to our departure, but only compliments were paid on both sides. After we had separated, presents were sent by us, loaves of sugar being an indispensable accompaniment. The so-called palace in which we were lodged was next to the mosque and close to the bazaar. 
The smells and noise were almost unendurable, so we worked hard to get our preparations made and to make our sojourn here as short as possible. This palace was a large building. A very dirty staircase led to a quantity of rooms, large and small, inhabited in rather a confusing manner, not only by our own party, but by another. And to get at our servants, we had to pick our way between the prostrate forms of an Arabian gentleman and his attendants. We were the first arrivals, so we collected from the various rooms as many bits of torn and rotten old matting as we could find, to keep the dust down in our own room, which was about forty feet long by thirty feet wide so very much covered with dust that no pavement could be seen without digging. It would have been necessary to have seven maids with seven brooms to sweep for half a year before they could have cleared that room. Windows were all round, unglazed, of course, and quite shutterless. We set out our furniture and had plenty of room to spread the baggage round us. An enormous packing case from Kew Gardens had little besides a great fork in it, so that case came no farther. Another case, to which the botanist had to resort constantly, had always to be tied up with rope, as it had neither lock nor hinges. We were six days at Mekella, arranging about camels and safe conduct, and wondering when we should get away. So, of course, we had plenty of time to inspect the town, which on account of the many Parsees had quite an Indian air in some parts. Sometimes one comes upon a deliciously scented part in the bazaars, where myrrh and spices, a tar of roses, and rose leaves are sold in little grimy holes almost too small to enter. But for the part near the fish market, I can only say that awful stenches prevail, and the part where dates and other fruits are sold is almost impassable from flies. For our journey inland, we were entrusted by the Sultan to a tribe of Bedouin and their camels. Mokhayak was the name of our Mokadim, or headman and his tribe rejoiced in the name of Khaliki. They were tiny spare men, quite beardless, with very refined, gentle faces. They might easily have been taken for women, so gentle and pretty were they. They were naturally dark, and made darker still by dirt and indigo. Their long, shaggy hair was twisted up into a knot and bound by a long plaited leather string, like a boot lace, which was wound round the hair and then two or three times round the head, like the fillet worn by Greek women in ancient times. They were naked save for a loincloth and the girdle to which were attached their brass powder flasks, shaped like a ram's horn, their silver cases for flint and steel, their daggers and their thorn extractors, consisting of a picker and tweezers fastened together. They are very different from the stately Bedouin of Syria and Egypt, and are, both as to religion and physique, distinctly an aboriginal race of southern Arabia, as different from the Arab as the Hindu is from the Anglo-Saxon. Our ideas as to Bedouin and Bedoui, which latter word we never heard while we were in southern Arabia, were that they were tall, bearded men, not very dark in color, and our imaginations connected them with hospitality and much clothes. None of these characteristics are found among the Bedouin of this district. Bedouin is not a word in use, but Bedou for both singular and plural. They speak of themselves as el Bedou, and when they have seen us wondering at some strange custom, they have said apologetically, Ah, Bedou, Bedou. I have heard them address a man whose name they did not know, Ya Bedou. I mean to use Bedou for singular and Bedouin for plural. Besides the Bedouin, we were accompanied by five soldiers, Muafik al-Buriti, Taisir Fahari, Buriki, and an old man. For the twenty-two camels, we paid one hundred and seventy-five dollars to Hagarain, a journey, we were told, of twenty days. It would have been useless to have had riding camels, as one could get no faster than the baggage and soldiers, and traveling so far daily and up such rocks, one had to go at foot pace. We should have had to wait longer at Mekella while more camels were collected, and the more camels you have, the farther they stray when food is scarce and the more chance there is of the annoyance of waiting for lost camels to be found, and sometimes found too late to start that day. We need not have had twenty-two camels, and once later all the baggage was sent on ten, but this was to suit the purposes of the Bedouin. Before proceeding further with our journey, I will here say a few words concerning the somewhat complex body politic of this portion of Arabia, the inhabitants of which may be divided into four distinct classes. 
Firstly, there are numerous wild tribes of Bedouins scattered all over the country, who do all the carrying trade, rear and own most of the camels, and possess large tracts of country, chiefly on the highlands and smaller valleys. They are very numerous and powerful, and the Arabs of the towns are certainly afraid of them, for they can make traveling in the country very difficult, and even blockade the towns. They never live in tents, as do the Bedouin of northern Arabia. The richer ones have quite large houses, whilst the poorer ones, those in Shabwa and the Wadi Adim, for instance, dwell in caves. Secondly, we have the Arabs proper, a decidedly later importation into the country than the Bedouin. They live in and cultivate the lands around the towns. Many of them carry on trade and go to India and the Strait settlements, and some of them are very wealthy. They also are divided into tribes. The chief of those dwelling in the Hadramaut are the Yafai, Katiri, Minhali, Amri, and Tamimi. The Bedouin reside amongst them, and they are constantly at war with one another, and the complex system of tribal union is exceedingly difficult to grasp. Thirdly, we have the Sayyids and Sharifs, a sort of aristocratic hierarchy, who trace their descent from the daughter and son of the Prophet. Their influence in the Hadramaut is enormous, and they fan the religious superstition of the people, for to this they owe their existence. They boast that their pedigree is purer than that of any other Sayyid family, even than those of Mecca and Medina. Sayyids and Sharifs are to be found in all the large towns and considerable villages, and even the Arab sultans show them a marked respect and kiss their hands when they enter a room. They have a distinct jurisdiction of their own, and most disputed points of property, water rights, and so on are referred to their decision. They look with peculiar distrust on the introduction of external influence into their sacred country, and are the obstructionists of the Hadramaut, but at the same time their influence is decidedly towards law and order in a lawless land. They never carry arms. Lastly, we have the slave population of the Hadramaut, all of African origin, and the freed slaves who have married and settled in the country. Most of the tillers of the soil, personal servants, and the soldiers of the sultans are of this class. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Southern Arabia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent Chapter 7 Our Departure into the Interior Never shall I forget the confusion of our start. Mokake and ten of his men appeared at seven in the morning of the day before in our rooms, with all the lowest beggars of Mekella in their train, and were let loose on our seventy packages like so many demons from Jehennem, yelling and quarreling with one another. First of all, the luggage had to be divided into loads for twenty-two camels. Then they drew lots for these loads with small sticks. Then they drew lots for us riders. And finally, we had a stormy bargain as to the price, which was finally decided upon when the vizier came to help us, and ratified by his exchanging daggers with Mokaik, each dagger being presented on a flat hand. In the bazaars, bargains are struck by placing the first two fingers of one contractor on the hand of the other. All that day they were rushing in and weighing, and exhorting us to be ready betimes in the morning, so we were quite ready about sunrise. We felt worn and weary when a start was made at two o'clock, and our cup of bitterness was full when we were deposited, bag and baggage, a few hundred yards from the gate, and told that we must spend the night amidst a sea of small fish drying on the shore, and surrounded on all sides by dirty Bedou huts. These fish which are rather larger than sardines, are put out to dry by thousands along this coast. Men feed on them, and so do the camels. They make lamp oil out of them. They say the fish strengthens the camel's back, and they consider it good for camels to go once a year to the sea. Large sacks of them are taken into the interior as merchandise. They are mixed with small leaves like box, and carried in palm leaf sacks, about three feet wide and one and a half feet high and the air everywhere is redolent of their stench. At this point we had the first of many quarrels with our camel men. We insisted on being taken two miles farther on, away from the smells. 
Nothing short of threats of returning and getting the sultan to beat them and put them in prison enabled us to break through the conventional Arab custom of encamping for the first night outside the city gates. However, we succeeded in reaching Bahrain, where white wells are placed for the benefit of wayfarers. And there, beneath the pleasant shade of the palm trees, we halted for the remainder of the day and recovered from the agonies of our start. Among the trees was a bungalow belonging to the sultan, where we had hoped to have been able to sleep, but it was pervaded by such a strong smell of fish that we preferred to pitch our tents. Between this place and Mekella all is arid waste, but near the town, by the help of irrigation, bananas and coconut trees flourish in a shallow valley called the Beginning of Light. There are numerous fortresses about Bahrain so the road is now quite safe for the inhabitants of Mekella. The sultan has done a good deal to repress the Bedouin who used to raid right into the town. He crucified many of them. We took a couple of hours over our start next day, the Bedouin again quarreling over the luggage, each trying to scramble for the lightest packages and the lightest riders. They tried to make me ride a camel and give up my horse to my husband. As he was so tall he could obtain neither a horse nor a donkey, so had perforce to ride a camel. He had been able to buy a little dark donkey for Imam Sharif, and the Sultan gave me a horse, but all the rest were on camels. I thought I should enjoy riding by the camels and talking to everyone, but my hopes were not carried out. The difficulty of passing the strings of camels was enormous. The country was so very stony that if you left the narrow path, it took a long time to pick your way. I used to start first with Imam Sharif, and then my horse, at foot pace, got so far ahead that the soldiers said, We cannot guard both you and the camels. I had then to pull in the horse with all my might. Sometimes I went on with Imam Sharif, one soldier and a servant carrying the plane table. He used to go up some hill to survey, and I, of course, had to climb too for safety. I had to rush down when I saw our kafila coming and mount to keep in front. If I got behind... The camels were so terrified that they danced about and shed their loads, and I was cursed and sworn out by their drivers. We stopped three hours at Basra, ten miles, where there are a few houses, water, and some cultivation, and where the camels were suddenly unloaded without leave, and there was a great row, because we moved the soldiers' guns from the tree, the shade of which we wished to have ourselves. We again threatened to return, but at last, as Taysir fortunately could speak Hindustani, he could make peace, and they ended by kissing hands and saying, Salam, peace. The sun was setting when we reached a sandy place called Tukhum, another five miles on, where we camped near some stagnant water. We had to wait for the moon to fend our baggage and get out the lantern. We had traveled over almost leafless plains, save that they had little patches of misambrianthemum and the in inevitable balloon shrub, matar. Rising and starting by moonlight on Christmas morning, we stopped in Wedi Rafit, Matar, a very pretty side valley with warm water and palm trees, and what looked like a grassy sward near the water, but which really consisted of a tiny kind of palm. The camel men wanted to pass this place and camp far away on the stones, sending skins for water, but somehow my husband found this out after we had passed Wedi Rafit and managed to carry off the camels tied tail after tail to his own camel, so the Bedouin had to follow unwillingly. We gave them some presents, saying it was not an everyday occurrence, but that this was a great feast with us. So we made friends. The Bedouin were very unruly about the packing. We could not get our most needful things kept handy, and they liked to pack our bread with their fish and the water skins anywhere among our bedding. Mukay did not seem to have much authority over the various owners of the camels, and they were always quarreling among themselves, robbing each other of light loads and leaving some heavy thing that no one wished for lying on the ground. This often occasioned repacking. They had, for each camel, a stout pair of sticks with strong ropes attached, and having bound a bundle of packages to each stick, Two men lifted them and wound the ropes round the sticks over a very tiny pack saddle and a mass of untidy rags. When we arrived, they liked to simply loose the ropes from the sticks and let the baggage clatter to the ground and lead away the camels. 
as they would not be persuaded to sort the things, and as twenty-two camels cover a good deal of space, it was like seeking the slain on a battlefield when we had to wander about having every bundle untied. Three days camel riding up one of the short valleys which lead towards the high tableland offered little of interest beyond arid igneous rocks and burnt up sand-covered valleys with distorted strata on either side. Here and there, where warm volcanic streams rise out of the ground, the wilderness is converted into a luxuriant garden in which palms, tobacco, and other green things grow. One of the scrub trees which clothe the wilderness is called by the Arabs brak, and is used by them for cleaning their teeth. It amused us to chew this as we went along. It is slightly bitter, but cleans the teeth most effectually. There is also a poisonous sort of cucumber, called by the Arabs medakdak. They clean out the inside and fill the skin with water, which they drink as a medicine. At Siba, which we reached after a very hot ride of twelve or thirteen miles, we found water with scores of camels lying round it, for there were two or three other kafilas, or caravans, beside our own. It was dreadfully cold that night, and we could not get at our bag of blankets. Next we entered the narrow, tortuous valley of Hawuri, which ascends toward the highland, in which the midday heat was intense and at our evening halts we suffered not a little from camel ticks, which abound in the sand, until we learnt to avoid old camping grounds and not to pitch our tents in the immediate vicinity of the wells. We encamped in a narrow, stony river bed between walls of rock, near a little village called Tahaya. There is a good deal of cultivation about. The closeness of the situation made the smell of the dried fish we carried for the camels almost unbearable. These sacks are stretched open in the evening and put in the middle of a circle of camels, their masters often joining in the feast. One of the men was attacked by fever, so he was given quinine, and his friends were told to put him to bed and cover him well. When we went to visit him later, we found him quite contented in one of these fish sacks, his head in one corner and his legs all doubled up and packed in. Only a bare brown back was exposed so we had a few of the camel's rags thrown on his back, and he was well next day. We went on ten miles to El Rail, rising to an altitude of two thousand feet above the sea level. This word, Rail, begins with the Arabic Rain, which is a soft sound between R and G. There are two villages near the head of the Wadi Hawari, where there is actually a Rail, that rare phenomenon in Arabia, a rill or running stream. Here the Bedou inhabitants cultivate the date palm, and have green patches of lucerne and grain, very refreshing to the eye. We had come up one of the narrowest of gorges, but with hundreds of palm trees around El Rail, the first of the two villages, which is in the end of the Wadi Hawuri. It is an uninteresting collection of stone huts, with many pretty little fields, and maidenhair fern overhanging the wayside. There are little enclosures with walls round them and small stones in them, on which they dry the dates before sending them to Aden. The rocky river bed itself is waterless, the rail being used up in irrigation. At Al Bata, which is just above the tableland, we actually encamped under a spreading tree, a wild, unedible fig called Luthba by the Arabs, a nickname given to all worthless, idle individuals in these parts. Bedou women crowded around us, closely veiled in indigo-dyed masks, with narrow slits for their eyes, carrying their babies with them in rude cradles resembling hen-coops, with a cluster of charms hung from the top, which has the twofold advantage of amusing the baby and keeping off the evil eye. After much persuasion, we induced one of the good ladies to sit for her photograph, or rather to sit still, while something was being done which she did not in the least understand. There is very good water at Albata, and so much of the kind of herbs that camels like that we delayed our departure till eight, shivering by a fire and longing as ardently for the arrival of the sun as we should for his departure. The road had been so steep and stony that the camel riders had all been on foot for two days. I am sure that, except near a spring, no one dropped from the skies, would dream he was in Arabia the Happy. It is hard to think that the stony and the desert must be worse. End of chapter 7 
Chapter 8 of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter 8 The Akaba. Having left these villages behind us, we climbed rapidly, higher and higher, until, at an elevation of over four thousand feet, we found ourselves at last on a broad, level tableland, stretching as far as the eye could reach in every direction. This is, no doubt, the Maratha Mountains of Ptolemy, the Mons Excelsis of Pliny. Beginning of footnote 8. In medio Arabiae, fere sunt atramitae, bacus saboraium in monte excelso. End of footnote 8 which shuts off the Hadramaut, where once flourished the frankincense and the myrrh. Words cannot express the desolate aspect of this vast tableland, a Kaaba, or the going up, as the Arabs call it. It is perfectly level, and strewn with black lumps of basalt, looking as though a gigantic coal scuttle had been upset. Occasionally there rises up above the plain a flat-topped mound or ridge, some eighty feet high, the last remnant of a higher level which is now disappearing. There is no sign of habitation. Only here and there are a few tanks, dug to collect the rainwater, if any falls. These are protected or indicated by a pair of walls built opposite one another, and banked up on the outer side with earth and stones, like shooting butts. The Akaba is exclusively Bedou property, and wherever a little herbage is to be found, there the nomads drive their flocks and young camels. Of the frankincense which once flourished over all this vast area, we saw only one specimen on the highland itself, though it is still found in the more sheltered gullies, and farther east in the Mehri country there is, I understand, a considerable quantity left. We were often given lumps of gum arabic, and myrrh is still found plentifully. It is tapped for its odiferous sap. It is a curious fact that the Somali come from Africa to collect it, going from tribe to tribe of the Bedouin, and buying the right to collect these two species, sometimes paying as much as fifty dollars. They go round and cut the trees, and after eight days return to collect the exuded sap. In ancient times none but slaves collected frankincense and myrrh. This fact, taken probably with the meaning of the name Hadramaut, the later form of the ancient name Hazer Maveth, gave rise to the quaint Greek legend that the fumes of the frankincense trees were deadly, and the place where they grew was called the valley or enclosure of death. From personal observation it would appear that the ancients held communication with the Hadramaut almost entirely by the land caravan route, as there is absolutely no trace of great antiquity to be found along the coastline whereas the Wadi Hadramaut itself and its collateral branches are very rich in remains of the ancient Hemuritic civilization. Though we were always looking about for monuments of antiquity, the most ancient and lasting memorial of far past ages lay beneath our feet in that little narrow path winding over Akaba and Wadi, and polished by the soft feet of millions of camels that had slowly passed over it for thousands and thousands of years. We found the air of the tableland fresh and invigorating after the excessive heat of the valleys below. For three days we traveled northwards across the plateau. Our first stage was Hebel Gabrin. This is, as it were, the culminating point of the whole district. It is 4,150 feet above the sea. From it the tableland slopes gently down to the northward towards the main valley of the Hadramaut and eastwards towards the Wedi Adam. After two days more traveling, we approached the heads of the many valleys which run into the Hadramaut. The Wedis Doyen, Rahi, Al-Aisa, Al-Ain, Bin Ali, and Adam all start from this elevated plateau and run nearly parallel. The curious feature of most of these valleys is the rapid descent into them. They look as if they had been taken out of the high plateau like slices out of a cake. They do not appear to have been formed by a fall of water from this plateau. In fact, it is impossible that a sufficient force of water could ever have existed on this flat surface to form this elaborate valley system. 
In the valleys themselves there is very little slope, for we found that, with the exception of the Wadi Adim, all the valley heads we visited were nearly of uniform height with the main valley and had a wall of rock approaching 1,000 feet in height, eaten away, as it were, out of the plateau. We were therefore led to suppose that these valleys had originally been formed by the action of the sea, and that the Hadramaut had once been a large bay or arm of the sea, which, as the waters of the ocean, receded, leaving successive marks of many strands on the limestone and sandstone rocks which enclosed them, formed an outlet for the scanty water supply of the southern Arabian highlands. These valleys have, in the course of ages, been silted up by sand to a considerable height, below which water is always found, and the only means of obtaining water in the Hadramaut for drinking purposes, as well as for cultivation, is by sinking wells. The water of the main valley is strongly impregnated with salt, but is much sweeter at the sides of the valley than in the center. No doubt this is caused by the weight of the alkaline deposits washed down from the salt hills at Shebwa, at the head of the main valley. The steep reddish sandstone cliffs which form the walls of these valleys are themselves almost always divided into three distinct stories or stratifications, which can be distinctly seen on the photographs. The upper one is very abrupt, the second slightly projecting and more broken, and the third formed by deposit from above. The descent into the valley is extremely difficult at all points. Paths down which camels can just make their way have been constructed by the Bedouin, by making use of the stratified formation and the gentler slopes. But only in the case of the Wadi Adim, of all the valleys we visited, is there anything approaching a gradual descent. It appears to me highly probable that the systematic destruction of the frankincense and myrrh trees through countless generations has done much to alter the character of this Akaba, and has contributed to the gradual silting up of the Hadramaut and its collateral valleys, to which fact I shall again have occasion to refer. The aspect of this plateau forcibly recalled to our minds that portion of Abyssinia which we visited in 1892 through 1893. There is the same arid coastline between the sea and the mountains, and the same rapid ascent to a similar absolutely level plateau, and the same draining northwards to a large riverbed in the case of Abyssinia, and to the valleys of the Marib and other tributaries of the Nile, and in the case of this Arabian plateau into the Hadramaut. Only Abyssinia has a more copious rainfall, which makes its plateau more productive. It had not been our intention to visit the Wedi al Aisa, but to approach the Hadramaut by another valley, called Doan, parallel and further west, but our camelmen would not take us that way, and purposely got up a scare that the men of Hureba, at the head of Wedi Doan, were going to attack us, and would refuse to let us pass. A convenient old woman was found who professed to bring this news a dodge subsequently resorted to by another Bedou tribe which wanted to govern our progress. The report brought to us, as from the old woman, was to this effect. A large body of sheikhs and seyyids having started from Khureba, beginning of footnote 9, the town of Khureba in the Wedi Doan may represent the town of Doan itself mentioned by Hamdani, the Thobani of Ptolemy, which Pliny calls Toani. The name Choreba signifies ruins. End of footnote 9. To meet and repel us, Mokhaik's father had left home to help us. As we had now abandoned Choreba, Mokhaik said he was anxious to hurry home to meet his father and prevent a hostile collision. Mokhaik was told he could not go, as he was responsible for our safety, but that some others might go. No, said Mokhaik. They cannot be spared from the camels. We will get two men from the village. My husband agreed to this, but when Mukaik proposed that my husband should at once pay these men, he told Mukaik that he must pay them himself, as he was paid to protect us. This attempt at extortion having failed, we passed a peaceful night and subsequently found Mukaik's father, Suleiman Bakran, safe at home, which he had never thought of leaving. Our first peep down into the Wedi al Aisa, towards which our Bedouin had conducted us, was striking in the extreme. 
and as we gazed down into the narrow valley with its line of vegetation and its numerous villages, we felt as if we were on the edge of another world. The descent from the tableland to the Wedi is exactly 1,500 feet by a difficult but very skillfully engineered footpath. The sun's rays, reflected from the limestone cliffs, were scorchingly hot. The camels went a longer way round, nearer the head of the valley, but so difficult was our shortcut that they arrived before us, and the horse, and the donkey. Having humbly descended into the Wedi al Aisa, because we were not allowed to go by the Wedi Doran, we found ourselves encamped hard by the village of Khaila, the headquarters of the Khailiki tribe within a stone's throw of Mukhaik's father's house, and under the shadow of the castle of his uncle, the sheikh of the tribe. These worthies both extorted from us substantial sums of money, and sold us food at exorbitant prices, and so we soon learnt why we were not permitted to go to Khoreba, and why the old woman and her story had been produced. We thought Mukhaik and his men little better than naked savages when on the plateau, but when we were introduced to their relatives, and when we saw their castles and their palm groves and their long line of gardens in the narrow valley, our preconceived notions of the wild homeless Bedou and his poverty underwent considerable change. We climbed up the side of the valley opposite Khaila to photograph a castle adorned with horns but were driven away. Too late, for the picture had been taken. During the two days we encamped at Khaila, we were gazed upon uninterruptedly by a relentless crowd of men, women, and children. It amused us at first to see the women, here for the most part unmasked, with their exceedingly heavy girdles of brass, their anklets of brass half a foot deep, their bracelets of brass, their iron nose rings, and their massive and numerous earrings, which tore down the lobe of the ear with their weight. Every Bedou, male or female, has a ring or charm of cornelian set in base silver, and agates and small tusks also set in silver. The root with which the women paint themselves yellow is called shubab. It is dried and powdered. It only grows when there is rain. The whole of the poultry at Khaila was carried about in the arms of the women and children who owned them, all the time of our sojourn, in the hopes of selling them. They, at least, were glad of our departure. Not far from Khaila, we saw a fine village which we were told was inhabited by Arabs of pure blood, so we sent a polite message to the Sayyid, or headman of the place, to ask if we might pay him our respects. His reply was to the effect that if we paid thirty dollars, we might come and pass four hours in the town. Needless to say, we declined the invitation with thanks, and on the morrow, when we marched down to the Wadi al Aisa, we gave the abode of this hospitable Sayyid a wide berth particularly as the soldiers told us it was not safe, for the Arabs meant to kill us. Leaving Khaila, where we remained two nights and saw the new year in, we passed a good many towered villages. Larzma was one, Hadouf another, also Subak and others. We passed the mouth of the Wedi Doran, which runs parallel to Wedi al Aisa, and has two branches, only the largest having the name Doran. The mouth is about three miles below Khaila, five miles more brought us to Sleif, where we halted for a night. It is also inhabited by pure Arabs, who treated us with excessive rudeness. It is a very picturesque spot, perched on a rock, with towers and turrets constructed of sun-dried brick. Only here, as elsewhere in these valleys, the houses being so exactly the same color as the rocks behind them, they lose their effect. The rich have evidently recognized this difficulty and whitewashed their houses. But in the poorer villages there is no whitewash, and consequently nothing to make them stand out from their surroundings. One can pretty well judge of the wealth of the owners of the various towers and castles by the amount of whitewash. Some have only the pinnacles white, and some can afford to trim up the windows and put bands round the building. At Sif, Several men came once or twice and begged my husband to let me go out that the women might see me. But when I went out, they would not allow me to approach or hold any intercourse with the Arab women, using opprobrious epithets when I tried to make friendly overtures, with the quaint result that whenever I advanced towards a group of gazing females, they fled precipitately like a flock of sheep before a collie dog. 
so we discovered that it was the men themselves who wished to see me. These women wear their dresses high in front, showing their yellow painted legs above the knee, and long behind. They are of deep blue cotton, decorated with fine embroidery, and patches of yellow and red sewn on in patterns. It is the universal female dress in the Hadramaut, and looks as if the fashion had not changed since the days when Hazer Maveth the patriarch settled in this valley and gave it his name. Beginning of footnote 10. Genesis 10.26. 10, End of footnote 10. The tall, tapering straw hat worn by these women when in the fields contributes with the mask to make the Hadrami females as externally repulsive as the most jealous of husbands could desire. I am pretty sure that this must be the very same dress which made such an unfavorable impression upon Sir John Mondeville when he saw the foul women who live near Babylon the Great. He says, They are vilely arrayed. They go barefoot and clothed in evil garments, large and wide, but short to the knees, long sleeves down to the feet like a monk's frock, and their sleeves are hanging about their shoulders. The dress is certainly wide, for the two pieces of which it is composed, exactly like the Greek peplus, when the arms are extended, stretch from fingertip to fingertip. So when this dress is caught into the loose girdle far below the waist, it hangs out under the arms and gives a very round-backed look, as is the case with the peplus. There are a great many Arabs at Sif, a most unhealthy, diseased-looking lot. They are of the yellow kind of Arab, with Jewish-looking faces. Saleh retired into Sif on our arrival, and we saw him no more till we started next day. He was a very useless interpreter. He used to like to live in the villages, saying he could not bear to live in the camp of such unbelievers as we were, and used to bring his friends to our kitchen and show them some little tins of Lazenby's potted meat, adorned with a picture of a sheep, a cow, and a pig, as a proof that we lived on pork, whereas we had none with us. He always tried to persuade the people that he was far superior to any of us, and when places had to be made amongst the baggage on the camels, for my husband and the servants to ride, he used to have his camel prepared and ride on, leaving some of the servants with no seat kept on the camels for them. My husband cured him of this, for one morning, seeing Salah's bedding nicely arranged, he jumped on to the camel himself and rode off, leaving Salah an object of great derision. Once we got down into the valley, we had to ride very close together for safety and I found it most tiresome making my horse, Vasha, keep pace with the camels. The people at Sif were so disagreeable that I told Saleh to remind them that if our queen wanted their country, she would have had it long before we were born, and that they were very foolish to fear so small an unarmed party, who had only come to pass the winter in a country warmer than their own. At the same time, unless we had been quite confident that our safety was well secured from behind, such a party with a woman among them would never have come. We set off early next morning for Hagarain. We passed after one hour Qaidun, with its own private little valley to the west, a tributary of the main one which in this part is called Wadi Qasr. There is the grave of a celebrated saint, and a very pious Sayyid, called Al-Habid Taha Ali al-Hadad, abides near it. He never goes out of his house, but is so much revered that many thousands of dollars are sent him from India and other parts. And when his son visited Aden, he was received with great honor by the merchants there. Then we passed several other villages, including Alahadi and Nemur. It was at the ziaret, or pilgrimage, to the grave in Qaidun, that Er von Reida, who was disguised, was discovered to be a Christian and forced to turn back. The town of Hagarain, or Hajarain, is the principal one in the collateral valleys, and is built on a lofty, isolated rock in the middle of the Wedi Qasr, about twenty miles before it joins the main valley of the Hadramaut. With its towers and turrets, it recalled to our minds as we saw it in the distance certain hill-set medieval villages of Germany and Italy. Here a vice-sultan governs on behalf of the al Kaiti family, an ill-conditioned, extortionate individual whose bad reception of us contributed to his subsequent removal from office. Internally, Hagarain is squalid and dirty in the extreme. Each street is but a cesspool for the houses on either side of it. 
and the house allotted to us produced specimens of most smells and most insects. The days of rest we proposed for ourselves here were spent in fighting with our old camel men who left us here, in fighting with the new ones who were to take us on to the main valley, and in indignantly refusing to pay the sultan the sum of money which our presence in his town led him to think it his right to demand. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Southern Arabia》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Southern Arabia》by James and Mabel Bent《Chapter Nine — The Hadramaut — Through Wedi Qasr — When we reached the foot of the hill on which Hagarain stands, we dismounted. There was tremendous work to get out the sword of the oldest soldier. He had used it so much as a walking stick that it was firmly fixed in the scabbard. The scabbards are generally covered with white calico. A very steep, winding, slippery road led us to the gate, where soldiers received us and conducted us to a courtyard, letting off guns the while. There stood the Sultan Abdul Imberek Hamut al Kaiti, a very fat, evil looking man pitted by smallpox. After shaking hands, he led us down the tortuous streets to his palace, and then took us up a narrow mud staircase, so dark that we did not know whether to turn to the right or left. We sometimes went one way, and sometimes the other. At length we reached a small room with some goat-hair carpets, and we and the sultan, the soldiers, his and ours, the Bedouin, and my groom, Mbarek, all seated ourselves round the wall and after a long time a dirty glass of water was handed round as our only entertainment. As we had had nothing to eat since sunrise, and it was about two o'clock, we did not feel cheerful when the sultan abruptly rose and said he must pray. Praying and sleeping are always the excuses when they want to get rid of guests or say, not at home, and indeed the sleeping excuse prevails in Greece also. Sometime after our four chairs were brought, so we sat till near four o'clock homeless, and getting hungrier and hungrier, when the sultan reappeared, telling my husband all our things were locked up in a courtyard, and giving him a great wooden key. We hastened to our home, up a long dark stair, past many floors, all used as stalls and stables, etc., only the two top floors being devoted to human habitation. Each floor consisted of one fair-sized room and one very tiny den, a kitchen. The whole Indian party had the lower room, and three of our soldiers the den. I cannot think how they could all lie down at once, and they had to cook there besides. Above that we had the best room, the botanist and naturalist the den, and Theos made his abode on the roof where he cooked. The Bedouin, having unloaded the camels in the courtyard across the street, refused to help us, and, as no one else could be got, my husband and all his merry men had to carry up the baggage, while I wrestled with the beds and other furniture in our earthy room. The instant the baggage was up, the Bedouin clamored for payment, and it was trying work opening the various packages where the bags of money were scattered, and to begin quarreling when we were so weary and hungry. We had been told that our journey to Hagarain would take twenty days, whereas it only took thirteen, and that we must take two camels for water, which had proved unnecessary. Besides, the camels had been much loaded with fish and other goods belonging to the Bedouin. My husband said he would pay for the twenty days, and they would thus have thirty dollars as bakshish. But in the end the soldiers from Makella said we must pay bakshish, it would be an insult to their sultan if we did not, and they would go no further with us. The local sultan also insisting, fourteen more dollars had to be produced. Our own soldiers soon came shouting and saying they must have half a rupee a day for food, which my husband thought it wise to give, though the wazir at Makella had said he was to give nothing. They were hardly gone when the sultan came back personally, conducting two kids and saying, we need think of no further expense. We were his guests, and were to ask for what we wished. All my husband asked for was daily milk. We got some that day, but never again. My groom, Imbarek, then came, saying he must have food money, 
That being settled, he returned, saying the sultan said he must have half a rupee a day for my horse, which became very thin on the starvation he got. All this time we could get no water, so not till dark could Matthaios furnish us with tea, cold meat, bread, and honey. We were fortunate in having plenty of bread. We had six big sacks of large cakes of plain bread dried hard, and of this we had learnt the value by experience. We kept it sheltered, if there was any fear of rain, as in Abyssinia, for instance, and before a meal soaked it in water, wrapped it in a napkin a few minutes, and then dried it up to the consistency of fresh bread. We were often obliged to give it to the horses, for the difficulty as to forage makes them unfit to travel in such barren places. We also took charcoal, and found that, with it and the bread, we had our meals long before the Indian party, who had a weary search for fuel before they could even begin with pat-a-cake, pat-a-cake, baker's man. The making of chupatis also causes delay in starting. As to the honey, it is most plentiful and tastes like orange flowers, but really it is the date flower which imparts this flavor. It is much more glutinous than ours. It is packed for exportation and to bring as tribute in large round tin boxes, stopped up round the edges with mud. It is used in paying both taxes and tribute. We were quite worn out with this day. The sultan received a present next morning of silk for a robe, a turban, some handkerchiefs, two watches, some knives, scissors, needle cases, and other things. But he afterwards sent Saleh to say he did not like his present at all and wanted dollars. He got ten rupees and was satisfied. We again visited him with our servants and soldiers and were given tea while we talked over the future, and all seemed fair. Later the sultan came to visit us and talk about the escort. He said we must take five soldiers, bargained for their wages, food, and bakshish, and obtain the money. My husband inquired about some ruins near Meshed, three hours by camel from Hagarain, and said that if the sultan would arrange that we should dig safely, he could have forty dollars, and he settled to go with my husband next day to see the place. Accordingly, next day the sultan came with eight soldiers, singing and dancing all the way, and some men of the Nehed tribe as Siata as we were then in their land. The sultan showed us two letters, in which it was said that we were to have been attacked between Sif and Qaidun, and we remembered having seen a man on a camel, apparently watching for us. But instead of coming forward, he galloped away, and thus it appears we got past the place from which they meant to set upon us, before the attacking party could arrive. During the days we were at Hagarain, several weddings were celebrated. To form a suitable place for conviviality, they cover over a yard with mats, just as the Abyssinians do, and the women, to show their hilarity on the occasion, utter the same gurgling noises as the Abyssinian women do on a like occasion, and which in Abyssinia is called lulta. From our roof we watched the bridegroom's nocturnal procession to his bride's house, accompanied by his friends bearing torches, and singing and speechifying to their heart's content. On our return from the ruins near Meshhed, Taysir, our soldier, came to us and was very indignant about the price the sultan charged for his soldiers. He was given ten rupees to attach himself to us, as an earnest of the good bakshish he would get at the coast, as he said all the other soldiers would go back from Shibam, and really in that case I think he would have been glad of our escort. Then Saleh, who had one hundred rupees a month and ate with everyone, came to demand half a rupee a day for food. This was granted, as we thought it could come off his bakshish, and he soon appeared to make the same request for Mahmoud, the naturalist. Matthaios was furious, as Mahmoud ate partly with him, and no one was angrier with him than Saleh. It was settled that we should give him tea, bread, and four annas, and they all went off bawling. Afterwards we heard Saleh had said, Mr. Bent is giving so much money to the Sultan. Why should we not have some? We really thought at first that we should be able to encamp at Meshhed and dig, for there was a Sayyid who had been in Hyderabad and was very civil to us. But this happiness only lasted one hour. The Sultan said it would really not be safe unless we lived in Hagarain. So we had to give it up, 
as it was an impossibility to dig in the heat of the day, with six hours' journey to fatigue us. Besides, we must have paid many soldiers, and we were told no one would dig for us. So much was said about the dangers of the onward road that Saleh was sent with the letters for Shibam and Shahr, and told to hold them tight, and say that if we could not deliver these in person, we should return to the Wali of Aden, and say that the Sultan of Hagarain would not let us go on. This frightened him, so he made a very dear bargain for fifteen camels, and we were to leave next day. We were glad enough to depart from Hagarain which is so picturesque that it really might be an old, medieval, fortified town on the Rhine, built entirely of mud and with no water in its river. All the houses are enormously high, and they have a kitchen and oven on each floor. The bricks of which they are built are about one foot square and with straw in them. They have shooting holes from every room and machicolations over the outer doors and along the battlements. And what makes the houses seem to contain even more stories than they do is that each floor has two ranges of windows, one on the ground so that you can only see out if you sit on the floor, and another too high to see out of at all. Below every lower window projects a long wooden spout. The narrow lanes are mere drains, and the whole place a hotbed of disease. The people looked very unhealthy. When cholera comes they die like flies. As a wind-up to this, last evening, Mahmoud came into our room and soon began to say his prayers. We could not make out why, but it turned out he had no light in his room. Altogether, we had not a reposeful time in Hagarain. We were told early next day that fourteen men of the Nahad tribe had come as our siyara. Though we had been told two would be sufficient, so we had to agree to take four. Then we were asked to pay those who had come unbidden. The Sultan came himself about it, and his children came to beg for Anna's. At last the Sultan, who had often said he felt as if he were our brother, obtained twelve rupees, which he asked for to pay his expenses for the kids and honey, and said my horse had eaten the worth of twice as much money as he had asked before. When we finally got off we found the old rascal had only sent half the Nahidi, and had only sent two soldiers, and so had really made forty dollars out of us over that one item. The Nahid men had ten dollars each. They are not under the Sultan of Makella, but independent. The Nahid tribe occupy about ten miles of the valley through which we passed, and the toll money we paid to this tribe for the privilege of passing by was the most exorbitant demanded from us on our journey. When once you have paid the toll money, Siyad, and have with you the escort, Siyada, of the tribe in whose territory you are, you are practically safe wherever you may travel in Arabia. But this did not prevent us from being grossly insulted as we passed by certain Nehed villages. Qaidun, where dwells the very holy man so celebrated all the country round for his miracles and good works, is the chief center of this tribe. We had purposely avoided passing too near this town, and afterwards learnt that it was owing to the influence of this very holy Sayyid that our reception was so bad amongst the Nahad tribe. All about Hagarain are many traces of the olden days when the frankincense trade flourished, and when the town of Doan, which name is still retained in the Wedi Doan, was a great emporium for this trade. Acres and acres of ruins, dating from the centuries immediately before our era, lie stretched along the valley here, just showing their heads above the weight of superincumbent sand, which has invaded and overwhelmed the past glories of this district. The ruins of certain lofty square buildings stand upon hillocks at isolated intervals. From these we got several inscriptions, which prove that they were the high platforms alluded to on so many hemuritic inscribed stones as raised in honor of their dead. As for the town around them, it has been entirely engulfed in sand. The then dry bed of a torrent runs through the center, and from this fact we can ascertain, from the walls of sand on either side of the stream, that the town itself has been buried some thirty feet or forty feet by this sand. It is now called Raidun. The ground lies strewn with fragments of hemuritic inscriptions, potteries, and other indications of a rich harvest for the excavator. 
but the hostility of the Nehed tribe prevented us from paying these runes more than a cursory visit. And even to secure this, we had to pay the sheikh of the place nineteen dollars, and his greeting was ominous as he angrily muttered, Salam to all who believe Mohammed is the true prophet. We were warned that our eyes should never be let to see Meshhed again. We might camp before we got there or after, as we wished. So were led by a roundabout way to Adib, and saw no more of the leprous Sayyid who told such wondrous tales about the English king who once lived in Hagarain, and how the English, Turks, and Arabs were all descended from King Sam. Also he told the Adite fable of how the giants and rich men tried to make a paradise of their own, the beautiful garden of Edom, and defied God, and so destruction came upon the tribe of Ayad, the remnant of whom survive at Aden on Jebel Shimsan, in the form of monkeys. This is the Mohammedan legend of the end of the Sabean Empire. We were much amused with what Imam Sharif said to this Sayyid. Imam Sharif is himself a Sayyid or Sharif, a descendant of Muhammad, his family having come from Medina, so he was always much respected. He said to him, You think these English are very bad people, but the Quran says that all people are like their rulers. Now we have no spots or diseases on our bodies, but are all clean and sound, which shows plainly that our ruler and the rest of us must be the same. Now you, my brother, must be under the displeasure of God, for I see that you are covered with leprosy. This was not a kind or civil speech, I fear, but not a ruder one than those addressed to us. This leprosy shows itself by an appearance as if patches of white skin were neatly set into the dark skin. At Adib they would not allow us to dip our vessels in their well, nor take our repast under the shadow of their mosque. Even the women of this village ventured to insult us, peeping into our tent at night, and tumbling over the jugs in a manner most aggravating to the weary occupants. The soldiers had abandoned us and gone to sleep in the village. A dreary waste of sand led past Keren to Badura. I arrived first with Imam Sharif, a servant and a soldier. We dismounted as there was some surveying to be done. The people were quite friendly, we thought, though they crowded round me shouting to see the woman. I went to some women grouped at a little distance, and we had no trouble as long as we were there. We had left before the camels came, and heard that the rest of the party had been very badly received. Stones were thrown, and shouts raised of, Pigs! Infidels! Dogs! Come down from your camels, and we will cut your throats! We attributed this to Salah Hassan, for he made enemies for us wherever we went. At this village they were busy making indigo dye in large jars like those of the forty thieves. We were soon out of the Nahed country. Our troubles on the score of rudeness were happily terminated at Haura, where a huge castle belonging to the al family dominates a humble village surrounded by palm groves. Without photographs to bear out my statement, I should hardly dare to describe the magnificence of these castles in the Hadramaut. That at Haura is seven stories high, and covers fully an acre of ground beneath the beetling cliff, with battlements, towers, and machicolations bearing a striking likeness to Holyrood. But Holyrood is built of stone, and Haura, save for the first story, is built of sun-dried bricks. And if Haura stood where Holyrood does, or in a rainy climate, it would long ago have crumbled away. Haura is supposed to be the site of an ancient Hemuritic town. We were told that the Sultan of Hagarain is not entirely under Makalla, but that he of Haura is. The castle of the sultan is nice and clean inside, and it was pleasant. After some very reviving cups of coffee and ginger, and some very public conversation, to find our canvas homes all erected on a hard field. A pleasant change from our late dusty places. Mahmoud obtained a fox, which was his first mammal, saving a bushy-tailed rat. We were sent a lamb and a box of honey, and soon after the governor arrived to request a present. He asked thirty rupees, but got twenty, and the new soldiers in place of the Nahadi men were to have five rupees on arrival at Qutun. We were now nearing the palace of Sultan Salah bin Muhammad al-Qaiti of Shibam, the most powerful monarch in the Hadramaut. 
who has spent twelve years of his life in India, and whose reception of us was going to be magnificent, our escort told us. As we were leaving Haura, just standing about waiting to mount, I felt something hard in one finger of my glove which I was putting on. I thought it was a dry leaf, and hooked it down with my nail and shook it into my hand. Imagine my terror on lifting my glove at seeing a scorpion wriggling there. I dropped it quickly, shouting for Mahmoud in the collecting bottle, and then caught it in a handkerchief. This was the way that Boothia Binti introduced himself to the scientific world, for he was of a new species. It turned out that the oldest soldier was father to the Sultan of Haura. He went no farther with us. The next day, three miles after leaving Haura, we quitted the Wedi Qasr, and at last, at the village of al Aimani, entered the main valley of the Hadramaut. It is here very broad, being at least eight miles from cliff to cliff, and receives collateral valleys from all sides, forming, as it were, a great basin. Hitherto our way had been generally northward, from Makella to Tohum, northeast and then northwest. Now we turned westward down the great valley, though still with a slight northward tendency. We passed Ranima, Ajlania on a rock to the right, and Hanan and the Wedi Menwe behind it on our left. Wellstead, in his list of the Hadramaut towns, mentions Hanan as Ainen, and as a very ancient town on the hill near which are inscriptions and rude sculptures. For seven hours we travelled along the valley, which from its width was like a plain till we were within a mile of the castle of El Qutan, where the Sultan of Shibam resides. Thus far all was desert and sand, but suddenly the valley narrows, and a long vista of cultivation was spread before us. Here miles of the valley are covered with palm groves, bright green patches of lucerne, called kedlib, almost dazzling to look upon after the arid waste, and numerous other kinds of grain are raised by irrigation, for the Hadramaut has beneath its expanse of sand a river running the waters of which are obtained by digging deep wells. Skin buckets are let down by ropes and drawn up by cattle by means of a steep slope, and then the water is distributed for cultivation through narrow channels. It is at best a fierce struggle with nature to produce these crops, for the rainfall can never be depended upon. We had intended to push on to al Qutun, but Sultan Salah sent a messenger to beg us not to arrive till the following morning, that his preparations to receive us might be suitable to our dignity, as the first English travellers to visit his domains. So we encamped just on the edge of the cultivation, about a mile off at Ferhud, where under the shade of palm trees there is a beautiful well of brackish water, with four oxen, two at each side to draw up the water. Outside the cultivation, in its arid waste of sand, the Hadramaut produces but little, now and again we came across groups of the camel-thorn, tall trees somewhat resembling the holm oak. It is in Arabic a most complicated tree. Its fruit, like a small crab apple, is called bidom, very refreshing and making an excellent preserve. Its leaves, which they powder and use as soap, are called rasal, meaning washing, whereas the tree itself is called ailb, and is dearly loved by the camels who stretch their long necks to feed off its branches. We wondered what kind of reception we should have, for people's ideas on this point vary greatly. In order not to offend the Sultan's prejudices too much, we determined to dissemble, and I decided not to wear my little camera, and Imam Sharif packed the plane table out of sight. We settled that he should have the medicine chest in his charge and be the doctor of the party, and addressed him as Hakim. Even Saleh feared so much what the future might hold in store that he removed his drawers and shoes, and advised Imam Sharif to do the same, as Muhammad had never worn such things. Imam Sharif refused to take these precautions, saying that if Muhammad had been born in Kashmir, he would have assuredly worn both drawers and shoes. Imam Sharif wore a Norfolk jacket and knickerbockers, and a turban when on the march, but in camp he wore Indian clothes. However, we were soon visited by the Sultan's two wazirs on spirited Arab steeds, magnificent individuals with plaited turbans, long lances, and many gold mohurs fixed on their dagger handles, all of which argued well for our reception on the morrow by the Sultan of Shibam. 
We were a good deal stared at, but not disagreeably, for all the soldiers were on their best behavior, and Hyla and Seif we had to be tied up, airless in our tents, as if we left them open a minute when the crowd, tired of seeing nothing, had dispersed, and one person saw an opening, the whole multitude surged round again, pressing in, shouting and smelling so bad that we regretted our folly and having tried to get a little light and air. We saw, among others, a boy who had a wound in his arm, and therefore had his nostrils plugged up. Bad smells are said not to be so injurious as good ones. Some women came and asked to see me, so I took my chair and sat surrounded by them. They begged to see my hands, so I took off my gloves and let them lift my hands about, from one sticky hand to another. They looked wonderingly at them and said meskeen so often and so pityingly that I am sure they thought I had leprosy all over. Then they wished to see my head, and having taken off my hat, my hair had to be taken down. They examined my shoes, turned up my gaiters, stuck their fingers down my collar, and wished to undress me. So I rose and said very civilly, Peace to you, O women, I am going to sleep now, and retired. Arab girls, before they enter the harem and take the veil, are a curious sight to behold. Their bodies and faces are dyed a bright yellow with turmeric. On this ground they paint black lines with antimony over their eyes. The fashionable color for the nose is red. Green spots adorn the cheek. And the general aspect is grotesque beyond description. We stayed in bed really late next morning till the sun rose, and then prepared ourselves to be fetched. The two young wazirs, Salim bin Ali and Salim bin Abdullah, cousins, came again at seven-thirty with two extra horses, which were ridden by my husband and Saleh, as Imam Sharif stuck to the donkey which we named Mahsud, happy. End of chapter 9「with its windows painted red, the color being made from red sandstone, and its balustrades decorated with the inevitable chevron pattern. The castle of al Qutun rears its battlemented towers above the neighboring brown houses and expanse of palm groves. Behind it rise the steep red rocks of the encircling mountains, the whole forming a scene of oriental beauty difficult to describe in words. This lovely building, shining in the morning light against the dark, precipitous mountains, was pointed out to us as our future abode. My horse, Basha, seemed to have come to life again, and enjoyed galloping once more, for we had left the servants, camels, etc., to follow. As we approached, Fedejois announced our arrival, and at his gate stood Sultan Salah to greet us clad in a long robe of canary-colored silk, and with a white silk turban twisted around his swarthy brow. He was a large, stout man, negroid in type, for his mother was a slave, and as generous as he was large, to Arab and European alike. He looked about fifty-five or sixty, but said his age was forty-five or forty. At first, on being seated in his reception room, we were very cautious in speaking of our plans, as we were surrounded with all sorts and conditions of men. He placed at our disposal a room spread with Dagestan carpets and cushions, furnished with two tables and three chairs, and not a mouthful of our own food would he allow us to touch, a hospitality which had its drawbacks, for the Arab cuisine is not one suited to Western palates. We were very glad of this hospitality at first, as it would give Matthäus a holiday, which he could devote to the washing of clothes, water being so plentiful. I will describe one day's meals, which were invariably the same. At eight o'clock came several cups, all containing coffee and milk, honey, eggs, hard-boiled and peeled, 
and a large, thin, leathery kind of bread made plain with water, and another large, thin kind made with ghee, and like pastry. About 2.30 came two bowls like slop bowls, one containing bits of meat, vegetables, eggs, and spices and sauce, under about an inch of melted ghee, the other a kind of soup. They were both quite different, but at the same time very much alike, and the grease on the top kept them furiously hot. There were little pieces of boiled lamb and little pieces of roast lamb, tiny balls of roast meat and also of boiled, a mound of rice and a mound of dates and upon requesting some water we were given one large glassful. Identically, the same meal came at 9.30, an hour when the bona fide traveler pines to be in his bed. These things were laid on a very dirty, colored cotton cloth, but no plates or knives, etc., were provided. At several odd times through the day a slave walked in and filled several cups of tea, a few for each of us. The cups were never washed by him. After struggling for a few days, many of the party having had a recourse to the medicine chest, we were at length compelled humbly to crave his majesty to allow us to employ our own cook. This he graciously permitted, and during the three weeks we passed under his hospitable roof, our cook was daily supplied by the sultanas, most excellent housewives we thought them, with everything we needed. One of the most striking features of these Arabian palaces is the wood carving. The doors are exquisitely decorated with it, the supporting beams and the windows, which are adorned with fretwork instead of glass. The dwelling rooms are above, the ground floor being exclusively used for merchandise and as stables and cattle stalls, and the first floor for the domestic offices. The men's servants lie about in the passages. We lived on the second floor. The two next stories were occupied by the sultan and his family, and above was the terraced roof where the family sleep during the summer heat. Every guest room has its coffee corner, provided with a carved oven, where the grain is roasted and the water boiled. Around are hung old china dishes for spices, brass trays for the cups, and fans to keep off the flies. Also the carved censers, in which frankincense is burnt and handed round to the guests, each one of whom fumigates his garments with it before passing it on. It is also customary to fumigate with frankincense a tumbler before putting water into it, a process we did not altogether relish, as it imparts a sickly flavor to the fluid. We found the system of door fastening in vogue a great nuisance to us. The wooden locks were of the tumbler order. The keys were about ten inches long, and composed of a piece of curved wood. At one end were a number of pegs stuck in irregularly, to correspond with a number of the tumbling bolts which they were destined to raise. No key would go in without a tremendous lot of shaking and noisy rattling, and you always had to have your key with you, for if you did not lock your door on leaving your room, there was nothing to prevent its swinging open, and if you were inside, you must rise and unbolt it to admit each person, and to bolt it behind him for the same reason. We got very friendly with Sultan Salah during our long stay under his roof, and he would come and sit for hours together in our room and talk over his affairs. Little by little he was told of all our sufferings by the way, and he was very angry. We also consulted him as to our plans, and told him how badly Saleh was behaving. We used sometimes to think of dismissing Saleh, but thought him too dangerous to part with. It was better to keep him under supervision, and leave him as much in the dark as possible about our projects. The Sultan took special interest in our pursuits, conducting us in person to archaeological sites, in manifesting a laudable desire to have his photograph taken. He assisted both our botanist and naturalist in pursuing their investigations into the somewhat limited flora and fauna of his dominions, and was told by Imam Sharif that his work with the sextant was connected with keeping our watches to correct time. He would freely discourse, too, on his own domestic affairs, 
giving us anything but a pleasing picture of Arab harem life, which he described as a veritable hell. Whenever he saw me reading, working with my needle, or developing photographs, he would smile sadly and contrast my capabilities with those of his own wives, who, as he expressed it, are unable to do anything but painting themselves and quarreling. Poor Sultan Salah has had twelve wives in his day, and he assured us that their dissensions and backbitings had made him grow old before his time. His looking so old must be put down to the cares of polygamy. At al Qutun, the Sultan had at that time only two properly acknowledged wives, whom he wisely kept apart. His chief wife, or Sultana, was sister to the Sultan of Makalla, and the Sultan of Makalla is married to a daughter of Sultan Salah by another wife. In this way do Arabic relationships get hopelessly confused. The influence of the wife at al Qutun was considerable, and he was obviously in awe of her, so much so that when he wanted to visit his other wife he had to invent a story of pressing business at Shibam. Our wives, said he one day, are like servants, and try to get all they can out of us. They have no interest in their husband's property, as they know they may be sent away at any time. And in this remark he seems to have properly hit off the chief evil of polygamy. He also told us that, having got all they can from one husband, they go off to a man that is richer, though how they make these arrangements, if they stick to their veils, is a mystery to me. Then again, he would continually lament over the fanaticism and folly of his fellow countrymen, more especially the priestly element, who systematically oppose all his attempts at introducing improvements from civilized countries into the Hadramaut. The Sayyids and the Mullahs dislike him, the former, who trace their descent from the daughter of Muhammad, forming a sort of hierarchical nobility in this district and on several occasions he has been publicly cursed in the mosques as an unbeliever and friend of the infidel. But Sultan Salah has money which he made in India, and owns property in Bombay. Consequently, he has the most important weapon to wield that any one can have in a Semitic country. The Sultan told us a famous plan they have in this country for making a fortune. Two Hadrami set out for India together a father and son, or two brothers. They collect enough money before starting to buy a very fine suit of clothes each, and to start trade in a small way. They then increase the business by credit, and when they have got enough of other people's money into their hands, one departs with it to the inaccessible Hadramaut, while the other waits to hear of his safe arrival, and then he goes bankrupt and follows him. Sultan Salah had not a high opinion of his countrymen, and told us several other tales that did not redound to their credit. Before I went to India, I was a rascal, harami, like these men here, he constantly asseverated, and his love for things Indian and English is unbounded. If only the Indian government would send me a Mohammedan doctor here, I would pay his expenses and his influence, both political and social, would be most beneficial to this country. It is certainly a great thing for England to have so firm a friend in the center of the narrow, habitable districts between Aden and Muscat, which ought by rights to be ours. Not that it is a very profitable country to possess, but in the hands of another power it might unpleasantly affect our road to India, and in complying with this simple request of Sultan Salah, an easy way is open to us for extending our influence in that direction. Likewise, from a humane point of view, this suggestion of Sultan Salah is of great value, for the inhabitants of the Hadramaut are more hopelessly ignorant of things medical than some of the savage tribes of Africa. Certain quacks dwell in the towns, and profess to diagnose the ailments of a Bedou woman by smelling one of her hairs brought by her husband. For every pain, no matter where, they brand the patient with a red-hot iron, Kaya, to relieve a person who has eaten too much fat, they will light a fire round him to melt it. To heal a wound, they will plug up the nostrils of the sufferer, believing that certain scents are noxious to the sore, the pleasant scents being the most harmful. 
iron pounded up by a blacksmith is also a medicine. On an open sore they tie a sheet of iron, tin, or copper with four holes in the corners for strings. We heard of the curious case of a man who, for a wager, ate all the fat of a sheep that was killed at a pilgrimage. He lay down to sleep under a shady tree, and all the fat congealed in his inside. The doctor ordered him to drink hot tea, while fires were lit all around him, and thus he was cured and was living in Shibam when we were there. We had a crowd of patients to treat while stationed at al Qutun, and I have entered quantities of quaint experiences with these poor helpless invalids in my notebook. We had many an interesting stroll round the Sultan's gardens at al Qutun, and watched the cultivation of spices and vegetables for the royal table, or rather floor, the lucerne and clover for his cattle, the indigo and henna for dyeing purposes, and the various kinds of grain. But on the cultivation of the date palm, the most attention is lavished. It was just then the season at which the female spathe has to be fructified by the male pollen, and we were interested in watching a man going round with an apron full of male spathes. With these he climbed the stem of the female palm, and with a knife cut open the bark which encircles the female spathe, and as he shook the male pollen over it he chanted in a low voice, May God make you grow and be fruitful. No portion of the palm is wasted in the hadramaut. With the leaves they thatch huts and make fences. The date stones are ground into powder as food for cattle, and they eat the nutty part which grows at the bottom of the spades, in which they call kurzan. On a journey a man requires nothing but a skin of dates, which will last him for days. And, when we left, Sultan Salah gave us three goat skins filled with his best dates and large tins of delicious honey, for which the Hadramaut was celebrated as far back as Pliny's time. Beginning of footnote 11, Pliny 6, 28, section 161, Melis Quereque Proventu, end of footnote 11, which he sent on camels to the coast for us, as well as a large inscribed stone that I now have in my house. Innumerable wells are dotted over this cultivated area, the water from which is distributed over the fields before sunrise and after sunset. The delicious creaking noise made by heaving up the buckets greeted us every morning when we woke, delicious because it betokened plenty of water. And these early morning views were truly exquisite, a bright crimson tinge would gradually creep over the encircling mountains, making the parts in shade of a rich purple hue, against which the feathery palm trees and whitewashed castles stood out in strong contrast. All the animals belonging to the Sultan are stabled within the encircling wall and immediately beneath the palace windows. The horse's stable is in the open courtyard, where they are fed with rich lucerne and dates, when we should give corn. Here also reside the cows and bullocks, which are fed every evening by women, who tie together bunches of dried grass and make it appetizing by mixing therewith a few blades of fresh lucerne. The sheep and the goats are pinned on another side, while the cocks and hens live in and around the main drain. All is truly patriarchal in character. The Sultan only possesses four horses and one of these, a large white mare, strangely enough came from the Cape of Good Hope, via Durban and Bombay. The Sultan of Makalla had three. The Arab courser lives farther north. As for the soldiers, they sent, as if it were a matter of course, for some money to buy tobacco and were given two or three dollars each, and we gladly parted from them, friends. The Sultan of Makalla had paid them for a fortnight's food, and had written to Sultan Salah to pay what was owing. My groom was dismissed also without bakshish. He was only a rough fellow taken from the mud brick works at Makella, and my poor Basha would have fared ill if really dependent on Embarak for care. My entreaties alone saved him from being publicly bastinadoed, as the Sultan wished, when he heard of all his rudeness and disobedience. 
the sultan was most anxious to arrange for our onward journey and wrote seven letters to different sheikhs and sultans and sent them to us to read but we could not read them ourselves and would not let saleh so we were none the wiser the sultans of sewun and terim are brothers of the kateri tribe but have no real authority outside their towns we were anxious to proceed along the hadramaut valley and to reach the tomb of the prophet hud the sultan also went to shibam to meet some of the arbiters of our fate and the sultan of sewun agreed to let us pass but others said we had five hundred camels loaded with arms and all sorts of other fables and they all quarrelled dreadfully about us so the sultan returned to al qutun to await replies to his letters the day the sultan was absent the women were determined to have a little enjoyment from our presence themselves so a great many servants came bringing the sultan's ten-year-old daughter sheikha a rather pretty little girl with long earrings all round her ears which like all the other women's hang forward like fringed bells an uneven number is always worn and a good set consists of twenty-three they are rings about two inches in diameter with long drops attached her face was painted with large dots stripes and patterns of various colors and she had thick antimony round the eyes. Her neck, arms, and shoulders were yellow, and her hands painted plain black inside and in a pattern like a lace mitten on the back, the nails being red with henna. I was also asked to pay a visit to the ladies. I went upstairs. Every floor is like a flat, with its bathroom containing a huge vase called kezba, and the bath is taken by pouring over the person from a smaller utensil water which runs away down drain holes to the wooden spouts. I found myself in some very narrow passages, among a quantity of not over-clean women, who all seized me by the shoulders, passing me on from one to the other till I reached a very large carpeted room, with pillows round it, some very large looking-glasses, and a chandelier. I advanced across the room amid loud exclamations from the seated ladies, and was pointed out a position in front of the two principal ones, who were seated against the wall. One was the chief wife of the sultan, and the other a daughter married to a seyyid, whose hand his father-in-law must always kiss. He is a very disagreeable-looking man, who was much offended because Imam Sharif would neither kiss his hand, being a seyyid himself, nor let his own be kissed. I squatted down, and round me soon squatted many more ladies. They were certainly not beautiful, but one, who was nearest to me and seemed to be my guardian or showman, had a very nice, kind, clever face. Her lips were not so large as most. We seemed all to be presided over, as we literally were, by a kind of confidential maid, who sat on the little raised hearth in the corner amongst all the implements for the making of coffee and burning of incense, chanting constantly, Salak Allah Muhammad, and something more, of which I can only remember that it was about the faith. Sometimes she was quiet a little, and then, above all the den, she raised her shout, accompanying it with an occasional single loud blow with a stone pestle and mortar. There was no difficulty about seeing the gold anklets the ladies wore, for their clothes, as they sat, were well above their knees. Their feet were painted like fanciful black slippers with lace edges. Their examination of me was very searching, even reaching smelling point, and I feel sure I was being exorcised, for so much was being said about Muhammad. At last an old lady said to me, There is no God but God, with which I agreed, and murmurs of satisfaction went round while she nodded her head triumphantly. Later on she pointed to the ceiling and asked if I considered this was the direction in which Allah dwells, and seemed glad when I agreed. Of course no infidel would, she thought. Presently the woman who had prepared the frankincense brought it down in a small chafing dish, continuing the same chant and handing it round. I wondered if I should be left out, or left till the last, but neither happened and when my turn came, like the rest, I held my head and hands over the fumes, 
and we were all fumigated inside our garments. I may have been partaking in some unholy rite, but my ignorance will be my excuse, I hope. I was then told I might go, which I was glad of, as I had been afraid to offend them by going too soon. I was asked, as I left, if I should like to see their jewelry. Of course I said yes, and had hardly got home and recovered from the deafening row when I was fetched again. There were crowds more women of all classes, clean and dirty, and as they came trooping in to see me, the room seemed to resound with the twittering sound of their kisses, for the incoming visitor kissed the sitter's hand, while the sitter kissed her own, and there was kissing of foreheads besides. Numerous little baskets were brought in with immense quantities of gold ornaments, some very heavy, but with few gems in them, absolutely none of value. They consisted of coral, onyx, a few bad turquoises, crooked pearls, and many false stones. Everything was of Indian work. Sheikha came in in a silk dress with a tremendous, much alloyed silver girdle, and loaded with chains and bracelets of all sorts, clanking and clashing as she came. We had very good coffee with ginger and cloves in it, and at this time, there was a very great deal of religious conversation and argument, and as they were exciting themselves, I thought I would go, for I did not feel very comfortable. But the chief lady said to me, in a very threatening and dictatorial voice, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasul Allah. I looked as much like an idiot as I could, and pretended neither to notice nor understand but I was patted and shaken up by all that were near enough neighbors to do so, and desired to look at that lady. Again she said, La ilaha illallah, in the same tone, and I was told I must repeat it. So she said the first part again in a firm tone, and I cheerfully repeated after her, There is no God but God. Then she continued, Muhammad is his prophet. I remained dumb. Then the name of Isa, Jesus, went round, and I bowed my head. The coffee woman then called out, Isa was a prophet before Mohammed. They then asked me if Isa was my prophet. I could only say that he is, for my Arabic would not allow of a further profession of my faith. I gladly departed, and gave Sheikha afterwards two sovereigns for her necklace. They said they would show me their clothes, but they never did. I have described the shape of these dresses, but I omitted to say that they are gaily trimmed with a kind of ribbon about two inches wide, made of little square bits of colored silks and cottons sewn together. This is put round the armholes, over the shoulder, and down to the hem of the garment over the seam, where a curious gusset or gore runs from the front part to the corner of the train. The dress is trimmed round the neck, which is cut square and rather low, and generally hangs off one shoulder, and, across the breast, it is much embroidered, beads and spangles being sometimes introduced. These women seem to live in a perpetual noise. They gurgled loudly when we arrived, and we could always hear them playing the tambourine. Tiny girls wear, as their only garment, a fringe of plates, as in Nubia, and their heads are shaven in grotesque patterns, or their hair done in small plaits. Boys have their heads shaven also, all except locks of long hair dotted about in odd places. I never saw such dreadful objects as the women make of themselves by painting their faces. When they lift their veils, one would hardly think them human. I saw eyes painted to resemble blue and red fish, with their heads pointing to the girl's nose. The upper part of the face was yellow, the lower green with small black spots, a green stripe down the nose, the nostrils like two red cherries, the paint being shiny. Three red stripes were on the forehead, and there was a red mustache, there being also green stripes on the yellow cheeks. There was a delightful, tiny room on the roof, just a little place to take and make coffee in, and we were allowed to clamber up to this, but not without calling a slave and assuring ourselves that there was no danger of my husband meeting any of the ladies, for it commanded the roof, 
to which we had not access. We liked going up there very much, for the views were splendid, and we could see down into the mosque, which is built like cloisters, open in the middle. I took some photographs from there, and also, with the greatest difficulty, managed to get one of the room itself by tying my camera, without its legs of course, with a rope to the outside of the fretwork frame of the little window, which was on a level with the floor. It was hard work not to be in the way myself, as I had to put both arms out of the next window to take out the slides and to guess at the focus. The Sultan, though his Hindustani was getting a trifle rusty, said he greatly liked the company of Imam Sharif, whose uncle had in some way befriended him in India. Intelligent conversation he had not enjoyed for a long time. He was certainly a little scandalized at Imam Sharif's lax ways in religion, for he was one day sitting without his turban when some coffee was brought. The Sultan put his hands up to cover Imam Sharif's head, saying, My brother, you are drinking with a bare head, and this is contrary to the Quran. The same remark was often made in camp by people who looked into his tent. They said, Look! He is a Christian, his head is bare. At the same time, no one thought anything of the Bedouins' bare heads. During this period of uncertainty we made several little explorations of the surrounding valleys. One day we started out with the Sultan, who had on his long coat, which made him look like a huge sulfur-colored canary. It was lined with light blue. He, my husband, Saleh, and a groom rode the four horses. Imam Sharif and I had our Basha and Mahsud, and a camel most smartly decorated carried the Wazir Salim bin Abdullah and a soldier. Other soldiers followed on foot. We went about five miles to Al Agran to see some ruins perched on a rock beneath the high wall of the plateau, prettily situated with palms, gardens, and wells. The ruins which are those of a well-built fortress, consist of little more than the foundation, but all embedded in modern houses, so that excavations would be impossible. It must once have been a place of considerable importance. There was a scrap of very well-cut ornament, which looked as if it might have belonged to a temple. It was from al Agran or Algran, that we obtained a stone with a spout to it, with rather a long Sabean inscription on it, a dedication to the god Sayyan, known to have been worshipped in the Hadramaut. We were given coffee in a very dirty room, which we were all the time longing to tear down, that we might dig under it. End of chapter 10《Chapter 11 of Southern Arabia》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Southern Arabia》by James and Mabel Bent Chapter 11 The Wadi Ser and the Sabra Salah On January 17, we started from al Khatun with only seven of our camels and two of the sultans packed with forage to be away several days the sultan wished to lend his horses but my husband refused however he had to ride one a gray for fear of giving offence and this was given to him as a present afterwards and he rode it whenever the rocks allowed till we reached the coast we eventually sent this horse zubda butter and my basha back to their respective donors though they really expected us to take them to aden we had two men of the nahad tribe as our esiera our start took a very long time for the sultan attended by many people came a mile on foot we travelled four hours and a half partly through land that would have been cultivated had there been rain and partly through salt desert till we turned north-west into the wadi ser where there is a sandy desert from the entrance to wadi ser we could see shabam in the distance an unpromising looking spot among sand hills we were able to find shelter at hanya 
under an enormous thorny badam tree covered with fruit and we felt like birds out of a cage for we never could walk out at al Katoon without a crowd and the greasiness and spiciness of the food was beginning to pall we had a delightful camp but had to be very careful not to drop things in the sand as they so quickly disappeared we had a new man called isalem who had to take care of the horses pluck chickens and help in pitching the camp his wonder at the unfolding and setting up of the beds chairs etc was great there was also an old man called hadar abul he and one of the soldiers could talk hindustani so with imam sharif's help we were somewhat independent of salah though we had thought it necessary to bring him to keep him from working us harm we continued our way up the wadi Ser for about five hours and camped at al had in a field near a house close to some high banks which radiated intense heat and suffered the more that we had to wait a long time for the tea that we always had with our luncheon as our water had been stolen in the night we always tried to save some to carry on and start with next day fearing we might fare worse in the next place we came to the well at this spot is the last water in this direction for we were reaching the confines of the great central desert wadi ser being such a waste of sand is very sparsely populated the bedouin here like the turkomans live in scattered abodes little groups of two or three houses dotted about and solitary homesteads it belongs to the kattiri tribe who are at war with the yafai they once owned shahar and makala and took al Khatoum, but in a war in eighteen seventy four the yafai were supported by the english hence their friendship for england the animosity still continues and there is little intercourse between shiwan and shibam though only twelve miles apart the kattiri have more of the bedou about them and the yafai have more of the arab our esiar was twenty-five dollars the people were preparing for rain which may never come they had had none for two years but if they get it every three years they are satisfied as they get a sufficient crop as it comes in torrents and with a rush each field is provided with a dike and a dam which they cut to let the water off this dike is made by a big scraper like a dustpan called miss hop harnessed by chains to a camel or bullocks the camel goes over the existing bank and when the dustpan reaches the summit the men in attendance upset the surface sand or soil that has been scraped off and carry the scraper down when this is done the field is lightly ploughed there is nothing more to do except to sit and wait for rain we saw signs of great floods in some parts whenever we found ruins still visible in or near the hatrimat we found them on elevated spots above the sand level from which we might argue that all centres of civilization in the middle of the valleys lie deeply buried in sand which has come down in devastating masses from the highland and the central desert the nature of the sand in this district is twofold firstly we have the less or firm sand which can be cultivated and secondly the disintegrated desert sand which form itself into heaps and causes sandstorms when the wind is high the mountains diminish in height the farther north one goes the character of the valleys is pretty much the same as that of those to the south of the main valley only they are narrower and much lower and thus the deep indenture of the valley system of the hatramount gradually fades away into the vast expanse of the central desert the wazir had been given a bag of money to buy fowls and lambs for us but salah came and said the wazir wants some money for a lamb so it was sent and returned it had not been asked for and caused some offence but that odious little wretch only wished to make mischief the bedouin are rather clever at impromptu verses and when we were in wadi ser they made night hideous by dancing in our camp the performers ranged themselves in two rows as in sir roger de coverley time is kept by a drum and by perpetual hand clapping and stamping of the feet whilst two men execute elaborate capers in the centre singing as they do so such words as these the ship has come from europe with merchandise they shot at the minaret with a thousand cannon bedouin women also take part in these dances and the arabs think the dances very impious it was very weird by the light of the moon in the campfire, but wearisome when we wanted to sleep particularly as they kept it up until after we were all astir in the morning yelling bawling singing and screeching 
Isilum being the ringleader. The ground was shaken as if horses were galloping about. A bedow was playing a flute made of two leg bones of a crane bound together with iron. At a distance of half an hour from our camp, there is a stone with an inscription. This was visited on the day of our arrival, but we went again next day that I might photograph it, very difficult in the position in which it is. It is a great rough boulder about ten feet high that has slipped down from the mountain with large rough sabean letters just punched on the surface of no depth but having a whitish appearance the letters run in every direction sometimes side by side sometimes in columns the central and most important word which my husband was able to make out with the help of professor hamel's admirable dictionary of hitherto ascertained hemoretic words is massabom or caravan road the stone seemed to be a kind of signpost for as the old bedow sheikh who was with us said there was in olden days about five hundred years ago a caravan road this way to mecca before the bahra safi made it impassable the bara safi is a quicksand north of shabwa but none of those present had been there and they all laughed at von reed's story of king safi and his army being engulfed in it the Badaw sheikh with his retinue came to see that we took no treasure out of the stone there are a good many old stones built into the side of the stream bed having taken a copy and a photograph which my husband sent later to dr d h muller in vienna to decipher we departed we were told that the wadi Ser goes four hours from that stone to the great desert we then turned back and followed our kafila to alagam at the junction of Wadi Ser and Wadi Latat, about two hours' journey. Alagam is a large cluster of high houses surrounded by stables and houses excavated in the sand hills, where the inhabitants and their cattle live in hot weather. This is quite an idea suited to the Bedouin who live in caves when they can find them. The Bedouin in southern Arabia never have tents we found that salah had joined the camel men in resisting our own people who wanted to camp under trees they had unloaded in the open and salah and Islam had then retired into the village till the tents were pitched so as we were to remain in this place two days we had them moved we had by this time some of the kateri tribe with us as a sierra at al garin the wadi ser is entered by a short collateral valley called the wadi konab in which valley is the tomb of the prophet salah one of the principal sacred places of the district kabra salah is equally venerated with the kabra haud also called the tomb of the prophet Abair for from what we could gather from the statements of intelligent natives Abair and haud are synonymous terms which is to be found in the tahmimi country further up the main valley the prophet haud was sent to reclaim the tribe of ad the mahra tribe are descended from a remnant of the adites as also are the hadrami according to the legends once a man named kolab when seeking for camels came upon a beautiful garden of aram de tala ahmad which is supposed to have been in the desert near aden he found and brought away a priceless jewel which came into possession of the first amniad khalifa narajedit those who embraced islamism on the preaching of the prophet haud were spared but the rest either were suffocated by a stifling wind or survived in the form of apes whose descendants still inhabit jabel shamshan at aden a remnant are also said to have fled to the korea maria islands we again met with considerable opposition from the bedouin and our escort when we proposed a visit to kabra salah next day however this was overcome by threats of reporting the opposition to sultan salah on our return to al Kutun. so next morning we started the sultan of shibam's people were just as anxious to go as we were for they were delighted to get the chance of making a pilgrimage to so holy a place which being in an enemy's country they would not have done but for our escort a short ride of two hours brought us nearly to the head of wadi Konab and there situated just under the cliff in an open wilderness is the celebrated tomb it consists simply of a long uncovered pile of stones somewhat resembling a potato pie with a headstone at either end and a collection of fossils from the neighbouring mountains arranged along the top 
hard by is a small house where the pilgrims take their coffee and the house of the bedou mullah who looks after the tomb is about a quarter of a mile off beyond this there is no habitation in sight a more desolate spot could hardly be found the tomb is from thirty to forty feet in length and one of the legends concerning it is that it never is the same length sometimes being a few feet shorter sometimes a few feet longer the bedouin have endless legends concerning this prophet he was a huge giant they said the father of the prophet Houd, or a bear he created camels out of rock and hence is especially dear to the wandering bedow and he still works miracles for if even unwittingly any one removes a stone from this grave it exhibits symptoms of life and gives the possessor much discomfort until it is returned once a dome building was erected over the tomb but the prophet manifested his dislike of being thus enclosed and it was removed men are said to go blind if they steal anything connected with the tomb once a man took a cup from the coffee-house unaware of the danger he incurred tied it to his girdle and carried it off it stuck to him till he restored it another man took a stone away and gave it to his children to play with but it hopped about till taken back again at the time of the sierra or pilgrimage which takes place in november crowds of bedouin we are told come from all over the valleys and hills around to worship all our men treated the grave with the greatest respect and said their prayers around it barefoot i do not know what they would have done to imam sharif if he had not comported himself as the others did so that wretched man had to walk barefoot all round on the sharp stones and thus we obtained the measurements he got dreadfully prickled by thorns and coveted the fossils very much the stones of which the tomb is composed are about the size of cannon-balls and look just as if newly put together and quite weedless people stroke the upright stone at the head and then rub their hands on their breast and kiss them and do the same at the foot the wazir would have led us up close to it but the bedouin hated our being there at all and would by no means let us sleep there as we wished to do we overheard our horrid little salah hassan telling the bystanders that we live on pork when we first got there we were permitted to approach within a few yards of the tomb so that we saw it very distinctly but when after eating our luncheon and taking a siesta under a tree we again advanced to inspect it the bedau mullah attacked us with fierce and opprobrious language and fearing further to arouse the fanaticism of these wild people we speedily mounted our horses and rode away we hoped to be able to visit Kabra Houd, the tomb of Nebi Salah's son, in the main valley, but as it will appear, we were to be disappointed. I am told on reliable Arab authority that it is similar in every way to the Kabra Salah, just a long pile of stones, about forty feet in length, uncovered and with its adjacent mosque. These two primitive tombs of their legendary prophets, zealously guarded and venerated by the Bedouin, are a peculiar and interesting feature of the Hadramaut. It is a curious fact that when one turns to the tenth chapter of Genesis, the best record we have of the earliest populations of our globe, we find the patriarchal names Salah, Eber, and Hazamavith, which last, as I previously stated, corresponds to Hadramaut, following one another in their order though not an immediate sequence i am at a loss to account for these names still being venerated by the bedouin unless one admits a continuity of legendary history almost too wonderful to contemplate or else one must consider they were heathen sites of veneration which have under moslem influence been endowed with orthodox names certain it is that these tombs in the midst of the wilderness are peculiarly the property of the bedouin and though visited and to a certain extent venerated by the arabs the latter do not attach so much importance to them as they do to the tombs of their own walis or saints which are always covered tombs near or in the centre of the towns another curious point i may mention in connection with these tombs is that the arab historian Hyakwit, in his mugam tells us of a god in the hatrimaut called al ghalsad who was a gigantic man perhaps this god may have some connection with the giant tombs of salah and eber also mikrisi who wrote in the tenth century a d speaks of a giant's grave he saw near shabwa near al agam we saw a quantity of very ancient stone monuments situated on slightly elevated ground above the sand 
at first we imagined them to be tombs but on closer inspection we discovered that the erections which are large unhewn ones of the cromlech type are decorated inside with geometric patterns somewhat similar to those we found in the mashonaland ruins and therefore my husband was more inclined to believe they were originally used for religious purposes there are traces of letters above the pattern the buildings are about twenty feet square and several are surrounded by circular walls they are apparently of extreme antiquity and doubtless far anterior in date to any other hemorrhitic remains that we saw in the hadramaut the wazir joined us as usual on our return from the kabr salah as we sat outside our tent in the moonlight with imam sharif and the indian interpreters and we had a pleasant evening we were perfectly charmed to see great preparations for sleep going on among the bedouin we thought they really must be tired after dancing the whole night and walking the whole day they were busy putting themselves to bed in graves dug in the loose dust not sand turbans girdles and so forth being turned into bedclothes just as they were still Isalam began capering about and they all got up shouting and screaming but the wazir seeing my distress with the greatest difficulty quieted them as he did when they broke out again at three o'clock in the morning it took us six hours the following day to ride back to al Katun, where not being expected we could not get a meal of even bread honey and dates for about an hour and a half and then had to wait till we were very sleepy indeed for supper we endured great hunger that day Salem ben ali the other wazir had not come with us because he was not well the day of our reception in curvetting about he fell from his horse and had suffered various pains ever since the sultan had had another stone brought for us from al grand we did not care to take this away as it had very little writing on it only al amin to the protection it is circular one foot four and a half inches in diameter two and a half inches high made of coarse marble we saw a similar circular stone at rye down the wildest reports were going about as to the water stone we already had it was almost the cause of an insurrection against the sultan of shabam they said it is very wrong to give that stone to a gabir as they call us for all the k's are pronounced g only think of our carelessly letting him have it the englishman has taken fifteen jewels of gold and gems out of it and named a high value you are sure of this said the sultan to the ringleader oh yes quite certain he said so the sultan led him to our room where the stone was and said do you know the stone again look closely at it has anything happened to it but a washing the man looked extremely small they said my husband's only business was to extract gold from stones it is extraordinary how widespread this belief is it is firmly rooted in greece many a statue and inscription have been shivered to atoms because of it and our interest in inscriptions was constantly attributed to a wish to find out treasure we once saw two men in asia minor industriously boring away into a column to find gold they told us they already had made a hole about eight inches deep and four or five inches wide they think that the ancients had a way of softening marble with acid we had again at this time a great many patients for as we really had effected some cures the first time we were at al Katun, our fame had spread we always had matthias and imam sharif to help us to elicit the symptoms and also to consult with us as to the cures because some remedies which suit europeans were by no means suited to the circumstances of our patients for instance the worst coughs i have ever heard were very prevalent but it would be useless to ask the sick to take a hot foot bath and stay in bed the one blue garment which in different shapes was all the men and women wore was little protection from the chill of the evening the women's dresses were always hanging off their backs and the men who had each two pieces of thick blue cotton about two yards long by one and a half yard wide with fringes half a yard long wore one as a permanent petticoat and the other as a girdle by day and when cold as a shawl often put on in a very uncomfortable way thrown on in front and left hanging open behind forming no protection to the back of the lungs 
the poor little baby aged fifteen months of the wazir salam bin abdullah was brought shrieking in agony gnawing hard at its emaciated little arms and all covered with sores our hearts were wrung at this wretched sight and we longed to help we even thought of giving it part of a drop of chlorodyne much diluted but fortunately for us dared not do so for my husband said to them i do not think the child will live long it mercifully was released in a few hours then an old man came who had a flame in his inside my husband examined him and decided that he had an abscess and to please him gave him a dessert spoonful of borax and honey which he swept up with his finger and i suppose it did relieve him for after some minutes he said the fire is gone out it grieved us sorely when poor souls came to us so hopefully and so confident of help with a withered arm or an empty eye socket some with less serious complaints than these last we recommended to go to aden hospital a building of which we never thought at that time we should be inmates ourselves we found the ladies to whom a plentiful supply of violent pills had been administered were better but the sultan who had an attack of indigestion had to be taken in hand at once by us doctors his wife required a tonic so we got out some citrate of iron and quinine a bright shiny greenish yellow flaky thing which imam sharif assured us would be more beneficial and better liked if shown and admired as gold so after some conversation about pious frauds i packed the medicine up neatly and wrote in ornamental letters golden health giver and this name being explained and translated gave great satisfaction we were glad to be able to give the kind sultan a new bottle of quinine more acceptable than gold while we were away mahmoud had found two little hedgehogs one was dead and stuffed the other we kept alive for some time and it always liked to creep into my clothes and go to sleep i suppose because i never teased it in the little book of directions for zoological collectors we saw that little is known of the reproduction of lizards so special attention is to be paid etc mahmoud had brought me two little fragile eggs to keep about half an inch long and i had put them in a match-box i tow and packed them in my trunk and on my return to alkatoon i found two little lizards about one and a fourth inch long one alive and the other dead both had to be pickled as we did not understand how to bring so small a lizard up by hand they proved to be new to science as was also a large lizard we found near hara whose peculiarity is that he has no holes along his legs to breathe by like other lizards his name is aporoscales bentiti the first lizard's egg i had i was determined should not slip through my fingers but alack and well a day my fingers slipped through it in the meantime we were terrible bones of contention and had the wadi hatramat all by the ears we were very anxious indeed as to whether we could proceed any farther or should have to go back and whether we could do either safely we wanted to go right along the wadi hatramat and to see bir borhat or barahat a solfatare as far as we could make out but mosadi in the tenth century speaks of it as the greatest volcano in the world and says that it casts up immense masses of fire and that its thundering noise can be heard miles away on the heights near is much brimstone which the bedouin find useful for gunpowder they consider this place is the mouth of hell and that the souls of the kathirs go there in iceland there is a similar accommodation for those souls von reed thinks it was the fons stiges of ptolemy but m de Gige thinks that ptolemy alluded to some place farther west and south of marib certainly the position given by ptolemy does not coincide with that of bir borhat from arabian society in the middle ages by s lanepool i take the following notices of this place el kaswini says of bir borhat it is a well near hadramaut and the prophet god bless and save him said in it are the souls of infidels and hypocrites 
it is an adite well in a dry desert and a gloomy valley and it is related of ali may god be well pleased with him that he said the most hateful of districts to god whose name be exalted is the valley of barahout in which is a well whose waters are black and fetid where the souls of infidels make their abode el asme has narrated of a man of hadramaut that he said we find near barahout an extremely disgusting and fetid smell and then news is brought to us of the death of a great man of the chiefs of infidels Ejeb el Makluget also relates that a man who passed a night in the valley of Barahat said, I heard all night exclamatives of, O oh, Rume, O oh, Rume, and I mentioned this to a learned man, and he told me that it was the name of the angel commissioned to keep guard over the souls of the infidels birborhat is not far from cabra haud which is said by some to be even longer and wider than cabra salah the route lies through the territory of the kateri and the yafai are quite ignorant of it it would be quite unsafe for them to go to the sea along the valley and they always use the road over the tableland the kateri tyrannize over the sultan of shuan and are enemies to the sultan of shibam beyond them are the minhali who are also enemies then the amri and the tahmimi who are friendly and then come the mahri the sultan told us that not even he could prevent us going along the kafila path but we should not be admitted into any villages and should probably be denied water one source of enmity between the kateri and the yafai is i believe a debt which the kateri owe and will not pay the sultan of shiwan borrowed three lakhs of rupees from a grandfather of the present sultan of makala he would not repay them so after much squabbling the case was referred to the english at aden who after duly considering the papers gave makala and shahir bombarding them first to the yafai in answer to the seven letters there was nothing from the sultan of shiwan and the sultan of tarim sent a verbal answer do as you please taking no responsibility to which sultan salah replied i have sent you a letter send me a letter the sheikh of the kateri tribe came to al Katun and said he would take us but on january twenty three we heard that the sultan of shiwan had made a proclamation in the mosque there forbidding the people to admit the unbelievers to the town though we could easily go by the kafila road leaving the town of shiwan two miles on one side the sultan deemed it wiser for us not to attempt it as brawls might arise the two tribes being at war so we then decided to mount on to the akaba pass the inhospitable shawan and tarim and reach the friendly tatmimi tribe the kateri kabila or tribe really came to shiwan to be ready for us but the saids had collected a large sum of money and bribed the sultan to send them away we were hoping to get off to shibam but as the sultan was neither well nor in a very good humour we had to resign ourselves to settling down in al Katun in all patience he said he must accompany us as he could not depend on his wazirs for they were too stupid my husband and i were always occupied he used to sketch in water-colours and i had plenty of work developing photographs in a delightful little dark room where i lived and enjoyed as many skins of water as i could use till i had to stop and pack my celluloid negatives like artificial flowers for they curled up and the films contracted and split from the alkaline water i had to put glycerin on them when i reached aden our botanist nearly died of dullness and impatience mahmoud was quite contented to sit quite still and i do not think the indian servants minded much poor Imam sharif used to gaze up at half a dozen stars from a yard but he dared not venture on the roof to see more we took a stroll with the sultan one day no crowd being allowed and remarked how many things were grown for spices those spices which were becoming rather wearisome to us there was samauta an umbelliferous plant the seed of which is used in coffee and habat asoba for putting in bread coriander chili fennel and heft a plant very much like tall cress which is used in cookery and also raw and which we liked as a salad also attar a purple creeping bean very pretty and good to eat 
there was another low growing bean brinjal eggplant cucumber watermelon henna and indigo the sultan had besides a private enclosure where he had some lime trees not our kind of lime tree of course but the one which bears fruit and i must not forget cotton from which the place originally took its name as it is abundant in a wild state at last another polite letter came from the kateri and a letter from the sultan of terem i have both your letters and you can do as you like my answer is the same this did away with all hope of progress in that direction our spirits however were much cheered by hearing that the sultan had received a letter from a said at meshed probably the nice one who had been in india and had leprosy in his legs telling him how badly the sultan of hagarim had behaved about us as this was spontaneous we hoped that the negotiation our sultan was going to undertake about our excavations at meshed rydown or kubar al molik for some part of the ruin is called the tomb of the kings would turn out successfully the sultan of hagarim was summoned to al Kutun, but we were away before he came i believe in the end he was turned out of his place former misdeeds counting against him End of chapter 11
Chapter Sixteen of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Masters. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter Sixteen The Hadramaut Coasting Eastward by Land the journey was delightful nearly all the way by the edge of the sea past miles and miles of little mounds thrown up by the crabs in making their holes daily they make them and they are daily washed away by the tide they live in holes higher up but these are refuges for the day while they are scavenging in the sea they were nearly under the feet of the horses near sheher we passed the mouth of the arfa river where there is water and near it are horribly smelling tanks where they make fish oil we had to make a deviation of two miles inland to cross the estuary of the wadi gerid and then go down to the sea again but the last mile was over a low cliff covered with a smash of huge shells it must be a furious place in a storm we passed a wretched hamlet consisting of a few arbors and a well whose waters were both bitter and salt Hami, hot, where we stopped, is sixteen miles from Sherha. It is most picturesquely situated at the foot of some low spurs, volcanic in nature, and is fertilized by a stream so very hot that you can hardly put your hands in it. Indeed, in the tanks where it is collected in large volume, it is quite impossible. It is much cooler in the little irrigation channels, which have hard beds from the incrustation of the sulphur the water is very nasty when hot but much better when it cools we did not enjoy our tea at all in hami we were encamped in a delightful spot under both date and coconut trees and hot baths were a pleasure to every one i had to wait a long time till mine in the tent was cool enough there was a great flutter when we arrived on the scene for there were a large number of women and girls bathing they did not seem to mind their own relations seeing them, but on our approach they rushed into their blue dresses and fled. This sulphurous stream makes the crops grow prodigiously, and we walked through fields of jowari and Indian corn as high as our heads. At our camp we had a delicious sea breeze, but in our walks abroad we got an occasional whiff of the little fish which were being boiled down to make oil for lamps and colours used in ship painting we paid a visit to the governor of hami who received us on the roof of his house where many were assembled and scarcely had he greeted us when they all fell to praying the mullah standing in front to lead and all the others standing in a row behind after that they gave us coffee with no sugar followed by tea with far too much and they pressed us to stay with them and partake of their evening meal but we declined politely and retired to our camp on march eleven we started for dis without any rows or brawls whatever dis is fifteen miles off we never went down to the shore at all that day but travelled over a barren undulating country which runs out to sea and forms ras bagashwa we went for half a mile close above the sea on a cliff twenty or thirty feet high with many shells some in an ordinary state some half petrified and some wholly so but none embedded in the stone after travelling three hours and a half we passed over and amongst a range of low hills a volcanic jumble with earths of all colours seams of gypsum stuck up edgeways and many other things i used once to sigh and groan over not having brought a geologist with us but i was wiser by that time it was enough to think of his specimens and their transport to say nothing of the responsibility for his safety still my husband and i often wished we knew more of the geology than we did when the geologist does visit these parts he must make a special bargain with his camel men not based on his apparent present visible luggage but upon what it may expand to he might arrange to pay at the end according to the results of his journey 
on one of the dreadful days with the jabberie the man whose camel carried the botanical boxes positively refused to load up on account of having seen stones with lichen put in and but for the fact of his being last and that all the other camels had started we might have had to throw the things away there was nothing to see at dis but a sudden oasis of fertility caused by a gale but the report of an inscription led my husband a long wild goose chase the district is very populous and from the old forts near it evidently has been and is a very prosperous place we had a great many patients and were nearly driven wild with starers to avoid the crowd we pitched our tent tight up against a field of sugar canes but so anxious were the populace to see me that the whole field was trodden down and no one seemed to mind there were perpetual shouts for the woman to come out on this part of the journey as well as in the hadramaut i was always simply spoken of as the homer of which the plural is harem and never as bibi lady there were some very light-skinned arabs at dis with long dark hair which they dress with grease wearing round their neck a coconut containing a supply of this toilet requisite for the purpose most of them affect red plaid cotton turbans and waistcloths a decided relief to the eye from the perpetual indigo we had a very damp night not from rain but from dew though there is more rain in this part than in the interior we had an uninteresting march next day over desert and many stones up and down hill past a village called haida and went somewhat out of our way to see a rock with bitumen or asphalt oozing out of it we went fifteen miles and encamped near bagashwa on the margin of a large and pretty pool made by recent rains with bushes round it though pretty this pool was not clean almost before we could dismount the camels were unloaded and in it my horse immediately followed and likewise all the camel men and by the time our vessels could be unpacked to fetch the drinking water the soldiers were washing their clothes consequently our water was turbid and of a mingled flavours later my husband took a bath and said he felt as if he was sitting in warm oil my horse for two days after this was afflicted with a mysterious bleeding from the mouth which we did not till then discover was caused by three leeches under his tongue we did not like to put the bit in so the immense iron ring which was usually round his chin hung round his neck and clanked like the clapper of a bell while the nose was thrust through that part meant for his ears some pastoral bedouin were encamped near here whose abodes are about the simplest i ever saw just four posts stuck in the ground with a roof of mats to afford some shelter from the sun on this roof they hang their cooking utensils their only impedimenta when they move one old woman was boiling a pot of porridge another was grinding grain on a stone another was frying little fish on a stick whilst the men were engaged in picketing the kids on a rope with a very loose noose round each little neck and preparing the oil cakes for their camels we had just sunlight left to photograph them and perpetuate the existence of this most primitive life young camels are reared here we were so lucky as to discover a scorpion that had travelled in our tent from dis before it could do us harm that day one of the bedou soldiers came to me and asked me in a confidential sort of whisper are you a man or a woman we were five hours on our journey to Kossier, eleven miles, which was our next stage, over stones first, then over heavy sand to the shore again. There were not so many shells, seaweeds, corals, crabs, madripoors, sponges, and flamingos as we had seen near Sheher, but hundreds of seagulls sitting in the shallow water and quantities of porpoises the lobster shells which lie about are a beautiful blue mixed with red the great stretch of basalt which runs for fully fifteen miles along the coast with kossia in the middle caused us to mount on to the rocks some little distance before reaching kossia and when we got quite near we sat on a rocky hillock 
contemplating the town and awaiting our kafile that we might arrive with all the dignity due to the governor all our baggage was on five camels and the old sultan of the hamumi on the sixth so we really need not have had the seventh that dirty old bedou owns many houses in khail babwazia and other places the governor was a very thin old man very like don quixote his scanty hair and beard dyed red with henna he had been governor five years before and was now reappointed at the request of the town so great were the rejoicings manifested by the firing of many guns some came to meet him at the rock some stayed in the town some appeared on the tops of the numerous towers but no matter where they were one and all as well as those who came with us fired off their guns whenever they liked under our noses in and from every direction our animals did not mind one bit the governor and all the foot passengers arrived in the town with their feet twice the natural size from the clinging mud through which we had to pass and which necessitated great scraping of feet and picking out between toes with daggers we were most pleasantly received and taken upstairs in the governor's castle to a roofless room with a kind of shed along one side and here we subsided on mats very hot and soon a most powerfully strong tincture of tea with much sugar ginger and cinnamon was administered to us and though the kind old governor was so busy being welcomed by his happy old friends he was always coming to see that we were properly attended to we had our camp in his yard where we had a very comfortable room and enjoyed having his wall round us very much in the evening we went on the shore and about the town the town is on a small point and approached from the west it seems to lie four square and to present a very strong appearance with its yet its castle and a we rode in by the gate on the northern side and were surprised to find that the side towards the sea had no wall but only four detached towers there were fishing boats on the beach with the planks just sewn together with cords the long line of black basalt jutting into capes here and there is thought by the arabs to be formed by the ashes of infidel towns the tiny port of kossia is just a nook where the boats can nestle behind a small low natural breakwater of the basalt boats lie on either side according to the wind next we went to raida three hours all along the top of the cliff the old hamumi sultan was with us of course otherwise there would have been no safety for us beyond kossia we had a dreadful experience passing the village of sarar the smell from the cemetery was so awful that even the bedouin had to hold their noses for many yards on both sides of it the village of sarar only consists of three large mud houses and a good many bamboo shanties we were amused by a man whom we met alone his terror of us was so great as we approached he lit his match got his gun all ready and left the path seeking cover but our people shouted what good can you do you are one and we are many and besides we mean you no harm so he came forward and there was great laughter both at and with him raida is a large fishing village certainly there are strange eaters in these parts the ichthyopagoi here prefer their fish generally in a decayed state and one of our hamumi soldiers had a treat of lizards which he popped in the fire to roast and ate whole we did not get much farther eastward that year with only two hours farther to rakhmit a very uninteresting journey but we were buoyed up by hopes of some very delightful inscriptions that were described to us one on the way to mosena to which we were supposed to be going that day and another in a cave quite close to mosena when we reached the river bed at rakhmit a spot in the mountains about five miles off was pointed out so after very much and long consultation with the aged sultan we decided it would be safer to camp where we were see Masena the next day and return to the same camp however when we were quite prepared to go the five miles it appeared that it might be dangerous it was in the country of no one then present so we could have no siara 
and the old Hakmumi chief said it would be bad for his sons, the hostages. So this plan had to be abandoned. Afterwards it was revealed to us that the cave is twenty miles from Mosena on the Akaba, that there is no water near, no village at Mosena, no means of getting forage. So, as in that case farther progress was useless as well as impossible, we proposed to return the following day to Kassir, helping ourselves, if possible, with a boat from Raida. It took us three hours to return to Raida, where an old Seyid took us into his house and led us to a little clean room, ten feet by six feet, and there we settled down on the matting to rest and have our luncheon till one o'clock, when we started, leaving the baggage camels to follow. How thankful we were that, tastes differing, there were people in Arabia who could look upon us as harmless and pleasant individuals. Everyone had been nice to us, and we had had no difficulties whatever, and been treated like human beings just because we had not that horrid little Saleh Hassan with us. The more civil people were to us, the more enraged we were with him, and I think if the servants had carried out their threats against him when he should be on the Dao, the masters would not have interfered. It is fifteen miles from Raida to Kassir. We were quite determined, after the severe lesson we had had two days previously, to go windward of Sara. When we passed a well there, I was requested to detach myself from the party, and go and let some women see me, and then the soldiers begged that I would show off Basha, prancing about, that the women might see that I did not want holding on. And finally they shouted, Shiloh, to make him gallop away, amid screams of delight i dare say these women had never seen a horse the sultans at sher had only three we had already sent zubda back to al khatan the soldiers were very fond of terrifying my horse when passing a village and i wanted to stare about to show him off in avoiding sarar we got into great difficulties with the loose sand we went over it half a mile, and when we reached the sea there was so narrow a strip of firm sand that our animals, being too much afraid of the rising tide, we had to make our way up again. We reached Cassier about half-past five, warmly welcomed by Don Quixote, who gave us coffee while awaiting our Khalifa, which was, to our surprise and delight, only half an hour behind us, not having been fighting with the sand. We were made more angry with Saleh by finding that water, wood, forage, eggs, fish, and a little milk had been prepared for us beforehand. My night was disturbed by the old Hakmumi chief choosing the eve of our tent just beside my ear to say his prayers. Quiet nights, however, must not be expected in Ramazan. Next morning we were off at eight, of course dragging the poor wizened old gentleman with us on a camel two hours, six miles up the Wadi Shewan to see a ruin at the village of Marbeh, where there is a running stream. At the entrance to Wadi Shewan the ruins are situated. They consist of a large fort, circular on one side and about forty feet in diameter, built of round water-worn stones set in very strong cement, dating from the same period as those at Kail Babwazia evidently the medieval inhabitants of arabia chose these two points for good water tobacco is also grown here besides other things the water is really good and sweet we behaved with the greatest temerity in entering these ruins no one now living had been in before we did the building is the abode of jinni and no one who goes in is ever able to come out by the same door we were so fortunate as to be able to do so. On the road we saw a stone, and were told that a genie, or guinea as they are called in southern Arabia, was bringing this to help to build the fort when he was met by another genie, who said, Why do you bring stones when the fort is finished? So he dropped it in disgust. Jinni are able to get sufficiently near to heaven to hear the conversation of the angels, and there are various incantations to make them reveal the whereabouts of hidden treasures. One called Darb el Mendel, carried on with a handkerchief, is much in vogue. Marber nestles under a big pointed rock on the highland, which sticks up aloft, and to which we heard that the Kaffirs used to tie their horses. 
bottles were stuck into the graves as ornaments and built onto the tops of buildings we rested beneath a bedome tree which showered its little fruits on us and made as many inquiries as possible in a crowd of starers who were all very polite we heard that wadi shikavi is the end of wadi mosila it runs parallel to and is almost as large as the wadi hadramot Ghail Benzamin is the principal town in it. At last, feeling that our work and our researches were as thoroughly done as in our power lay, we arose and turned our faces toward England. End of chapter 16 The Hadramaut Coasting Eastward by Land Recording by Ken Masters
Chapter Eighteen of Southern Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Southern Arabia by James and Mabel Bent. Chapter Eighteen Merbat and Al Hafa. After returning from our expedition to the Hadramut in 1894, we determined the next winter to attempt the ambitious adventure of making a journey overland right across southern Arabia from Muscat to Aden. On our way, we hoped to revisit the Hadramut, to explore those portions which we had been compelled to leave unvisited the former winter, and so to fill up the large blank space which still exists on the map of this country. Experience taught us that our plan was impracticable. The only possible way of making explorations in Arabia is to take it piecemeal, to investigate each district separately, and by degrees to make a complete map by patching together the results of a number of isolated expeditions. Indeed, this is the only satisfactory way of seeing any country, for on a great through journey the traveller generally loses the most interesting details my husband again to our great satisfaction had imam sharif khan bahadur placed at his disposal and as the longest way round was the quickest and best we determined to make our final preparations in india and meet him and his men at karachi we left england at the beginning of november eighteen ninety four and at aden where we were obliged to transship we picked up our camp furniture which we had deposited there on our return from wadi hadhramut imam sharif came on board to meet us at karachi and we also received a letter inviting us to stay at government house where we were most kindly entertained by mrs pottinger in the absence of her brother mr james the commissioner in sinde this was very delightful to us as we had already stayed in reynolds hotel when on our way to persia Matthäus had absolutely refused to come with us for fear we should carry out our great wish of going to Birborhut, and indeed the very name of Arabia was odious to him. Of course, being in India, we had to take two men in his place, and accordingly engaged two Goanese, half Portuguese, one Diego S. Ana Lobo, a little old man, as butler, and the other Domingo de Silva, as cook. The former could speak English and Portuguese, the latter neither, only Hindustani. We took them back to India with us the following spring, keeping Lobo as our servant during the time of our stay there. We had a calm and pleasant voyage of three days to Muscat with Captain Whitehead on British India Steam Navigation's steamer Chanda, arriving just in time to escape a violent storm, which lasted for days and in its commencement prevented our landing at the usual place we had to go round a little promontory there was also a good deal of rain which cooled the air considerably we were the guests of colonel hay sadler in his hospitable residency and he interested himself kindly in our affairs giving us all the help he could in our arrangements as did also dr jayaker the indian doctor we intended first of all to penetrate into the regions of the Jebel Akhtar and then to pass through the territory of the Jenefa tribe to Gubet al Hashish, which takes its name not from land grass but from seaweed. There a boat was to meet us and take us westward. In this way, we should avoid a stretch of desert which the Bedouin themselves shrink from and which is impassable to Europeans. We could not procure any information about our journey to the Jebel Akhdar, as it does not appear to be the fashion at Muscat to go inland. However, both our old friend, the Sultan Faisul, and Colonel Sadler, took infinite trouble to arrange for our journey. Camels were hired and a horse for me, and the sheikhs of the tribes through whose country we should have to pass were summoned to escort us owing however to the illness of some of our party we were at the last moment obliged 
to defer the expedition though we had made all the preparations we could for the great cold we should have to encounter the change of climate would have been injurious to imam sharif and two of his men as events proved it was fortunate we did so for the insurrection which i have already mentioned broke out almost immediately afterwards and in all probability we should not have returned alive to relate our experiences we next determined to go by sea to merbat and thence explore the dofar and gara mountains the sultan offered us the use of his batil which was preparing to go to zengiber as they call zanzibar we found on inspection that it was a small decked boat with a very light upper deck at the stern supported by posts they were busy smearing the ship with fish oil we were told it might be ready in three days and we might take seven days or more over the voyage however we were delivered from this long voyage for unexpectedly a steamer arrived most opportunely for us as it was not the pilgrim season and as there was no cholera about we ventured on this steamer which is one of those that fly under the turkish flag between the persian gulf and jeddah the captain was an armenian in fact all the steamers belonging to turkey are run by armenian companies and manned by armenian sailors the captain of the hodeida was not too exorbitant in his demand of five hundred rupees to drop our party at merbat the steward could fortunately speak greek we left muscat on monday december seventeenth and had a very calm voyage but this being our fifth steamer since we left home we were anxious for a little dry land journeying we saw the high mountains all tuesday but nothing on wednesday after early morning the coast recedes and becomes low where the desert comes down to the sea we passed the korea Muria islands in the night they are inhabited by the jenefa tribe who pursue sharks swimming on inflated skins on thursday we passed very curious scenery a high akaba just like the hadhramut in the background and for about a mile between this and the sea a volcanic mass of rocks and peaks and crags of many hues after passing this we were at our destination and at three o'clock in the afternoon we left the steamer to land at merbat we were conveyed to the shore in three boats one of which was called el libot it is only fair that the english who have borrowed so many nautical terms from the orientals should now in their turn provide the arabian name for a boat cutters and jolly boats have taken their names from katira and jallibot merbat which is sixty-four miles from muscat is the first point of the dofar district after the long stretch of desert has been passed it is a wretched little spot consisting of some fifty houses and a few bedou huts with about two hundred inhabitants it is built on a tongue of land which affords shelter for arab dhows during the northeast monsoon the water supply is from a pool of brackish water the excitement caused by the first arrival of a steamer was intense and tiny craft with naked bedouin soon crowded round us after entrusting us to their tender mercies our armenian captain steamed away and it was not without secret misgivings that we landed amongst the wild-looking inhabitants who lined the shore we imagined we were being very kindly received when they pointed out the largest building in the place as our habitation and my husband imam sharif our interpreter hassan and i joyfully hastened thither unfortunately we had no recommendation to the headman of this place and he evidently distrusted us for after taking us to a fort built of mud bricks which offered ample accommodation for our party he flatly refused to allow us to have our baggage or our servants therein after entering a kind of guard room we had to plunge to the right into pitchy darkness and stumble along stretching out our hands like blind men 
each taken by the shoulders and pushed and shoved by a roundabout way to a dark inner staircase where we emerged into the light on some roofs they wanted us to stay where we were but not wishing to remain without conveniences we succeeded in getting between them and the door and then found our way out of the building and rejoined our servants and our baggage on the beach we flourished our letter to wali suleiman in his face we expostulated threatened and cajoled and passed a whole miserable hour by the shore seated on our belongings under the blazing afternoon sun watching our steamer gradually disappearing in the distance hemmed in by bedouin who stared at us as if we had come from the moon exceedingly hot hungry and uncomfortable we passed a very evil time indeed speculating as to what would be the result of the conclave of the old headmen but at last they approached us in a more friendly spirit begged our pardon and reinstated us in the fort with our bag and baggage and were as civil as they could be to our dying day we shall never know what cost us this dilemma did they really think we had come to seize their fort which we afterwards heard was the case and interfere with their frankincense monopoly or did they think we had come to look into the question of a large arab dhow which was flying the french flag and was beached on the shore and which we had reason to believe was conveying a cargo of slaves to one of the neighboring markets for disposal personally i suspect the latter was the true reason of their aversion to our presence for the coast from here to muscat has a bad reputation in this respect and just lately arab slave dhows have been carrying on their trade under cover of protection obtained from france at obok and zanzibar the inhabitants have plaited hair and knobkerries i believe they belong to the Jenefa tribe finding merbat so uncongenial an abode with no points of interest and with the malarious looking swamp in its vicinity and not being able to obtain camels or escort for a journey inland we determined only to pass one night there and after wandering about in search of interests which did not exist we came to terms with the captain of a most filthy bagala to take us along the coast to al hafa the residence of wali suleiman without whose direct assistance we plainly saw that nothing could be done about extending our expedition into the interior it was only forty miles to al hafa but owing to adverse winds it took us exactly two days to perform this voyage and our boat was one of the dirtiest of the kind we have ever travelled on in our little cabin in the stern the smell of bilge water was almost overpowering and every silver thing we had about us turned black with the sulfurous vapors these pungent odors were relieved from time to time by burning huge chafing dishes of frankincense a large cargo of which was aboard for transport to bombay after we had been deposited at al hafa one of the many songs our sailors sang when changing the flapping sails was about frankincense so we tried to imagine that we were having a pleasant experience of the country we were about to visit and even in its dirt and squalor an arab dhow is a picturesque abode with its pretty carvings and odd-shaped bulwarks we were twenty-five souls on board and our captain and his crew being devout mohammedans we had plenty of time and opportunity for studying their numerous prayers and ablutions the plain of dafar along which we were now coasting is quite an abnormal feature in this arid coast it is the only fertile stretch between aden and Mascat. it is formed of alluvial soil washed down from the gara mountains there is abundance of water very near the surface and frequent streams make their way down to the sea so that it is green the great drawback to the country is the want of harbours during the northeast monsoons dhows can find shelter at merbat and during the southwest monsoons at risut but the rest of the coast is provided with nothing but open roadsteads with the surf always rolling in from the indian ocean 
the plain is never more than nine miles wide and at the eastern end where the mountains were nearer to the sea it is reduced to a very narrow strip a grand exception to the long line of barren waste which forms the arabian frontage to the indian ocean and which gets narrower and narrower as the mountains approach the sea at saihut tall coconut palms adorn it in clusters and long stretches of bright green fields refresh the eye and at frequent intervals we saw flourishing villages by the coast tobacco cotton indian corn and various species of grain grow here in great abundance and in the gardens we find many of the products of india flourishing namely the plantain the papaya mulberries melons chilies brinjols and fruits and vegetables of various descriptions we anchored for some hours off one of these villages and paid our toll of dates to the bedouin who came off to claim them as is customary all along this coast every dhow paying this toll in return for the privilege of obtaining water when they want it the gara mountains are now one of the wildest spots in wild arabia owing to the disastrous blood feuds amongst the tribe and the insecurity of travel they had never previously been penetrated by europeans all that was known of the district was the actual coastline exciting rumors had reached the ears of colonel miles a former political agent at mascat concerning lakes and streams and fertility unwanted for arabia which existed in these mountains and our appetites were consequently whetted for their discovery in ancient times this was one of the chief sources of the time-honored frankincense trade which still maintains itself here even more than in the hadramut it is carried on by the bedouin of the gara tribe who bring down the odoriferous gum from the mountains on camels about nine thousand hundred weight of it is exported to bombay annually down by the coast at al hafa there is a square enclosure or bazaar where piles of frankincense may still be seen ready for exportation miniature successors of those piles of the tears of gum from the tree trunks which are depicted on the old egyptian temple at deir al bahari as one of the proceeds of queen hatasu's expeditions to the land of punt the actual libaniferous country is perhaps now not much bigger than the isle of wright and in its physical appearance not unlike it cut off from the rest of the world by a desert behind and an ocean in front probably in ancient days the frankincense bearing area was not much more extensive claudius ptolemy the anonymous author of the periplus pliny theoprastus and a little later on the arabian geographers speak of it and from their descriptions there is no difficulty in fixing the limits of it and its ruined towns are still easily identified after much tacking and flapping of sails we at last reached al hafa where wali suleiman had his castle only a stone's throw from the beach our landing was performed in small hide-covered boats specially constructed for riding over the surf and was not completed without a considerable wetting to ourselves and baggage after so many preliminary discomforts a cordial welcome from the wali was doubly agreeable he placed the room on the roof spread with carpets at our disposal and he furnished our larder with the whole cow and every delicacy at his command the cow's flesh was cut into strips and festooned about in every direction to dry it for our journey our room was for arabia deliciously cool and airy being approached by a ladder and from our roof we enjoyed pleasant views over the fertile plain and the gara mountains into which we had now every hope of penetrating we looked down into his courtyard below and saw there many interesting faces of arab life al hafa is six hundred forty miles from mascat in one direction and eight hundred from aden in the other 
it is therefore about as far as possible from any civilized place nominally it is under the sultan of oman and i may here emphatically state that the southern coast of arabia has absolutely nothing to do with turkey from muscat to aden there is not a single tribe paying tribute to or having any communication with the ottoman port really al hafa and the dofar were ruled over autocratically by wali suleiman who was sent out there about eighteen years before as governor at the request of the few torn inhabitants by sultan turki of muscat in his small way wali suleiman was a man of great capacity a man who has made history and could have made more if his sphere had been larger in his youth he was instrumental in placing turki on the throne of oman and after a few years of stern application to business he brought the bellicose families of the gara tribe under his power and his influence was felt far into the interior even into the confines of nejd with a handful of arabs and a badly armed regiment of slave origin he had contrived to establish peace and comparative safety throughout the gara mountains and thanks to him we were able to penetrate their fastnesses wali suleiman was a stern uncompromising ruler feared and respected rather than loved the wali kept all his prisoners in the courtyard when we were there he had twelve all manacled and reposing on grass mats at night these were wicked bedouin from the mountains prisoners taken in a recent war he had had with the mari tribe the casus belli being a find of ambergris which the mari had appropriated though it had been washed up on the dofar coast one prisoner a murderer whose imprisonment was for two years was chained to a log of wood and he laid his mat bed in a large stone sarcophagus brought from the neighboring ruins of the ancient capital of the frankincense country and really intended for a trough another convicted of stealing his master's sword and selling it to the captain of a dhow had his feet attached to an iron bar which made his locomotion exceedingly painful a mola prisoner was owing to the sanctity of his calling unfettered and he led the evening prayers and on most nights for want of something better to do i suppose these prisoners of wali suleiman prayed and sang into the small hours of the morning day by day we watched these unfortunate men from the roof and thought we had never seen so unholy a set of men according to what we heard they did not look so some were morose and chewed the cud of their discontent in corners the younger and better looking ones were gallant and flirted with the slave girls helping them to draw up buckets from the well in the centre of the courtyard the active-minded cut wood for the household and walked about doing odd jobs holding up the iron bar which separated their feet with a rope as they shuffled along or played with the wali's little boy five years of age who rumbled about among them goats kids cocks and hens also occupied this courtyard and the big white she-ass the only representative of the equine race as far as we could see in dofar on which wali suleiman makes his state journeys to the various villages in his dominions along the coast and which he kindly lent to me once when we went to visit the ruins the ladies of the wali's harem paid me frequent visits and brought me presents of fruit and embarrassing plates of food and substances to dye my teeth red tambul leaves and lime but they were uninteresting ladies and their conversational powers limited to the discussion of the texture of dresses and the merits of european underclothing on the very first morning they appeared before i was up that is about sunrise as i had put them off the evening before i dared not do so again my husband sprang out of his bed and got out of their way i managed to put on a jacket sitting up in bed and then finding time allowed a skirt and had just got my hair combed down when in they trooped 
i knew my shoes and stockings would never be missed so i felt quite ready for the visit they wore burkas on their faces and had on a great deal of coarse jewelry with mock pearls and bad turquoises whenever they chose to come my husband had to depart and i do not think he liked these interruptions we were much interested in the male members of the wali's family his eldest son was paralyzed and bedridden and he had adopted as heir to his position in the far a nephew who lived in a separate wing of the castle and had his separate harem establishment besides this the wali had two dear little boys one of twelve and the other of eight who constantly paid us visits and with whom we established a close friendship salem the elder was a fair delicate looking boy the son of a georgian slave who was given to wali suleiman by sultan torki of oman some years ago she ran away with her boy to bombay but was restored to her husband and now has been sent as a punishment to zanzibar she is a servant in the house of one of the princesses there salem would often tell us that his mother was coming back to him in a year or two but we thought differently the tragedy connected with little mufak the younger boy a bright dear little fellow very much darker than his brother in fact nearly black is far more heart-rending about two years before his mother also a slave an african was convicted of misconduct and on her was visited the extremest penalty with which the arab law can punish a faithless wife in the presence of a large assemblage the unfortunate woman was buried up to the waist in the sand and stoned to death the poor little motherless fellows were constantly on the go rushing hither and thither playing with and petted by all at one time they amused themselves with the prisoners in the courtyard at another time they teased the gara sheikhs who sat in the long entrance corridor and then they came to torment us until we gave them some trifle which they forthwith carried off in triumph to show it to everybody both the little boys wore the large silver and gold daggers of oman round their waists and powder flasks similarly decorated hung on their backs and when dressed in their best silk robes on friday they were the most fantastic little fellows one could wish to see wali suleiman was as i have said an austere and unlovable man but he was the man for his position taciturn and a few words but this always to the point before he would permit us to go forth and penetrate into the recesses of the gara mountains he summoned the heads of all the different families into which the tribe is divided to al hafa and gave us into their charge we agreeing to pay for their escort their protection and the use of their camels a fixed sum per diem in maria teresa dollars the only coin recognized in the country such palavering there was over this stupendous piece of diplomacy wali suleiman and the gara sheikhs sat for hours in solemn conclave in a palm thatched barn about fifty yards distant from the castle which takes the place of a parliament house in the kingdom of dofar the wali his nephew and arab councillors smoked their nargiles complacently whilst the gara bedouin took whips at their little pipes which they cut out of soft limestone that hardens in the air and all drank endless cups of coffee served by slaves in huge coffee pots with long bird-like beaks and we looked on at this conference which was to decide their fate from a roof with no small amount of impatience before starting for the mountains we wandered hither and thither over the plain of dofar for some days visiting sites of ruins and other places of interest and greatly admired the rich cultivation we saw around us and the capacity of this plain for producing cotton indigo tobacco and cereals water is on the surface in stagnant pools or easily obtainable everywhere by digging shallow wells which are worked by camels sometimes three together and so well trained that at the end of the walk they turn by themselves 
as soon as they hear the splash of the water into the irrigation channel and then they walk back to fill the skin bucket again the coconut palm grows admirably here and we had many refreshing draughts of the water contained in the nuts during our hot rides and in pools beneath the trees the fibre of the nuts is placed to rot for making ropes giving out an odour very similar to that of the flax pits in the north of ireland between capes Risut and merbat we found the sites of ruined towns of considerable extent in no less than seven different points though at the two capes where now is the only anchorage there are no ruins to be seen proving as we afterwards verified for ourselves that anchorage of a superior nature existed in the neighbourhood in antiquity which has since become silted up but which anciently must have afforded ample protection for the boats which came for the frankincense trade at takha as we shall presently see there was a very extensive and deep harbour running a considerable distance inland which with the little outlay of capital could easily be restored after a close examination of these ruined sites there can be no doubt that those at spots called now al balad and robat about two miles east of the wali's residence formed the ancient capital of this district we visited them on christmas day and were much struck with their extent the chief ruins those of al balad are by the sea around an acropolis some one hundred feet in height this part of the town was encircled by a moat still full of water and in the centre still connected with the sea but almost silted up is a tiny harbour the ground is covered with the remains of a mohammedan mosques and still more ancient sabaean temples the architecture of which namely the square columns with flutings at the four corners and the step-like capitals at once connects them architecturally with the columns at adulis on the red sea those of koloe and aksum in abyssinia and those described by Monsieur arnaud at mariaba in yemen in some cases these are decorated with intricate patterns one of which is formed by the old sabian letters an x which may possibly have some religious import after seeing the ruins of adulis and koloe and the numerous temples or tombs with four isolated columns no doubt can be entertained that the same people built them as at adulis and koloe there were no inscriptions which could materially assist us this may be partly accounted for by the subsequent mohammedan occupation when the temples were converted into mosques but besides this the nature of the stone employed at all these places would make it very difficult to use it for inscribing letters it is very coarse and full of enormous fossils this town of al balad by the sea is connected by a series of ruins with another town two miles inland now called robat where the ground for many acres is covered with ancient remains big cisterns and water courses are here cut in the rock and standing columns of the same architectural features are seen in every direction with the aid of sprenger's alte geographie arabiens the best guide-book the traveller can take into this country there is no difficulty in identifying this ancient capital of the frankincense country as the temple of artemis of claudius ptolemy this name is obviously a greek translation of the sabaean for some well-known oracle which anciently existed here not far as ptolemy himself tells us from cape Risut. this name eventually became zufar from which the modern name of the far is derived in the year of the lord six hundred eighteen the town was destroyed and mansura built under which name the capital was known in early mohammedan times various arab geographers also assist us in this identification yakut for example tells us how the prince of sufar had the monopoly of the frankincense trade and punished with death any infringement of it ibn batuta says that half a day's journey east of mensura is alakhaf 
the abode of the adites probably referring to the site of the oracle and the last stronghold of the ancient cult sprenger sums up the evidence of old writers by saying that the town of zufar and the later mansura must undoubtedly be the ruins of al balad thus having assured ourselves of the locality of the ancient capital of the frankincense country for no other site along the plain has ruins which will at all compare in extent and appearance with those of al balad we shall as we proceed on our journey find that other sites fall easily into their proper places and an important verification of ancient geography and an old world centre of commerce has been obtained the ruins at al balad and robat were last inhabited during the persian occupation about the time of the crusades five hundred of the hegira they utilized the old himyaritic columns to build their mosques some of the tombs have beautiful carving on them in the ruins of one temple the columns were elaborately carved with a kind of fleur-de-lis pattern and the bases decorated with the floral design artistically interwoven i had dreadful difficulty with a photograph which i took of these columns i developed it at night tormented by mosquitoes and in the morning it was all cracked and dried off its celluloid foundation i put it in alum and it floated off half an inch too large in both directions if i had had a larger plate on which to mount it it would have been an easy enough job but i had not so i was obliged to work it down on to the original plate with my thumbs it took me seven solid hours and i had to be fed with two meals for i could never move my thumbs nor eyes off my work i felt very proud that the cracks did not show when a magic lantern slide was made from it there was a great deal of vegetation among the ruins especially beautiful was a very luxuriant creeper called by the inhabitants asaleb it has a luscious large pear-shaped red fruit with seeds which when beaten are like pepper it has large flowers which are white at first and then turn pink on our way home from al balad we stopped to rest under some cocoa palms and stones and other missiles were flung up by our guides so the coconuts came showering down in rather a terrifying way the men then stuck their gut reefs in the ground and banged the nuts on them and thus skinned them then they hacked at them with their swords till they cut off the tops like eggs and we enjoyed a good drink of the water End of chapter 18 Recording by Shanna Sayre, Fresno, California